preface of A Voyage in the Sunbeam, Our Home on the Ocean for 11 Months. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. A Voyage in the Sunbeam, Our Home on the Ocean for 11 Months by Anna Brassey. Dedication, Preface, Note. Dedication. To the friends in many climes and countries of the white and colored races and of every grade in society who have made our year of travel a year of happiness, these pages are dedicated by the ever grateful author. Preface. This volume needs no elaborate preface. A general sketch of the voyage which it describes was published in the Times immediately after our return to England. That letter is reprinted here as a convenient summary of the Sunbeam's performances. But these prefatory lines would indeed be incomplete if they did not contain a well-deserved tribute to the industry and accuracy of the author. The voyage would not have been undertaken, and assuredly it would never have been completed without the impulse derived from her perseverance and determination. Still less would any sufficient record of the scenes and experiences of the long voyage have been preserved had it not been for her painstaking desire not only to see everything thoroughly, but to record her impressions faithfully and accurately. The practiced skill of a professional writer cannot reasonably be expected in these simple pages, but their object will have been attained if they are the means of enabling more homekeeping friends to share in the keen enjoyment of the scenes and adventures they describe. Thomas Brassey. Note. I have to thank Mr. W. Simpson, author of Meeting the Sun, for the passages given on pages 341 to 343, Reader's Note, Chapter 20, referring to the Japanese temples and their priesthood. The vessel which has carried us so rapidly and safely round the globe claims a brief description. She was designed by Mr. Sinclair Byrne of Liverpool and may be technically defined as a screw composite three-masted topsail yard schooner. The engines by Messrs. Laird are of 70 nominal or 350 indicated horsepower and developed a speed of 10.13 knots at the measured mile. The bunkers contain 80 tons of coal. The average daily consumption is 4 tons and the speed 8 knots in fine weather. The principal dimensions of the hull are length for tonnage, 157 feet, beam extreme, 27 feet, 6 inches, displacement tonnage, 531 tons, area of midship section, 202 square feet. A. B. End of preface. Chapter 1 of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Farewell to Old England. Masts, spires, and strand receding on the right, the glorious main expanding on the bow. At noon on July 1st, 1876, we said goodbye to the friends who had come to Chatham to see us off and began the first stage of our voyage by steaming down to Sheerness, saluting our old friend the Duncan, Admiral Chad's flagship, and passing through a perfect fleet of craft of all kinds. There was a fresh, contrary wind, and the channel was as disagreeable as usual under the circumstances. Next afternoon we were off Hastings, where we had intended to stop and dine and meet some friends, but unfortunately the weather was not sufficiently favorable for us to land, so we made a long tack out to sea, and in the evening found ourselves once more near the land off Beachy Head. While becalmed off Brighton, we all, children included, availed ourselves of the opportunity to go overboard and have our first swim, which we thoroughly enjoyed. We had steam up before ten, and again proceeded on our course. It was very hot, and sitting under the awning turned out to be the pleasantest occupation. The contrast between the weather of the two following days was very great, and afforded a forcible illustration of the uncertainties, perhaps the fascinations, of yachting. We steamed quietly on, past the hour's light ship, and the crowds of yachts at ride, and dropped anchor off cows at six o'clock. On the morning of the 6th, a light breeze sprang up, and enabled us to go through the needles with sails up and funnel down, a performance of which all on board felt very proud, 
as many yachtsmen had pronounced it to be an impossibility for our vessel to beat out in so light a breeze. We were forty-three on board, all told, as will be seen by reference to the list I have given. We had with us, besides, two dogs, three birds, and a charming Persian kitten belonging to the baby. The kitten soon disappeared, and it was feared she must have gone overboard down the hoss pipe. There was a faint hope, however, that she might have been packed away with the new sails, which had been stowed in a great hurry the day before. Unhappily, she was never found again, and the children were inconsolable until they discovered at Torquay an effective substitute for Lily. The channel was tolerably smooth outside the Isle of Wight, and during the afternoon we were able to hold on our course direct for Ushant. After midnight, however, the wind worked gradually round to the west-southwest and blew directly in our teeth. A terribly heavy sea got up, and, as we were making little or no progress, it was decided to put in to Torquay or Dartmouth, and there away to change. We anchored in Torbay, about half a mile from the pier, at 8.30 a.m., and soon afterwards went ashore to bathe. We found, however, that the high rocks which surround the snug little bathing cove made the water as cold as ice. Nothing more having been heard of our poor little kitten, we can only conclude that she has gone overboard. Just as we were leaving the railway station, however, we saw a small white kitten with a blue ribbon round its neck, and all the children at once exclaimed, There's our lily! We made inquiries and found that it belonged to the young woman at the refreshment room, who, after some demur, allowed us to take it away with us, in compliance with Muriel's anxious wish expressed on her face. About ten o'clock we got under way, but lay to for breakfast. We then had a regular beat of it down channel, everybody being ill. We formed a melancholy-looking little row down the lee side of the ship, though I must say that we were quite as cheery as might have been expected under the circumstances. It was bright and sunny overhead, which made things more bearable. Sunday, July ninth, A calm at 2 a.m. Orders were given to get up steam, but the new coals from Chatham were slow to light, though good to keep up steam when once fairly kindled. For four long hours, therefore, we lolloped about in the trough of a heavy sea, the sails flapping as the vessel rolled. By the time the steam was up, so was the breeze, a contrary one, of course. We accordingly steamed and sailed all day, taking more water on board, though not really in any great quantity, than I had ever seen the good ship do before. She carries a larger supply of coal and other stores than usual, and no doubt the square yards on the foremast make her pitch more heavily. We were all very sorry for ourselves, and church postponed from eleven until four o'clock, brought together but a small congregation. On the 8th we were fairly away from Old England, and on the next day off Ushant, which we rounded at about 4.30 p.m., at the distance of a mile and a half. The sea was tremendous, the waves breaking in columns of spray against the sharp needle-like rocks that form the point of the island. The only excitement during the day was afforded by the visit of a pilot boat, without any fish on board, whose owner was very anxious to take us into Brest, safe from the coming storm, which he predicted. In addition to our other discomforts, it now rained hard, and by half-past six, I think nearly all our party had made up their minds that bed would be the most comfortable place. Two days later, we sailed into lovely, bright, warm, sunny weather, with a strong northeasterly breeze, a following sea, and an occasional long roll from the westward, but as the sun rose, the wind increased, and we got rather knocked about by the sea. A good deal of water came on board, and it was impossible to sit anywhere in comfort, unless lashed or firmly wedged in. We were, however, going ten knots through the water on our course, under our new squarehead canvas, and this fact made up for a good deal of discomfort. The thirty extra tons of spare sails, spars, and provisions, the fifteen tons of water, and the eighty-four tons of coal— made a great difference in our buoyancy, and the sea came popping in and out at the most unexpected places, much to the delight of the children who, with bare feet and legs and armed with mops and sponges, waged mimic war against the intruder and each other, singing and dancing to their heart's content. This amusement was occasionally interrupted by a heavier roll than usual, sending them all into the lee scuppers, sousing them from head to foot, and necessitating a thorough change of clothing, despite their urgent protest that sea water never hurt anybody. After our five o'clock dinner, however, we very nearly met with a most serious accident. We were all sitting or standing about the stern of the vessel, admiring the magnificent dark blue billows following us, with their curling white crests, mountains high. Each wave, as it approached, appeared as if it must overwhelm us, 
instead of which it rushed grandly by, rolling and shaking us from stem to stern, and sending fountains of spray on board. Tom was looking at the stern compass, all not being close to him. Mr. Bingham and Mr. Freer were smoking, halfway between the quarter-deck and the after-companion, where Captain Brown, Dr. Potter, Muriel, and I were standing. Captain Lecky, seated on a large coil of rope placed on the box of the rudder, was spinning Maybell a yarn. A new hand was steering, and just at the moment when an unusually big wave overtook us, he unfortunately allowed the vessel to broach to a little. In a second the sea came pouring over the stern, above all nuts head. The boy was nearly washed overboard, but he managed to catch hold of the rail, and, with great presence of mind, stuck his knees into the bulwarks. Kindred, our boatswain, seeing his danger, rushed forward to save him, but was knocked down by the return wave, from which he emerged gasping. The coil of rope, on which Captain Lecky and Maybell were seated, was completely floated by the sea. Providentially, however, he had taken a double turn round his wrist with a reefing point, and, throwing his other arm round Maybell, held on like grim death, otherwise nothing could have saved them. She was perfectly self-possessed, and only said quietly, "'Hold on, Captain Lecky, hold on,' to which he replied, "'All right.' I asked her afterwards if she thought she was going overboard, and she answered, "'I did not think at all, Mamma, but felt sure we were gone.' Captain Lecky, being accustomed to very large ships, had not in the least realized how near we were to the water in our little vessel, and was proportionately taken by surprise. All the rest of the party were drenched, with the exception of Muriel, whom Captain Brown held high above the water in his arms, and who lost no time in remarking, in the midst of the general confusion, "'I'm not at all wet, I'm not!' Happily, the children don't know what fear is. The maids, however, were very frightened, as some of the sea had got down into the nursery, and the skylights had to be screwed down. Our studding sail boom, too, broke with a loud crack when the ship broached too, and the jaws of the fore boom gave way. Soon after this adventure we all went to bed, full of thankfulness that it had ended as well as it did, but alas, not so far as I was concerned, to rest in peace. In about two hours I was awakened by a tremendous weight of water suddenly descending upon me and flooding the bed. I immediately sprang out, only to find myself in another pool on the floor. It was pitch dark, and I could not think what had happened, so I rushed on deck and found that, the weather having moderated a little, some kind sailor, knowing my love of fresh air, had opened the skylight rather too soon, and one of the angry waves had popped on board, deluging the cabin. I got a light and proceeded to mop up as best I could, and then endeavored to find a dry place to sleep in. This, however, was no easy task, for my own bed was drenched and every other berth occupied. The deck, too, was ankle-deep in water, as I found when I tried to get across to the deck-house sofa. At last I lay down on the floor, wrapped up in my ulster, and wedged between the foot stanchion of our swing-bed and the wardrobe athwart ship, so that, as the yacht rolled heavily, my feet were often higher than my head. Consequently, what sleep I snatched turned into nightmare, of which the fixed idea was a broken head from the three hundred weight of lead at the bottom of our bed, swinging wildly from side to side and up and down, as the vessel rolled and pitched, suggesting all manner of accidents. When morning came at last, the weather cleared a good deal, though the breeze continued. All hands were soon busily employed in repairing damages, and very picturesque the deck and rigging of the sunbeam looked, with various groups of men, occupied upon the ropes, spars, and sails. Towards the evening the wind fell light, and we had to get up steam. The night was the first really warm one we had enjoyed, and the stars shone out brightly. The sea, which had been of a lovely blue color during the day, showed a slight phosphorescence after dark. Thursday, July 13th. When I went on deck at half-past six, I found a gray, steamy, calm morning, promising a very hot day without wind. About 10.30 a.m., the cry of, Sail on the port beam! caused general excitement, and in a few minutes every telescope and glass in the ship had been brought to bear upon the object which attracted our attention, and which was soon pronounced to be a wreck. Orders were given to starboard the helm and to steer direct for the vessel, and many were the conjectures hazarded and the questions asked of the fortunate holders of glasses. What is she? Is there anyone on board? Where does she come from? Can you read her name? Does she look as if she had been long abandoned? Soon we were near enough to send a boat's crew on board, whilst we watched their movements anxiously from the bridge. We could now read her name, the Carolina, surmounted by a gorgeous yellow decoration on her stern. 
She was of between two and three hundred tons burden, and was painted a light blue with a red streak. Beneath her white bowsprit the gaudy image of a woman served as a figurehead. The two masts had been snapped short off about three feet from the deck, and the bulwarks were gone, only the covering board and stanchions remaining, so that each wave washed over and through her. The roof and supports of the deck house and the companions were still left standing, but the sides had disappeared, and the ship's deck was burst up in such a manner as to remind one of a quail's back. We saw the men on board poking about, apparently very pleased with what they had found, and soon our boat returned to the yacht for some breakers, as the Carolina had been laden with port wine and cork, and the men wished to bring some of the former on board. I changed my dress, and, putting on my sea boots, started for the wreck. Footnote. Breakers are small casks used for carrying water in boats, frequently spelt barricos, evidently from the time of the old Spanish navigators. End footnote. We found the men rather excited over their discovery. The wine must have been very new and very strong, for the smell of it, as it slopped about all over the deck, was almost enough to intoxicate anybody. One pipe had already been emptied into the breakers and barrels, and great efforts were made to get some of the casks out whole, but this was found to be impossible without devoting more time to the operation than we chose to spare. The men managed to remove three half-empty casks with their heads stove in, which they threw overboard, but the full ones would have required special appliances to raise them through the hatches. It proved exceedingly difficult to get at the wine, which was stowed underneath the cork, and there was also a quantity of cabin bulkheads and fittings floating about, under the influence of the long swell of the Atlantic. It was a curious sight, standing on the roof of the deck-house, to look into the hold, full of floating bales of cork, barrels, and pieces of wood, and to watch the sea surging up in every direction, through and over the deck, which was level with the water's edge. I saw an excellent modern iron cooking stove washing about from side to side, but almost every other movable article, including spars and ropes, had apparently been removed by previous boarders. It would have delayed us too long to tow the vessel into the nearest port, 375 miles distant, or we might have claimed the salvage money, estimated by the experts at 1,500 pounds. She was too low in the water for it to be possible for us, with our limited appliances, to blow her up. So we were obliged to leave her, floating about as a derelict, a fertile source of danger to all ships crossing her track. With her buoyant cargo, and with the trade wind slowly wafting her to smoother seas, it may probably be some years before she breaks up. I only hope that no good ship may run full speed on to her, some dark night, for the Carolina would prove almost as formidable an obstacle as a sunken rock. Tom was now signaling for us to go on board again, and for a few minutes I was rather afraid we should have had a little trouble in getting the men off, as their excitement had not decreased, but after a trifling delay and some rather rough play amongst themselves they became steady again, and we returned to the yacht with our various prizes. A mother Carey's chicken hovered round the wreck while we were on board, and followed us to the sunbeam, and although a flat calm and a heavy swell prevailed at the time, we all looked upon our visitor as the harbinger of a breeze. In this instance, at least, the well-known sailor superstition was justified, for, before the evening, the wind sprang up, and fires out and sails up was the order of the day. We were soon bowling merrily along at the rate of seven knots an hour, while a clear starlit night and a heavy dew gave promise of a fine morrow. Friday, July 14th. We still have a light wind right aft, accompanied by a heavy roll from the westward, which makes it impossible to sit anywhere with comfort, and difficult even to read. By 6 a.m. the sun had become very powerful, though its heat was tempered by the breeze, which gradually increased throughout the day until, having set all our fore and aft canvas, as well as our square sails, we glided steadily along in delightful contrast to the uneasy motion of the morning and of the past few days under the awning with the most heavenly blue sky above and the still darker clear blue sea beneath stretching away in gentle ripples as far as the eye could reach it was simply perfect our little party get on extremely well together though a week ago they were strangers to each other we are all so busy that we do not see much of one another except at meals and then we have plenty to talk about Captain Lecky imparts to us some of his valuable information about scientific navigation and the law of storms, and he and Tom and Captain Brown work hard at these subjects. Mr. Freer follows in the same path, Mr. Bingham draws and reads, 
Dr. Potter helps me to teach the children who, I am happy to say, are as well as possible. I read and write a great deal and learn Spanish, so that the days are all too short for what we have to do. The servants are settling down well into their places, and the commissariat department does great credit to the cooks and stewards. The maids get on satisfactorily, but are a little nervous on rough nights. We hope not to have many more just at present, for we are now approaching calmer latitudes. In the course of the day, whilst Tom and I were sitting in the stern, the man at the wheel suddenly exclaimed, "'There's land on the port bow!' We knew from the distance we had run that this could not be the case, and after looking at it through the glasses, Tom pronounced the supposed land to be a thick wall of fog, advancing towards us against the wind. Captain Brown and Captain Lecky came from below and hastened to get in the studding sails in anticipation of the coming squall. In a few minutes we had lost our fair breeze and brilliant sunshine, all our sails were taken flat aback, and we found ourselves enveloped in a dense fog, which made it impossible for us to see the length of the vessel. It was an extraordinary phenomenon. Captain Lecky, who, in the course of his many voyages, has passed within a few miles of this exact spot more than a hundred and fifty times, had never seen anything in the least like it. As night came on, the fog increased, and the boats were prepared, ready for lowering. Two men went to the wheel and two to the bows to look out, while an officer was stationed on the bridge with steam whistle and bell ready for an emergency, so that, in case we ran into anything, or anything ran into us, we should at least have the satisfaction of knowing that, so far as we were concerned, it had all been done strictly according to Act of Parliament. Saturday, July 15th. Between midnight and 4 a.m. the fog disappeared as suddenly as it had come on. We must have passed through a wide belt of it. At 5.30 a.m., when Tom called me to see a steamer go by, it was quite clear. The vessel was the Roman, and she passed so close to us that we made our number and exchanged salutations with the officers on the bridge. Towards the afternoon, a nice breeze sprang up, and we were able to bank fires and sail. End of chapter 1「Two of a Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Madeira, Tenerife, and Cape de Verde Islands. Full many a green isle needs must be in this wide sea of misery, or the mariner worn and wan never thus could voyage on. Sunday, July 16th. Porto Santo being visible on the port bow, a quarter of a mile ahead, by 3.55 a.m. this morning, our three navigators congratulated themselves and each other on the good landfall they had made. It looks a curious little island, and is situated about 35 miles northeast of Madeira, with a high peak in the center of which we could only see the extreme point appearing above the clouds. It is interesting to know that it was from his observation of the driftwood and debris washed on to the eastern shore that Columbus, who had married the daughter of the governor of Porto Santo, derived his first impressions of the existence of the New World. Here it was that he first realized there might possibly be a large and unknown country to the westward. Here it was that he first conceived the project of exploring the hitherto unknown ocean and of discovering what new countries might bound its western shores. An hour later, we saw Fora and its light at the extreme east of Madeira, and could soon distinguish the mountains in the center of the latter island. As we rapidly approached the land, the beauty of the scenery became more fully apparent. A mass of dark purple volcanic rocks, clothed on the top with the richest vegetation, with patches of all sorts of color on their sides, rises boldly from the sea. There are several small detached rocks, and one curious pointed little island, with an arch right through the middle of it, rather like the Perse Rock on the coast of Nova Scotia. We steamed slowly along the east coast, passing many pretty hamlets, nestled in bays or perched on the side of hills, and observing how every possible nook and corner seemed to be terraced and cultivated. Sugar canes, Indian corn, vines, and many varieties of tropical and semi-tropical plants grow luxuriantly in this lovely climate. Nearly all the cottages in the island are inhabited by a simple people, 
many of whom have never left their native villages even to look at the magnificent view from the top of the surrounding mountains or to gaze on the sea by which they are encompassed we dropped our anchor in the bay of funchal at about twelve o'clock and before breakfast was over found ourselves surrounded by a perfect flotilla of boats though none of them dared approach very near until the health officer had come alongside and pronounced us free from infection at this moment all are complaining much of the heat which since yesterday has been very great and is caused by the wind called est blowing direct from the african deserts it was seventy nine degrees in the coolest place on board and eighty four degrees on shore in the shade in the middle of the day the african mail steamer ethiopia last from bonny west coast of africa whence she arrived the day before yesterday was lying in the bay and the children went on board with some of our party to see her cargo of monkeys parrots and pineapples the result was an importation of five parrots on board the sunbeam but the monkeys were too big for us captain dane who paid us a return visit said that the temperature here appeared quite cool to him as for the last few weeks his thermometer had varied from eighty two degrees to ninety six degrees in the shade we had service at four p m and at five p m went ashore in a native boat furnished with bilge pieces to keep her straight when beached and to avoid the surf for it was too rough for our own boats at the water's edge a curious sort of double sleigh drawn by two oxen was waiting into this we stepped setting off with considerable rapidity up the steep shingly beach under a beautiful row of trees to the praka where the greater portion of the population were walking up and down or sitting under the shade of the magnolias these plants here attain the size of forest trees and their large white wax-like flowers shed a most delightful fragrance on the evening air there were graceful pepper vines too and a great variety of trees only known to us in england in the form of small shrubs this being a festival day the streets were crowded with people from town and country in their holiday attire the doorposts and balconies of the houses were wreathed with flowers the designs in many cases being very pretty one arcade in particular was quite lovely with arches made of double red geranium mixed with the feathery looking pepper leaves while the uprights were covered with amaryllis and white arum lilies the streets were strewn with roses and branches of myrtle which bruised by the feet of the passers-by and the runners of the bullock sleigh emitted a delicious aromatic odour the trellises in the gardens seem overgrown with stephanotis mauve and purple passion flowers and all kinds of rare creepers the purple and white hibiscus shoots up some fourteen to sixteen feet in height bananas full of fruit and flower strelitzias heliotrope geraniums and pelargoniums bloom all around in large shrubs mixed with palms and mimosas of every variety and the whole formed such an enchanting picture that we were loath to tear ourselves away a ride of about twenty minutes in the bullock sleigh up a steep hill by the side of a rocky torrent whose banks were overgrown with caladiniums and vines brought us to our destination till whence we had a splendid view of the town and bay stretching beneath us during the ascent we passed several cottages whose inhabitants stood airing themselves on the threshold after the great heat of the day and through the open doorways we occasionally got a peep into the gardens beyond full of bright flowers and luxuriant with vines fig trees and bananas as we sat in the terrace garden at till we enjoyed the sweet scent of the flowers we could no longer see and listened to the cool splash of water in the fountain below whilst allnut with unceasing energy searched amongst the bushes for moths of which he found a large number we jogged down the hill a great deal faster than we had come up stopping only for a short time in the now more than ever crowded praca to listen to one or two airs played by the portuguese band before we got back to the yacht at about half past ten next morning we were off to the fish market by seven o'clock but it was not a good time for our visit as there had been no moon on the previous night and though there were fish of various kinds saw nothing specially worth of notice the picturesque costumes of the people were however interesting we afterwards went to the fruit market though it was not specially worth seeing for most of the fruit and vegetables are brought in boats from villages on the seashore and as it is necessary to wait until the sea breeze springs up they do not arrive until midday. 
After our walk, the children and I went down to the beach and bathed, taking care not to go too far out on account of the sharks, of which we had been warned. We undressed and dressed in tents, not unlike clothes horses, with a bit of matting thrown over them, in which the heat was intense. The beach is very steep, and as one gets out of one's depth immediately, indifferent swimmers put on a couple of bladders, which stick out behind their backs and produce a strange effect, or else take a bathing man into the water with them. I preferred the latter course, and we all had a pleasant bathe. The natives seem almost amphibious in their habits, and the yacht is surrounded all day by boats full of small boys, who will dive to any depth for sixpence, a dozen of them spluttering and fighting for the coin in the water at the same time. They will go down on one side of the yacht, too, and bob up on the other, almost before you have time to run across the deck to witness their reappearance. The Lou Rock, with its old fortress close to our anchorage, forms a picturesque object, and the scene from the yacht, enlivened by the presence of numerous market boats laden with fruit and vegetables, is very pretty. We lie about 150 yards from the shore, just under Mr. De Nero's Quinta. The cliff just here is overhung with bougainvilleas, geraniums, fuchsias, aloes, prickly pears, and other flowers, which grow luxuriantly quite down to the water's edge, wherever they can contrive to find a root hold. After five o'clock tea, we rode up the mount and through the woods on horseback, along a road gay with masses of wild geranium, hydrangea, amaryllis, and fuchsia. We dismounted at a lovely place, which contains a large number of rare trees and plants, brought from all parts of the world. Here were enormous camellias, as well as purple, red, and white azaleas, Guernsey lilies all growing in the greatest profusion. Our descent of the mount, by means of a form of conveyance commonly used on the island, was very amusing. At the summit we found basket-work sleighs, each constructed to hold two people, and attended by a couple of men lashed together. Into these we stepped, and were immediately pushed down the hill at a tremendous pace. The gliding motion is delightful, and was altogether a novelty to us. The men managed the sleighs with great skill, steering them in the most wonderful manner round the sharp angles in the zigzag road, and making use of their bare feet as brakes when necessary. The turns were occasionally so abrupt that it seemed almost impossible that we could avoid being upset, but we reached the bottom quite safely. The children were especially delighted with the trip, and indeed we all enjoyed it immensely. The only danger is the risk of fire from the friction of the steel runners against the gravel road. After paying a visit to Mr. and Mrs. Blandy, whose house is beautifully situated, we dined at the hotel, and afterwards sat in the lovely semi-tropical garden until it was time to go on board to bed. Tuesday, July 18th. We were called at 4.30 a.m. and went ashore soon after six to meet some friends, with whom we had arranged to ride up to the Grand Corral and to breakfast there 5,000 feet above the level of the sea. It soon became evident that the time we had selected for landing was the fashionable bathing hour. In fact, it required some skill on our part to keep the boat clear of the crowds of people of both sexes and all ages who were taking their morning dip. It was most absurd to see entire families, from the bald-headed and spectacled grandfather to the baby who could scarcely walk, all disporting themselves in the water together, many of them supported by the very inelegant-looking bladders I have mentioned. There was a little delay in mounting our horses under the shade of the fig trees, but when we were once off a party of eleven, the cavalcade became quite formidable. As we clattered up the paved streets between vineyard and garden walls, curiosity opened her lattice on more than one occasion to ascertain the cause of the unwanted commotion. The views on our way, as we sometimes climbed a steep ascent or descended a deep ravine, were very varied, but always beautiful. About halfway up, we stopped to rest under a delightful trellis of vines, by the side of a rushing mountain stream bordered with ferns. Then, leaving the vineyards and gardens behind us, we passed through forests of shady Spanish chestnut trees, beneath which stretched the luxurious greensward. At ten o'clock we quitted this grateful shade, and arrived at the neck of the pass, facing the Grand Corral, where we had to make our choice of ascending a conical hill on our left or the Torrenas Peak on our right. The latter was chosen as promising the better view, although it was rather farther off, so we were accordingly seized upon by some of the crowd of peasants who surrounded us, and who at once proceeded to push and pull us up a steep, slippery grass slope, interspersed with large boulders. 
the view from the top looking down a sheer precipice of some fifteen hundred feet in depth into the valley below was lovely quite at the bottom amid the numerous ravines and small spurs of rocks by which the valley is intersected we could distinguish some small patches of cultivated ground above our heads towered the jagged crests of the highest peaks pico ruvo and others which we had already seen from the yacht when we first sighted the island a pleasant walk over some grassy slopes and two more hard scrambles took us to the summit of the tornas peak but the charming and extensive view toward camara de lobos and the bay and town of funchal was an ample reward for all our trouble it did not take us long to get back to the welcome shade of the chestnut trees for we were all ravenously hungry it being now eleven o'clock but alas breakfast had not arrived so we had no resource but to mount our horses again and ride down to meet it mr miles of the hotel had not kept his word he had promised that our provisions should be sent up to us by nine o'clock and it was midday before we met the men carrying the hampers on their heads there was now nothing for it but to organize a picnic on the terrace of mr vake's deserted villa beneath the shade of camilla fuchsia myrtle magnolia and pepper trees from whence we could also enjoy the fine view of the fertile valley beneath us and the blue sea sparkling beyond wednesday july nineteenth we were so tired after our exertions of yesterday that it was nine o'clock before we all mustered for our morning swim which i think we enjoyed the more from the fact of our having previously been prevented by the sharks or rather by the rumour of sharks we were engaged to lunch at mr and mrs blandy's but i was so weary that i did not go ashore until about six o'clock in the evening and then i went first to the english cemetery which is very prettily laid out and well kept the various paths are shaded by pepper trees entwined with bougainvillea while in many places the railings are completely covered by long trailing masses of stephanotis in full bloom some of the inscriptions on the tombs are extremely touching and it is sad to see as is almost always the case in places much resorted to by invalids how large a proportion of those who lie buried here have been cut off in the very flower of their youth indeed the residents at madeira complain that it is a melancholy drawback to the charms of this beautiful island that the friendship frequently formed between them and people who come hither in search of health is in so many cases brought to an early and sad termination having seen and admired mrs fuljam's charming garden by daylight we returned on board to receive some friends unfortunately they were not very good sailors and out of our party of twenty one lady had to go ashore at once and another before dinner was over they all admired the yacht very much particularly the various cosy corners in the deck-house it was a lovely night and after the departure of our guests at about ten o'clock we steamed out of the bay where we found a nice light breeze which enabled us to sail thursday july twentieth all to-day has been taken up in arranging our photographs journals etc etc and in preparing for our visit to tenerife about twelve o'clock the wind fell light and we tried fishing but without success though several bonitos or flying fish were seen it was very hot and it seemed quite a relief when at eight o'clock in the evening we began steaming thus creating a breeze for ourselves friday july twenty first we all rose early and were full of excitement to catch the first glimpse of the famous peak of tenerife there was a nice breeze from the northeast the true trade wind we hope which ought to carry us down nearly to the line the morning being rather hazy it was quite ten o'clock before we saw the peak towering above the clouds right ahead about fifty-nine miles off as we approached it appeared less perpendicular than we had expected or than it is generally represented in pictures the other mountains too in the centre of the island from the midst of which it rises are so very lofty that in spite of its conical sugar-loaf top it is difficult at first to realize that the peak is twelve thousand one hundred eighty feet high we dropped anchor under its shadow in the harbor of oratava in preference to the capital santa cruz both on account of its being a healthier place and also in order to be nearer to the peak which we wished to ascend the heat having made the rest of our party rather lazy captain lecky and i volunteered to go on shore to see the vice-consul mr goodall and try to make arrangements for our expedition it was only two p m and very hot work walking through the deserted streets 
but luckily we had not far to go, and the house was nice and cool when we got there. Mr. Goodall sent off at once for a carriage, dispatching a messenger also to the mountains for horses and guides, which there was some difficulty in obtaining at such short notice. Having organized the expedition, we re-embarked to dine on board the yacht, and I went to bed at seven, to be called again, however, at half-past ten o'clock. After a light supper, we landed and went to the vice-consuls, arriving there exactly at midnight. But no horses were forthcoming, so we lay down on our rugs in the patio, and endeavored to sleep, as we knew we should require all our strength for the expedition before us. There were sundry false alarms of a start, as the horses arrived by ones and twos from the neighboring villages, accompanied by their respective owners. By two o'clock all our steeds, twelve in number, had assembled, and in another quarter of an hour we were leaving the town by a steep stony path bordered by low walls. There was no moon, and for the first two hours it was very dark. At the end of that time we could see the first glimmer of dawn, and were shortly afterwards able to distinguish each other, and to observe the beautiful view which lay below us as we wended our way up and up between small patches of cultivation. Soon we climbed above the clouds, which presented a most curious appearance as we looked down upon them. The strata through which we had passed was so dense and so white that it looked exactly like an enormous glacier, covered with fresh fallen snow, extending for miles and miles, while the projecting tops of the other Canary Islands appeared only like great solitary rocks. The sun had already become very oppressive, and at half-past seven we stopped to breakfast and to water the horses. Half-past eight found us in the saddle again, and we commenced to traverse a dreary plain of yellowish-white pumice stone, interspersed with huge blocks of obsidian thrown from the mouth of the volcano. At first the monotony of the scene was relieved by large bushes of yellow broom in full flower, and still larger bushes of the beautiful Retama Blanca, quite covered with lovely white bloom, scenting the air with its delicious fragrance, and resembling huge tufts of feathers eight or nine feet high. As we proceeded, however, we left all traces of vegetation behind us. It was like the great Sahara. On every side a vast expanse of yellow pumice stone sand spread around us, an occasional block of rock sticking up here and there, and looking as if it had indeed been fused in a mighty furnace. By half-past ten we had reached the Estancia de los Ingleses, 9,639 feet above the level of the sea, where the baggage and some of the horses had to be left behind, the saddles being transferred to mules for the very steep climb before us. After a drink of water all round, we started again, and commenced the ascent of the almost perpendicular stream of lava and stone, which forms the only practicable route to the top. Our poor beasts were only able to go a few paces at a time without stopping to regain their breath. The loose ashes and lava fortunately gave them a good foothold, or it would have been quite impossible for them to get along at all. One was only encouraged to proceed by the sight of one's friends above, looking like flies clinging to the face of a wall. The road, if such it can be called, ran in zigzags, each of which was about the length of two horses, so that we were in turns one above another. There were a few slips and slides and tumbles, but no important casualties, and in about an hour and a half we had reached the Alta Vista, a tiny plateau where the horses were to be left. The expedition so far had been such a fatiguing one, and the heat was so great that the children and I decided to remain here and to let the gentlemen proceed alone to the summit of the peak. We tried to find some shade, but the sun was so immediately above us that this was almost an impossibility. However, we managed to squeeze ourselves under some slightly overhanging rocks, and I took some photographs while the children slept. The guide soon returned with water barrels full of ice, procured from a cabin above, where there is a stream of water constantly running, and nothing could have been more grateful and refreshing. It was more than three hours before Tom and Captain Lecky reappeared, to be soon followed by the rest of the party. Whilst they rested and refreshed themselves with ice, they described the ascent as fatiguing in the extreme, in fact almost an impossibility for a lady. First they had scrambled over huge blocks of rough lava to the tiny plain of the Rambleta, 11,466 feet above the level of the sea, after which they had to climb up the cone itself, 
530 feet in height, and sloping at an angle of 44 degrees. It is composed of ashes and calcined chalk, into which their feet sank, while for every two steps they made forwards and upwards, they slipped one backwards. But those who reached the top were rewarded for their exertions by a glorious view, and by the wonderful appearance of the summit of the peak. The ground beneath their feet was hot, while sulphurous vapors and smoke issued from various small fissures around them, though there has been no actual eruption from this crater of the volcano since 1704. They brought down with them a beautiful piece of calcined chalk, covered with crystals of sulphur and arsenic, and some other specimens. Parched and dry as the ground looked where I was resting, a few grains of barley, dropped by mules on the occasion of a previous visit, had taken root and had grown up into ear, and there were also a few roots of a sort of dog-violet, showing its delicate lavender-coloured flowers eleven thousand feet above the sea, and far beyond the level of any other vegetation. It was impossible to ride down to the spot where we had left the baggage animals, and the descent was consequently very fatiguing and even painful. At every step our feet sank into a mass of loose scoriae and ashes, and so we went slipping, sliding, and stumbling along, sometimes running against a rock and sometimes nearly pitching forward on our faces. All this, too, beneath a blazing sun, with a the thermometer at 78 degrees, and not a vestige of shade. At last Tom and I reached the bottom, where, after partaking of luncheon and draughts of quinine, we lay down under the shadow of a great rock to recruit our weary frames. Refreshed by our meal, we started at six o'clock on our return journey, and went down a good deal faster than we came up. Before the end of the pumice stone or Ratama Plains had been reached, it was nearly dark. Sundry small accidents occurring to stirrup leathers, bridles, and girths, for the saddlery was not of the best description, delayed us slightly, and as Tom, Dr. Potter, Alnut, and the guide had got on ahead, we soon lost sight of them. After an interval of uncertainty, the other guides confessed that they did not know the way back in the dark. This was not pleasant, for the roads were terrible, and during the whole of our journey up, from the port to the peak, we had met only four people in all, two goat herds with their flocks, and two neveros, bringing down ice to the town. There was, therefore, not much chance of gaining information from any one on our way down. We wandered about among low bushes, down water courses, and over rocks for a long time. Horns were blown, and other means of attracting attention were tried, first one and then another of the party, meanwhile coming more or less to grief. My good little horse fell down three times, though we did not part company, and once he went up a steep bank by mistake, instead of going down a very nasty water course, which I do not wonder at his objecting to. I managed to jump off in time, and so no harm was done, but it was rather anxious work. About ten o'clock we saw a light in the distance, and with much shouting woke up the inhabitants of the cottage whence it proceeded, promising to reward them liberally if they would only show us our way back. Three of them consented to do this, and provided themselves accordingly, with pine torches, wrapped round with bracken and leaves. One, a very fine man, dressed in white, with his arm extended above his head, bearing the light, led the way. Another walked in front of my horse, while the third brought up the rear. They conducted us down the most frightfully steep paths until we had descended beneath the clouds, when the light from our torches threw our shadows in gigantic form upon the mists above, reminding us of the legend of the spectre of the Brocken. At last the torches began to go out, one by one, and just as the last light was expiring, we arrived at a small village, where we of course found that everybody was asleep. After some delay, during which Mabel and I were so tired that we lay down in the street to rest, more torches were procured, and a fresh guide who led us into the comparatively good path towards Puerto Orotava. Finally, half an hour after midnight, we arrived at the house of the vice-consul, who had provided refreshments for us, and whose nephew was still very kindly sitting up awaiting our return. But we were too tired to do anything but go straight on board the yacht, where, after some supper and champagne, we were indeed glad to retire to our berths. This was at 3.30 a.m., exactly 29 hours since we had been called on Friday night. It is certainly too long an expedition to be performed in one day. Tents should be taken and arrangements made for camping out for one, if not two, nights. But in the case of such a large party as ours, this would have been a great business, as everything must be carried to so great a height, up such steep places, and over such bad roads. 
Still, there are so many objects and places of interest, not only on but around the peak, that it is a pity to see them only when hurried and fatigued. Sunday, July 23rd. Orders had been given not to call us nor to wash decks, and it was consequently half-past ten before anyone awoke, and midday before the first of our party put in an appearance on deck. Long before this, the sunbeam had been inundated with visitors from the shore. We had given a general invitation to the friends of the vice-consul to come and see the yacht, and they accordingly arrived in due course, accompanied in many cases by a large circle of acquaintances. Those who came first were conducted below and all over the vessel, but the number ultimately became so great that, in self-defense, we were obliged to limit their wanderings to the deck, opening the skylights wide, however, to enable them to see as much as possible of the saloon and cabins. From breakfast time until prayers at three o'clock, when the yacht was closed for an hour, there was a constant stream of visitors from the shore. It was a great nuisance, but still it seemed unkind to refuse to allow them to see what they had never seen before, and might possibly never have an opportunity of seeing again. All steamers and sailing ships, as a rule, go to Santa Cruz, and the fame of our vessel having been spread abroad by our visitors of Friday, many of the poor people had come from villages far away over the mountains. We could not help feeling a certain respect for the determined way in which physical infirmity was mastered by curiosity, though many experienced very serious inconvenience from the motion of the vessel, they still persevered in their examination. About five o'clock we went ashore ourselves and drove up to Villa Orotava. The wide road is macadamized and marked with kilometer stones, and is planted on either side with pepper trees, plane trees, and the eucalyptus globulus, which has grown 35 meters or 115 feet in seven years. The hedges are formed of blue plumbago, scarlet geranium, yellow acacia, lavender-colored heliotrope, white jasmine, and pink and white roses. After driving a few miles, we turned down an old paved road towards the sea, and by dint of a considerable amount of shaking, arrived at the celebrated botanical gardens mentioned by Humboldt and others. We passed through a small house, with a fine dragon tree on either side, and entered the gardens, where we found a valuable collection of trees and shrubs of almost every known species. The kind and courteous curator, Don Herman Wildgarrett, accompanied us, and explained the peculiarities of the many interesting plants from Europe, Asia, Africa, America, Australia, New Zealand, and the various islands of the North and South Pacific and Indian Oceans. The climate of Tenerife is so equable that the island forms a true garden of acclimatization for the vegetable productions of the various countries of the world. By the judicious expenditure of a little more money, this establishment might be made an important means of introducing to Europe many new and valuable plants. At present, the annual income is 5,000 francs, the salary of the curator being 1,000 francs. A rough drive over paved roads, commanding extensive views of sea and rocks, and of some palm trees on a promontory in the distance, brought us, at about seven o'clock, to the boat, which was waiting our return. We arrived in due course on board the sunbeam, laden with bouquets of the choicest flowers, and soon after dinner we all retired to bed, not having yet recovered from the fatigues of yesterday. Monday, July 24th. What one gains in the beauty and abundance of vegetable life here, one loses in its rapid and premature decay. Fruit gathered in the morning is scarcely fit to eat at night, and the flowers brought on board yesterday evening were dead today at 4.30 a.m., whilst some of the roses we brought from cows lasted until we reached Madeira, though it must be owned so many fell to pieces that my cabin used to be daily swept with rose leaves instead of tea leaves. We went ashore soon after six, and drove straight to the garden of the Marquis de Sanzal, where there is a beautiful palm tree, a hundred and one feet high, the remains of an enormous dragon tree, old even in the fifteenth century, besides hedges of myrtle, jasmine, and clematis, and flowers of every description in full bloom. The dragon tree is a species of dracaena, and looks rather like a gigantic candelabra, composed of a number of yuccas, perched on the top of a gnarled and somewhat deformed stem, half palm, half cactus. Another beautiful garden was next visited, belonging to the Marquis de la Candia, who received us and showed us his coffee and plantains in full growth, as well as a magnificent Spanish chestnut tree, coeval with the dragon tree. Out of one of its almost decayed branches, a so-called young tree was growing, but it would have been thought very respectable and middle-aged in any other locality. 
Everyone here, as in Madeira, has been more or less ruined by the failure of the vines. Most of the large landed proprietors have left their estates to take care of themselves, and the peasants for the last few years have been immigrating by hundreds to Caracas in Venezuela. Things are, however, beginning to look up a little now. The cultivation of cochineal appears to succeed, though the price is low, coffee answers well, and permission has been obtained from the Spanish government to grow tobacco, accompanied by a promise to purchase, at a certain fixed rate, all that can be produced. Still, people talk of the island of Tenerife as something very different now from what it was 25 or 30 years ago, both as regards the number of its inhabitants and the activity of its commerce, and moreover the good old times, a custom I have remarked in many other places. The Marquis de la Quindia and Don Herman Wildgarret returned on board with us to breakfast. The anchor had been weighed and the sunbeam was slowly steaming up and down waiting for us. The stream of visitors had been as great and as constant as ever during our absence, in spite of the heavy roll of the sea, and the deck seemed quite covered with baskets of flowers and fruit, kindly sent on board by the people who had been over the yacht the day before. Amongst the latest arrivals were some very handsome Spanish ladies, beautifully dressed in black, with mantillas, each of whom was accompanied by a young man carrying a basin. It must, I fear, be confessed that this was rather a trial to the gravity of all on board. It certainly was an instance of the pursuit of knowledge or the gratification of curiosity under considerable difficulties. Immediately after breakfast, our friends bade us adieu and went ashore in the shore boat while we steamed along the north side of the island, past the splendid cliffs of Buena Vista, rising 2,000 feet sheer from the sea, to Cape Teno, the extreme western point of Tenerife. In the distance we could see the Great Canary, Palma, and Hero, and soon passed close to the rocky island of Gomera. Here, too, the dark cliffs of volcanic form and origin are magnificent, and as we were almost becalmed by the high land, whilst we sailed along the north shore of the island, we had ample opportunities of admiring its rugged beauty. During the night we approached Palma, another large island of the Canary group, containing one of the most remarkable calderas, or large basins, formed by volcanic action in the world. End of chapter 2「Three of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Palma to Rio de Janeiro. A wet sheet and a flowing sea, a wind that follows fast, and fills the white and rustling sail, and bends the gallant mast. Tuesday, July 25th. There was not much wind during the night, and Palma was consequently still visible when I came on deck at daybreak. We had a light, fair wind in the morning, accompanied by a heavy swell, which caused us to roll so much that I found it very difficult to do anything. Several shoals of flying fish skimmed past us along the surface of the water, occasionally rising to a considerable height above it. Their beautiful wings, glittering in the bright sunlight, looked like delicate silver filigree work. In the night, one flew on board, only to be preserved in spirits by Dr. Potter. Saturday, July 29th. For the last three days we have been going on quietly, with fair, warm weather, but a nice fresh breeze sprang up today. At midday the sun was so exactly vertical over our heads that it was literally possible to stand under the shadow of one's own hat brim and be sheltered all round. Our navigators experienced considerable difficulty in taking their noontide observations, as the sun appeared to dodge about in every direction. About two o'clock we made the high land of St. Antonio, one of the Cape de Verde Islands, and soon afterwards the lower land of St. Vincent. Some doubt existing as to the prevalence of fever at the latter place, Tom decided not to stop there for fear of having to undergo quarantine at Rio de Janeiro. We therefore shortened sail and passed slowly between the islands to the anchorage beyond the Bird Rock. This is a very small island, of perfectly conical form, covered with thousands of sea-fowl who live here undisturbed by any other inhabitants. The town of Porto Grande, with its rows of white houses on the seashore, at the base of the rocky crags, looked clean and comfortable in the evening light. 
During the day, however, it must be a hot and glaring place, for there are no trees to afford shade, nor indeed any kind of vegetation. The water, too, is bad, and all supplies for passing steamers are brought from the other islands, at very uncertain intervals. It is still a great coaling station, though not so much used as it was formerly, before the opening of the Suez Canal. The ships come out with coal and go away in ballast. There is nothing else to be had here, procured from a point near the town, to Rio or elsewhere, where they pick up their homeward cargo of fruit, etc. The absence of twilight in these latitudes, both at dawn and sunset, is certainly very remarkable. This morning at four o'clock the stars were shining brightly. Ten minutes later the day had commenced to break, and at half-past four the sun had risen above the horizon and was gilding the surrounding mountain tops. Sunday, July 30th. About 10 a.m. we were off Tarafal Bay, a most hopeless-looking place for supplies. High rocky mountains, sandy slopes, and black volcanic beach composed a scene of arid desolation, in the midst of which was situated one small white house with four windows and a thatched roof, surrounded by a little green patch of sugar canes and coconut palms. But the result proved the sageness of the advice contained in the old proverb, not to trust to appearances only, for, whilst we were at breakfast, Mr. Martinez, the son of the owner of the one whitewashed cottage to be seen, came on board. To our surprise, he spoke English extremely well and promised us all sorts of supplies if we could wait until three o'clock in the afternoon. Having agreed to do this, we shortly afterwards went ashore in his boat, with a crew of more than half-naked negroes, and a hot row of about three miles brought us to the shore, where, after some little difficulty, we succeeded in effecting a landing." Our feet immediately sank into the hot black sand, composed entirely of volcanic deposits and small pieces, or rather grains of amber, through which we had a fatiguing walk until we reached some palm trees, shading a little pool of water. Here we left some of the men, with instructions to fill the breakers they had brought with them, while we walked on along the beach, past the remains of an English schooner that caught fire not far from this island, and was run ashore by her captain thirty years ago. Her iron anchor, chain, and wheel still remained, together with two queer little iron cannon, which I should have much liked to carry off as a memorial of our visit. We then turned up a narrow, shadeless path, bordered by stone walls, leading away from the sea, past a sugar mill and a ruin. A few almond, castor oil, and fig trees were growing amongst the sugar canes, and as we mounted the hill we could see some thirty round straw huts, like beehives, on the sandy slopes beside the little stream. An abrupt turn in the mountains, amid which, at a distance of three leagues, this tiny river takes its rise, hides it from the sea, so that the narrow valley which it fertilizes looks like a small oasis in the desert of rocks and sand. Mr. Martinez's house, where we sat for some time, and beneath the windows of which one stream of the island runs, was comparatively cool. Outside, the negro washerwomen were busy washing clothes in large turtle-shell tubs, assisted or hindered, by the washerwoman bird a kind of white crane who appeared quite tame playing about just like a kitten pecking at the clothes or the women's feet and then running away and hiding behind a tree the stream was full of watercresses while the burnt-up little garden contained an abundance of beautiful flowers there were scarlet and yellow mimosas of many kinds combining every shade of exquisite green velvety foliage alpinias with pink waxy flowers and crimson and gold centers oleanders, begonias, hibiscus, alamandas, and arum and other lilies. Mr. Bingham sketched, I took some photographs, Dr. Potter and the children caught butterflies, and the rest of our party wandered about. Every five minutes a negro arrived with a portion of our supplies. One brought a sheep, another a milch goat for the baby, while the rest contributed severally, a couple of coconuts, a papaya, three mangoes, a few watercresses, a sack of sweet potatoes, a bottle of milk, three or four quinces, a bunch of bananas, a little honey, half a dozen cabbages, some veal and pork, and so on, until it appeared as if every little garden on either side of the three leagues of stream must have yielded up its entire produce, and we had accumulated sacks full of coconuts and potatoes, hundreds of eggs, and dozens of chickens and ducks. It was very amusing to see the things arrive." They were brought in by people varying in color from dark yellow to the blackest ebony, and ranging in size from fine stalwart men over six feet in height 
to tiny little blackies of about three feet six with curly hair snowy teeth and mischievous beady eyes the arrival of the provision boat and the transfer of its miscellaneous cargo to the sunbeam was quite an amusing sight the pretty black goat and the sheep bleated the fowls cackled and the ducks quacked while the negroes chatted and laughed as they handed and hauled on board fish of all shapes and sizes bunches of bananas piles of coconuts sacks of potatoes and many other things finishing up with a tiny black boy about three years old whom i think they would rather have liked to leave behind with us if we would only have taken him the fish proved excellent though some of them really seemed almost too pretty to eat a brilliant gold fish weighing about three pounds and something like a gray mullet in flavor was perhaps the best the prices were very curious chickens a shilling each ducks five shillings goats thirty shillings and sheep ten shillings vegetables fruit and flowers were extremely cheap but the charge for water fetched from the spring in our own breakers by our own crew with but little assistance from four or five negroes was three pounds eighteen shillings however as ours is the only yacht with one exception that has ever visited this island there was nothing for it except to pay the bill without demur i never in my life felt so warm as i did to-day on shore though the inhabitants say it will not be really hot for two months yet i never before saw coconut palms growing and i never tasted a mango until this morning so i have experienced three new sensations in one day the night was fearfully close muggy and thundery the temperature in the cabins being eighty nine degrees in spite of open skylights and portholes generally speaking it has not hitherto been as hot as we expected especially on board the yacht itself on deck there is almost always a nice breeze but below it is certainly warm tuesday august first yesterday we were still under sail but to-day it has been necessary to steam for the wind has fallen too light there was a heavy roll from the south and the weather continued hot and oppressive in the cabins the thermometer stood at eighty nine degrees during the whole of the night in spite of all our efforts to improve the temperature we therefore put three of the children in the deck-house to sleep opening the doors and windows and some of the rest of our party slept on deck in hammocks in anticipation of the heavy equatorial rains which captain lecky had predicted might commence to-day we had had the awnings put up a fortunate piece of foresight for before midnight the rain came down in torrents wednesday august second at daybreak the sky was covered with heavy black clouds and the atmosphere was as hot and muggy as ever we had a great deal of rain during the day and took advantage of the opportunity to fill every available tub bucket and basin to say nothing of the awnings it came down in such sheets that mackintoshes were comparatively useless and we had soon filled our seventeen breakers the cistern and the boats from which we had removed the covers with very good though somewhat dirty washing water friday august fourth we were only two hundred eighty nine miles off sierra leone in the morning and at noon therefore tom decided to put about having done so we found that we went along much more easily and quite as fast on the other track we maintained a good rate of speed on our new course which was now nearly due west passing a large bark with every stitch of canvas set hand over hand we are still in the guinea current and the temperature of the water is eighty two degrees even in the early morning but the heat of the sun does not seem to have much effect upon it as it does not vary to any great extent during the day in the evening we saw the southern cross for the first time and were much disappointed in its appearance the fourth star is of smaller magnitude than the others and the whole group is only for a very short time in a really upright position inclining almost always either to one side or the other as it rises and sets tuesday august eighth we crossed the line at daylight this event caused much fun and excitement both in cabin and forecastle the conventional hair was put across the field of the telescope for the unsophisticated really to see the line and many firmly believed they did see it and discussed its appearance at some length jim allen one of our tallest sailors and coxswain of the gig dressed in blue with long oakum wig and beard gilt paper crown and trident and fish impaled in one hand was seated on a gun carriage and made a capital father neptune our somewhat portly engineer mr rowbotham with fur-trimmed dressing-gown and cap and bent form leaning on a stick his face partially concealed by a long gray beard and a large bandbox of pills on one arm made an equally good doctor to his marine majesty 
while the part of mrs trident was ably filled by one of the youngest sailors dressed in some of the maids clothes but the accompanying pictures will give a better idea than any description of mine soon afterwards we saw an enormous shoal of grampuses large black fish about twenty-five feet in length something between a dolphin and a whale with the very ugliest jaws or rather snouts imaginable they are of a predatory and ferocious disposition attacking not only sharks dolphins and porpoises but even whales more than twice their own size we also passed through enormous quantities of flying fish no doubt driven to the surface by dolphins and bonitos they were much larger and stronger in the wing than any we have hitherto seen lulu's puppies born yesterday have been respectfully named butterfly who survived her birth only an hour poseidon aphrodite amphitrite and thetis names suggested by their birthplace on the ocean close to his marine majesty's supposed equatorial palace at noon we were two hundred fifty miles off st paul's rocks thursday august tenth a very hot showery day saw two large ships in the distance in the morning we were almost becalmed for a time but the breeze returned during the afternoon and we were able to proceed on our course i think this has been the most lovely of the many exquisite days we have enjoyed since we left england it commenced with a magnificent sunrise and ended with an equally gorgeous sunset only to be succeeded by a beautiful moonlit night so clear and bright that we could see to read ordinary print on deck saturday august twelfth at noon we were three hundred miles off bahia a place we have made up in our minds not to visit as it would lengthen our voyage considerably and there is not much to see there we have therefore decided to proceed direct to rio where we are looking forward to arrive on wednesday or thursday next the night was showery with a good deal of wind and sea sunday august thirteenth sailing in the tropics is really very delightful when going to the westward there is almost always at this season of the year a favorable breeze and the weather is generally either quite fair or moderately so whispered to it westward westward and with speed it darted forward we had service at eleven fifteen a m and again at five thirty p m the choir has considerably improved one of our new men plays the violin very well and frequently accompanies the children and the nurse in their songs on a clear calm night beneath a tropical sky when the members of this little group assemble on deck and by the light of a lantern sing some of their simple songs the effect produced is both melodious and picturesque the wind dropped at about ten p m and we had an unpleasant amount of roll during the night sails flapping spars creaking and booms swinging as if they would pull the masts out of the vessel monday august fourteenth this morning we saw a small schooner ahead, and thinking from her maneuvers that she wished to speak us, we made our number and ran towards her. We soon found out, however, that she was a whaler, in chase of two large grampuses. She had two men on the lookout in the cross trees, in a sort of iron cage, and though she was of much smaller tonnage than the sunbeam, she carried five big boats, one of which, full of men, was ready to be lowered into the water, the instant they had approached sufficiently near to the whale or grampus these seas used formerly to abound with whalers but they are now much less numerous the seasons having been bad of late to-night the stars were especially brilliant and we spent some hours in trying to make out their names vega our polar star for some time to come shone conspicuously bright and the southern cross could be seen to great advantage wednesday august sixteenth we had a fine fair breeze all day and at five p m there was a cry from the masthead of land ahead great excitement immediately prevailed on board and tom and captain brown rushed for about the twelfth time to the foretop to see if the report was true they were soon able to announce that cape frio was visible on the port bow about thirty-five miles distant after even a fortnight at sea an indescribable sensation is produced by this cry and by the subsequent sight of the land itself when we came up on deck this evening after dinner we all gazed on the lighthouse on the still distant shore as if we had never beheld such a thing in our lives before the colour and temperature of the water had perceptibly changed the former from a beautiful clear dark ultramarine to a muddy green innumerable small birds moths locusts and grasshoppers came on board and having given special orders that we were to be called early the next morning we went to bed in the fond hope that we should be able to enter rio harbour at daybreak 
Thursday, August 17th. L'homme propose, Dieu dispose. Steam was up at midnight, but by that time it was blowing half a gale of wind from the southwest, with such a steep short sea that the screw was scarcely ever properly immersed, but went racing round and round in the air with tremendous velocity as we pitched and rolled about. Our progress was therefore at the rate of something rather under a mile an hour, and at daybreak, instead of entering the harbor of Rio, as we had hoped to do, we found ourselves close to Cape Frio. About 8 a.m. matters mended, the wind moderating and changing its direction slightly, so that, under steam and sail, we were soon going along the coast at the rate of four or five miles an hour. The surf was breaking with a loud roar upon the white sandy beach, while the spray was carried by the force of the wind far inland, over the strip of flat, fertile-looking country, lying between the sea and a chain of low, sugar-loaf-shaped mountains, parallel with the shore, and only a short distance off. Our course lay between the mainland and the islands of Maya and Pio, where the groves of bananas and other trees looked very miserable in the wind. The tall, isolated palm trees, whose elastic stems bowed readily before the fury of the blast, looked, as they were twisted and whirled hither and thither, like umbrellas turned inside out. Passing the false Sugarloaf Mountain, as it is called, we next opened out the true one, the Gavia, and the chain of mountains beyond, the outlines of which bear an extraordinary resemblance to the figure of a man lying on his back, the profile of the face being very like that of the late Duke of Wellington. As the sun sank in gorgeous splendor behind these hills, I think I never saw a grander or more beautiful sight, though the sky was so red and stormy-looking that our hopes of a fine day tomorrow were but faint. Before entering the harbor, a bar had to be crossed, which is a dangerous operation all the world over. The skylights and hatches were fastened down, and those of our party who did not like being shut up below took their places on the bridge, where, for the first time since we left England, it felt really quite cold. As we advanced, the beautiful harbor with its long rows of glittering gas lights extending for miles on either side of the bay and illuminating the city and suburbs gradually became visible. On our left lay the two islands, Rodanda and Raza, on the latter of which is situated a lighthouse. The wind was blowing off the land when we reached the bar, so that, after all our preparations, there was hardly any sea to encounter, and the moment we were over, the water on the other side was perfectly smooth. A gun and a blue light from Fort Santa Cruz answered immediately by a similar signal from Fort Santa Lucia announced our arrival, and we shortly afterwards dropped our anchor in the quarantine ground of Rio, close to Botafogo Bay, in the noble harbor of Nictheroy. After dinner it rained heavily, and continued to do so during the whole night. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Rio de Janeiro. The sun is warm, the sky is clear, the waves are dancing fast and bright. Blue owls and snowy mountains wear the purple noon's transparent light. Friday, August 18th. The clouds still hung heavy on the hills, or rather mountains, which surround the bay, occasionally descending in the form of torrents of rain and hiding everything from our view. Early in the morning we weighed anchor and steamed up the bay to the man-of-war anchorage, a much pleasanter situation than the quarantine harbor, where we had brought up last night. About 9.30 a.m. the health officers came on board, and half an hour later we had a visit from the custom house official, who required Tom to sign and seal a declaration upon oath that he had no cargo on board and not more coal than we absolutely required for our own consumption. About eleven o'clock we put on our Macintoshes and thick boots, and, accompanied by an interpreter, who, together with several washerwomen, had suddenly made his appearance on board, rowed ashore, pushing our way through crowds of boats laden with fruit and vegetables. The landing place was close to the market, at some broken-down steps, and was crowded with chattering negroes of every shade of color. The quays seemed covered with piles of fruit and vegetables discharged from the boats, the principal produce being sugar cane, bananas, and oranges. 
Each side street that we came to was a little river, which had to be crossed, or rather forded, after paddling through the mud in the main thoroughfare. Our first visit was to the post office, no letters, then to the British consulate, no letters, and finally to the legation, but there was nobody at home there, so we set off for the Hôtel des Étrangers to breakfast. Our way lay through the straggling suburbs of the city for about two miles, and as we drove along we could see and admire, despite the heavy rain, the magnificent groves of palm trees, and the brilliancy and beauty of the tropical vegetation in the various private and public gardens that we passed. After breakfast we returned to the legation, where we were most kindly received, but, much to our regret, no letters were forthcoming. We next paid a visit to some of the shops in the Rua de Ovidor for the sale of imitations of flowers, made from the undyed feathers of birds, and a large number of the more expensive varieties of ordinary artificial flowers, each petal consisting of the entire throat or breast of a hummingbird, and the leaves are made from the wings of beetles. They are very rare and beautiful, their manufacture being quite a speciality of this city. The prices asked astonished us greatly. The cost of five sprays, which I had been commissioned to buy, was twenty-nine pounds, and the price of all the others was proportionately high. But then they wear forever. I have had some for nine years, and they are as good now as when they were bought. Saturday, August 19th. Though far from brilliant, the weather improved, and we were able to enjoy occasional glimpses of the beautiful scenery around us. Mr. Goh and Mr. O'Connor breakfasted with us on board, and we afterwards proceeded in a bond to the botanical gardens, about seven miles out of the city. These bonds, which are a great institution here, are large carriages, either open or closed, drawn sometimes by one, sometimes by two, sometimes by three mules. They go at a great pace and run very smoothly. Ordinary carriages are dear, and as tramways have been laid down in almost every street and road, driving is a rather difficult affair. On our road we passed several delightful-looking private gardens. The railings were completely covered, some with white stephanotis and scarlet lapigeria, others with a beautiful orange-colored creeper and lilac bougainvillea, or passion flowers of many colors and variety. Inside we could see large trees with green and yellow stripes, Croton oil plants, spotted and veined caladiums, and dracanes, the whole being shaded by orange trees. Along the edge of Botafogo Bay there is a delightful drive beneath a splendid avenue of imperial palms, extending to the gates of the botanical gardens. Each specimen rises straight up like the column of an Egyptian temple, and is crowned with a feathery tuft of large, shiny, dark green leaves, some thirty feet in length. The clumps of bamboos, too, were very fine, and nearly all the trees seemed to be full of curious orchids and parasites of every sort and kind. We had an agreeable drive back in the cool evening to dinner at the Hôtel de l'Europe. The food was excellent and included some delicious, tiny, queer-shaped oysters, which are found on the mangrove trees overhanging the water higher up the bay. We afterward went to a pleasant little reception, where we enjoyed the splendid singing of some young Brazilian ladies, and the subsequent row off to the yacht in the moonlight was not the least delightful part of the program. Sunday, August 20th. At last a really fine day. We could now, for the first time, thoroughly appreciate the beauties of the noble bay of Nictheroy, though the distant Oregon mountains were still hidden from our view. In the morning we went to church on board HMS Volage, afterwards rowing across the bay to Ikarki, where we took the tramway to Santa Rosa. On our way, we again passed many charming villas and gardens, similar to those we had admired yesterday, while the glorious and ever-attractive tropical vegetation abounded everywhere. In spite of the great heat, the children seemed untiring in the pursuit of butterflies, of which they succeeded in catching many beautiful specimens. Monday, August 21st. After an early breakfast, we started off to have a look at the market. The greatest bustle and animation prevailed, and there were people and things to see and observe in endless variety. The fish market was full of finny monsters of the deep, all new and strange to us, whose odd Brazilian names would convey to a stranger but little idea of the fish themselves. There was an enormous rockfish, weighing about 300 pounds, with hideous face and shiny back and fins. There were large ray and skate and cuttlefish, 
the puve of victor hugo's traveller de la mer besides baskets full of the large prawns for which the coast is famous eight or ten inches long and with antennae of twelve or fourteen inches in length they make up in size for want of quality for they are insipid and tasteless though being tender they make excellent curry the oysters on the other hand are particularly small but of the most delicious flavor they are brought from a park higher up the bay where as i have said they grow on posts and the branches of the mangrove tree which hang down into the water we also saw a large quantity of fine mackerel a good many turtle and porpoises and a few hammer-headed sharks the latter are very curious creatures not unlike an ordinary shark but with a remarkable hammer-shaped projection on either side of their noses for which it is difficult to imagine a use in the fruit market were many familiar bright-coloured fruits for it is now the depth of winter at rio and the various kinds that we saw were all such as would bear transport to england fat jet-black negresses wearing turbans on their heads strings of coloured beads on their necks and arms and single long white garments which appeared to be continually slipping off their shoulders here presided over brilliant-looking heaps of oranges bananas pineapples passion fruit tomatoes apples pears capsicums and peppers sugar-cane cabbage palms cherimoyas and breadfruit in another part of the market all sorts of live birds were for sale with a few live beasts such as deer monkeys pigs guinea pigs in profusion rats cats dogs marmosets and a dear little lion monkey very small and rather red with a beautiful head and mane who roared exactly like a real lion in miniature we saw also cages full of small flamingos snipe of various kinds and a great many birds of smaller size with feathers of all shades of blue red and green and metallic hues of brilliant luster besides parrots macaws cockatoos innumerable and torchas on stands the torcha is a bright coloured black and yellow bird about as big as a starling which puts its little head on one side and takes flies from one's fingers in the prettiest and most enticing manner unfortunately it is impossible to introduce it into england as it cannot stand the change of climate the other birds included guinea fowls ducks cocks and hens pigeons doves quails etc and many other varieties less familiar or quite unknown to us altogether the visit was an extremely interesting one and well repaid us for our early rising at eleven o'clock we started for the petropolis steamer which took us alongside a wooden pier from the end of which the train started and we were soon wending our way through sugar and coffee plantations formed in the midst of the forest of palms and other tropical trees an englishman has made a large clearing here and has established a fine farm which he hopes to work successfully by means of immigrant labor after a journey of twenty minutes in the train we reached the station at the foot of a hill where we found several four mule carriages awaiting our arrival the drive up from the station to the town over a pass in the oregon mountains was superb at each turn of the road we had an ever-varying view of the city of rio and its magnificent bay and then the banks of this tropical high road from out a mass of rich verdure grew lovely scarlet begonias and spotted caladiums shaded by graceful tree ferns and overhung by trees full of exquisite parasites and orchids among these the most conspicuous after the palms are the tall thin-stemmed sloth trees so called from their being a favorite resort of the sloth who with great difficulty crawls up into one of them remains there until he has demolished every leaf and then passes on to the next tree the pace of the mules up the steep incline under a broiling sun was really wonderful Halfway up we stopped to change, at a buvette, where we procured some excellent Brasilia coffee, a fine but exceedingly bitter flavor. Our next halt, midway between the buvette and the top of the hill, was at a spring of clear sparkling water, where we had an opportunity of collecting some ferns and flowers, and on reaching the summit we stopped once more, to enjoy the fine view over the pass in the Bay of Nictheroy. The descent towards Petropolis then commenced, it lies in the hollow of the hills with a river flowing through the center of its broad streets on either side of which are villas and avenues of noble trees altogether it reminded me of beignet de luchon in the pyrenees though the general effect is unfortunately marred by the gay and rather too fantastic painting of some of the houses tuesday august twenty second 
We were called at half-past five, and, after a hasty breakfast, started on horseback by seven o'clock for the Virgin Forest, about six miles from Petropolis. After leaving the town and its suburbs, we pursued our way by rough, winding paths, across which huge moths and butterflies flitted, and hummingbirds buzzed in the almond trees. After a ride of an hour and a half, we entered the silence and gloom of a vast forest. On every side extended a tangled mass of wild, luxuriant vegetation. Giant palms and tree ferns and parasites are to be seen in all directions, growing wherever they can find root hold. Sometimes they kill the tree which they favor with their attentions, one creeper in particular being called matapau, or kill tree, but, as a rule, they seem to get on very well together, and to depend mutually upon one another for nourishment and support. The most striking of these creepers is perhaps the liani, whose tendrils grow straight downwards to the ground, twisting themselves together in knots and bundles. Occasionally one sees, suspended from a tree, at a height of some fifty feet, a large lump of moss, from which scarlet orchids are growing, looking like an enormous hanging flower basket. All colors in Brazil, whether of birds, insects, or flowers, are brilliant in the extreme. Blue, violet, orange, scarlet, and yellow are found in the richest profusion, and no pale or faint tints are to be seen. Even white seems purer, clearer, and deeper than the white of other countries. We had a long wet walk in the forest, the mosses and ferns being kept moist and green by the innumerable little streams of water which abound everywhere. Owing to the thickness of the surrounding jungle, it was impossible to stray from our very narrow path, notwithstanding the attractions of hummingbirds, butterflies, and flowers. At last we came to an opening in the wood, whence we had a splendid view seawards, and where it was decided to turn round and retrace our steps through the forest. After walking some distance, we found our horses waiting, and after a hot but pleasant ride, reached Petropolis by twelve o'clock, in time for breakfast. Letter riding and butterfly catching occupied the afternoon until four o'clock, when I was taken out for a drive in a comfortable little phaeton, with a pretty pair of horses, while the rest of the party walked out to see a little more of Petropolis and its environs. We drove past the Emperor's Palace, an Italian villa standing in the middle of a large garden, the new church, and the houses of the principal inhabitants, most of which are shut up just now as everybody is out of town, but it all looked very green and pleasant. It was interesting to see a curious breed of dogs descended from the bloodhounds formerly used in hunting the poor Indians. Wednesday, August 23rd. At six o'clock we assembled all on the balcony of the hotel to wait for the coach which arrived shortly afterwards. There was some little delay and squabbling before we all found ourselves safely established on the coach, but starting was quite another matter, for the four white mules resolutely refused to move, without a vast amount of screaming and shouting and plunging. We had to pull up once or twice before we got clear of the town to allow more passengers to be somehow or other squeezed in, and at each fresh start similar objections on the part of the mules had to be overcome. The air felt fresh when we started, but before we had proceeded far, we came into a thick, cold, wet fog, which, after the heat of the last few weeks, seemed to pierce us to the very marrow. Eight miles farther on, the four frisky white mules were exchanged for five steady, dun-colored ones, which were in their turn replaced, after a seven-mile stage, by four nice bays, who took us along at a tremendous pace. The sun began by this time to penetrate the mist, and the surrounding country became visible. We found that we were following the course of the river, passing through an avenue of coral trees, loaded with the most brilliant flowers and fruit imaginable, and full of parakeets and fluttering birds of many hues. We stopped at several small villages, and at about 11 a.m. reached Entre Rios, having changed mules seven times and done the fifty-nine and a half miles in four hours and fifty minutes, including stoppages. Pretty good work, especially as the heat during the latter portion of the journey had been as great as the cold was at the commencement. The term cold must here be taken only in a relative sense, for the thermometer was never lower than 48 degrees, though having been accustomed for a long while to 85 degrees, we felt the change severely. After a capital breakfast at the inn near the station, we got into the train and began a very hot, dusty journey over the Serra to Palmieras, which place was reached at 4 p.m. 
we were met on our arrival by dr gunning who kindly made room for tom and me at his house the rest of our party proceeding to the hotel the view from the windows of the house which is situated on the very edge of a hill over the mountains of the serra glowing with the light of the setting sun was perfectly enchanting and after a refreshing cold bath one was able to appreciate it as it deserved a short stroll into the forest adjoining the house proved rich in treasures for in a few minutes i had gathered twenty-six varieties of ferns including gold and silver ferns two creeping ferns and many other kinds the moon rose and the fireflies flashed about among the palm trees as we sat in the veranda before dinner while in several places on the distant hills we could see circles of bright flames where the forest had been set on fire in order to make clearings we were up next morning in time to see the sun rise from behind the mountains and as it gradually became warmer the hummingbirds and butterflies came out and buzzed and flitted among the flowers in front of our windows we had planned to devote the day to a visit to bara and it was therefore necessary to hurry to the station by eight o'clock to meet the train where we stopped twenty minutes to breakfast at what appeared to be a capital hotel built above the station the rooms were large and lofty everything was scrupulously clean and the dishes most appetizing looking our carriage was then shunted and hooked on to the other train and we proceeded to the station of santa anna where mr farrow met us with eight mules and horses and a large old-fashioned carriage which held some of us the rest of the party galloping on in front we galloped also and upset one unfortunate horse luckily without doing him any harm after a couple of miles of a rough road we arrived at the gates of the baron's grounds where the old negro slave coachman amused us very much by ordering his young master to conduct the equestrians round to the house by another way beneath the avenue of palm trees leading from the gates to the house grew orange lemon and citron trees trained as espaliers while behind them again tall rose bushes and pomegranates showed their bright faces driving through an archway we arrived at the house and with much politeness and many bows were conducted indoors in order that we might rest ourselves and get rid of some of the dust of our journey santa anna is one of the largest coffee fazendas in this part of brazil the house occupies three sides of a square in the middle of which heaps of coffee were spread out to dry in the sun the centre building is the dwelling house with a narrow strip of garden full of sweet smelling flowers in front of it the right wing is occupied by the slaves shops and warehouses and by the chapel while the left wing contains the stables domestic offices and other slave rooms by law masters are bound to give their slaves one day's rest in every seven and any work the slaves may choose to do on that day is paid for at the same rate as free labor but the day selected for this purpose is not necessarily sunday and on adjoining fazendas different days are invariably chosen in order to prevent the slaves from meeting and getting into mischief thursday to-day was sunday on this estate and we soon saw all the slaves mustering in holiday attire in the shade of one of the verandas they were first inspected and then ranged in order the children being placed in front the young women next then the old women the old men and finally the young men in this order they marched into the corridor facing the chapel to hear mass the priest and his acolyte in gorgeous robes performed the usual service and the slaves chanted the responses in alternate companies so that sopranos contraltos tenors and basses contrasted in a striking and effective manner the singing indeed was excellent far better than in many churches at home after the conclusion of the mass the master shook hands with everybody exchanged good wishes with his slaves and dismissed them while they were dawdling about gossiping in the veranda i had a closer look at the babies which had all been brought to church they seemed of every shade of colour the complexions of some being quite fair but the youngest a dear little woolly-headed thing was black as jet and only three weeks old the children all seemed to be on very good terms with their master and his overseers and not a bit afraid of them they are fed most liberally and looked fat and healthy for breakfast they have coffee and bread for dinner fresh pork alternately with dried beef and black beans the staple food of the poor of this country and for supper they have coffee bread and mandioca or tapioca returning to the house we sat down a party of thirty to an elaborate breakfast the table being covered with all sorts of brazilian delicacies after which several complimentary speeches were made and we all started off to walk round the fazenda 
Our first visit was to the little school children, 34 in number, who sang very nicely. Then to the hospital, a clean, airy building in which there were happily but few patients. And next we inspected the new machinery, worked by water power, for cleaning the coffee and preparing it for market. The harvest lasts from May to August. The best quality of coffee is picked before it is quite ripe, crushed to free it from the husk, and then dried in the sun, sometimes in heaps and sometimes raked out flat, in order to gain the full benefit of the heat. It is afterwards gathered up into baskets and carefully picked over, and this, being very light work, is generally performed by young married women with babies. There were nineteen tiny piccaninnies in baskets beside their mothers in one room we entered, and in another there were twenty just able to run about. Cassava is an important article of food here, and it was interesting to watch the various processes by which it is turned into flour, tapioca, or starch. As it is largely exported, there seems no reason why it should not be introduced into India, for the ease with which it is cultivated and propagated, the extremes of temperature it will bear, and the abundance of its crop all tend to recommend it. We went on to look at the maize being shelled, crushed, and ground into coarse or fine flour for cakes and bread, and the process of crushing the sugar cane, turning its juice into sugar and rum, and its refuse into potash. All the food manufactured here is used on the estate. Coffee alone is exported. I felt thoroughly exhausted by the time we returned to the house, only to exchange adieus and step into the carriage on our way to Barra by rail, en route to Rio de Janeiro. After passing through several long tunnels at the top of the Serra, the line drops down to Palmieras, after which the descent became very picturesque, as we passed by steep inclines through virgin forests full of creepers, ferns, flowers, and orchids. The sunset was magnificent, and the subsequent coolness of the atmosphere most grateful. Leaving the Emperor's Palace of São Cristóvão behind, Rio was entered from a fresh side. It seemed a long drive through the streets to the Hôtel d'Europe, where, after an excellent though hurried dinner, we contrived to be in time for a private representation at the Alcazar. As a rule, ladies do not go to this theatre, but there were a good many there on the present occasion. Neither the play nor the actors, however, were very interesting, and all our party were excessively tired, so we left early and had a delightful row off to the yacht in the bright moonlight. Monday, August 28th. We have all been so much interested in the advertisements we read in the daily papers of slaves to be sold or hired that arrangements were made with a Brazilian gentleman for some of our party to have an opportunity of seeing the way in which these transactions are carried on. No Englishman is allowed to hold slaves here, and it is part of the business of the legation to see that this law is strictly enforced. The secrets of their trade are accordingly jealously guarded by the natives, especially from the English. The gentlemen had therefore to disguise themselves as much as possible, one pretending to be a rich Yankee who had purchased large estates between Santos and San Paolo, which he had determined to work with slave instead of coolie labor. He was supposed to have come to Rio to select some slaves, but would be obliged to see and consult his partner before deciding on purchase. They were taken to a small shop in the city, and after some delay were conducted to a room upstairs where they waited a quarter of an hour. Twenty-two men and eleven women and children were then brought in for inspection. They declared themselves suitable for a variety of occupations, indoor and out, and all appeared to look anxiously at their possible purchaser, with a view to ascertain what they had to hope for in the future. One couple in particular, a brother and sister, about fourteen and fifteen years old respectively, were most anxious not to be separated, but to be sold together, and the tiny children seemed quite frightened at being spoken to or touched by the white men. Eight men and five women, having been specially selected as fit subjects for further consideration, the visit terminated. The daily Brazilian papers are full of advertisements of slaves for sale and descriptions of men, pigs, children, cows, pianos, women, houses, etc., to be disposed of, are inserted in the most indiscriminate manner. In one short half-column of the Journal do Comercio, published within the last day or two, the following announcements, amongst many similar ones, appear side by side. Reader's Note the following advertisements are given in Portuguese and English by Mrs. Brassey. For sale, a female slave, 22 years of age, a good figure, washes, irons, and sews well, 
For particulars, apply at number 97, Rua de San Pedro. For sale or to be let on hire. A splendid tricord pianoforte by Arad for $280, guaranteed. Apply at Rua da Quintanda, number 42, second floor. To be sold for $1,500. A male slave, 20 years of age, fit for a baker's establishment. Apply at Rua da Princesa dos Cajueros, number 97. For sale, on very reasonable terms, a singer's sewing machine, adapted for any description of work, works splendidly. Apply at number 95, Rua do Sabao. For sale, a good black woman, good figure, good disposition, with three children, who are a little black girl six years of age, a black boy of five, and a child three years of age. She is a good cook, washes and irons well. At the same house there is likewise for sale a little black girl twelve years of age. Her character will be guaranteed. She is well adapted for the service of a family, as she has had a good beginning, having come from Santa Catharina. Apply at number 90, Rua de Uruguayana, first floor. For sale, La Cerda's Portuguese Dictionary, in two large volumes, quite new, arrived by the last mail, price $30, costs here $40. Number 15, Rua da Hospicio, second floor. For sale, a middle-aged black woman, who is a first-rate cook, washes and irons splendidly. For particulars apply at number 12, Rua do Viscande de Itana, number 12. For sale, harnesses for small carts, for delivery of bread. Apply at number 86, Rua de General Camara. For sale, 20 young blacks from 14 to 20 years of age, just arrived from Maranham by the last steamer, number 72, Rua de Prana. We had many visitors to breakfast today, and it was nearly two o'clock before we could set off for shore en route to Tijuca. We drove nearly as far as the botanical gardens where it had been arranged that horses should meet us, but our party was such a large one, including children and servants, that some little difficulty occurred at this point in making a fair start. It was therefore late before we started, the clouds were beginning to creep down the sides of the hills, and it had grown very dusk by the time we reached the Chinisi River. Soon afterwards, the rain began to come down in such tropical torrents that our thin summer clothing was soaked through and through long before we reached the Tijuca. At last, to our great joy, we saw ahead of us large plantations of bananas and then some gas lights, which exist even in this remote locality. We followed them for some little distance, but my horse appeared to have such a very decided opinion as to the proper direction for us to take that we finally decided to let him have his own way, for it was by this time pitch dark, and none of us had ever been this road before. As we hoped, the horse knew his own stables, and we soon arrived at the door of White's Hotel, miserable drenched objects, looking forward to a complete change of clothing. Unfortunately, the cart with our luggage had not arrived, so it was in clothes borrowed from kind friends that we at last set down, a party of about forty, to a sort of table d'hote dinner, and it continued to pour with rain during the whole evening, only clearing up just at bedtime. Tuesday, August 29th. After all the fine weather we have had lately, it was provoking to find on getting up this morning that the rain still came steadily down. Daylight enabled us to see what a quaint-looking place this hotel is. It consists of a series of low, wooden, detached buildings, mostly one story high, with verandas on both sides, built round a long courtyard, in the center of which are a garden and some large trees. It is more like a boarding house, however, than an hotel, as there is a fixed daily charge for visitors who have to be provided with a letter of introduction. The situation and gardens are good. It contains, among other luxuries, a drawing room, with a delightful swimming bath for ladies, and another for gentlemen. A mountain stream is turned into two large square reservoirs, where you can disport yourself under the shade of bananas and palm trees, while orange trees, daturas, poinsettias, and other plants in full bloom drop their fragrant flowers into the crystal water. There is also a nice little bathing house with a douche outside, and the general arrangements seem really perfect. The views from the walks around the hotel and in the forest above are beautiful, as indeed they are from every eminence in the neighborhood of Rio. 
During the morning the weather cleared sufficiently for us to go down to the boulders, huge masses of rock, either of the glacial period or else thrown out from some mighty volcano into the valley beneath. Here they form great caverns and caves, overhung with creepers, and so blocked up at the entrance that it is difficult to find a way into them. The effect of the alternate darkness and light, amid twisted creepers, some like gigantic snakes, others neatly coiled in true man-of-war fashion, is very striking and fantastic. Every crevice is full of ferns and orchids and curious plants, while moths and butterflies flit about in every direction. Imagine, if you can, scarlet butterflies, gaily spotted, yellow butterflies with orange edgings, butterflies with dark blue, velvety-looking upper wings, the undersurface studded with bright owl-like peacock eyes, gray atlas moths, and crowning beauty of all, metallic blue butterflies which are positively dazzling, even when seen in a shop dead. Imagine what they must be like as they dart hither and thither, reflecting the bright sunshine from their wings or enveloped in the somber shade of a forest. Most of them measure from two to ten inches in length from wing to wing, and many others flit about, equally remarkable for their beauty, though not so large. Swallowtails of various colors, with tails almost as long in proportion to their bodies as those of their feathered namesakes, godparents, and eighty-eights, with the figures eighty-eight plainly marked on the reverse side of their rich blue or crimson wings. In fact, if nature could by any possibility be gaudy, one might almost say that she is so in this part of the world. From the boulders we went down a kind of natural staircase in the rock to the small cascade which, owing to the recent rains, appeared to the best advantage, the black rocks and thick vegetation forming a fine background to the sheet of flowing white water and foam. Our way lay first through some castor oil plantations, and then along the side of a stream, fringed with rare ferns, scarlet begonias, and grey ageratum. We returned to the hotel, too late for the general luncheon, and after a short rest went out for a gallop in the direction of the peak of Tijuca, past the large waterfall, the Ladies' Mile, and Grey's View. The forest is government property, the roads are therefore excellent, and are in many places planted with flowers and shrubs, rare even here. It seems a waste of money, however, for there is hardly any one to make use of the wide roads, and the forest would appear quite as beautiful in its pristine luxuriance. To our eyes, the addition of flowers from other countries is no improvement, though the feeling is otherwise here. More than once I have had a bouquet of common stocks given to me as a grand present, while orchids, gardenias, stephanotis, large purple, pink, and white azaleas, orange blossom, and roses were growing around in unheeded profusion. Wednesday, August 30th. Once more a wet morning, but as it cleared towards noon, we ordered horses and some luncheon, and went up to Pedro Bonito. The ride was pleasant enough at first, but as we mounted higher and higher, we got into the clouds and lost the view. Finally, there seemed nothing for it but to halt near the top under a grove of orange trees, lunch in the pouring rain, and return without having reached the summit. Friday, September 1st. At three o'clock this morning, when I awoke, I saw at last a bright, clear sky, and at five, finding that there was every prospect of a beautiful sunrise, we sent for horses, ate our early breakfast, and set off for the peak of Tijuca. Step by step we climbed, first through the grounds of the hotel, then through the forest, till we reached the bamboos, a favorite halting place, by the side of a stream, near which grow in waving tufts the graceful trees which lend their name to the spot. It was very beautiful in the hillside forest, with a new prospect opening out at every step, and set in an ever-varying natural framework of foliage and flowers. There was not sufficient time to linger, however, as we would fain have done, in the cool and shady paths occasionally illumined by the bright rays of the sun, shining through the foliage of noble palms, the fronds of tree ferns, and the spiral stems of many colored creepers. Before reaching the top of the peak, there are twenty-nine wooden and ninety-six stone steps to be ascended, at the foot of which we tied our horses. An iron chain is hung by the side to assist you, without which it would be rather giddy work, for the steps are steep, and there is a sheer precipice on one side of them. Arrived at the top, the scene was glorious. On every side, mountains beyond mountains stretch far away into the distance, and one can see as far north as Cape Frio, and southwards as far as Rio Grande de Sul, 
while beneath lies the bay of rio with its innumerable islands islets and indentations all too soon we had to scramble down again and mount our horses for a hurried return to the hotel there being barely time for lunch and a scramble to the yacht monday september fourth we were all up very early this morning superintending the preparations for our eldest boy's departure for england the yacht had been gaily dressed with flags in honor of the anniversary of the emperor's wedding day but it must be confessed that our own feelings were hardly in accordance with these external symbols of joy breakfast was a melancholy meal and i fear that the visitors from the village were not very well entertained after breakfast we went ashore to the market to get a couple of lion monkeys which had been kept for us and which tab was to take home with him to present to the zoological gardens at one o'clock the steam launch from the village came alongside and embarked the luggage and servants half an hour later it returned for us then came many tearful farewells to the crew and we set off we knew the parting had to be made but this did not lessen our grief for although it is at all times hard to say good-bye for a long period to those nearest and dearest to you it is especially so in a foreign land with the prospect of a long voyage on both sides moreover it is extremely uncertain when we shall hear of our boy's safe arrival not i fear until we get to valparaiso and then only by telegram a long time to look forward to over the next half hour i had better draw a veil at two o'clock precisely just after we had left the steamer the starting bell rang and the catapaxi steamed away as she passed the yacht all our flags were dipped and the guns fired then we could see her rolling on the bar for calm as the water was in the bay there was a heavy swell outside and then all too soon we lost sight of her as she sank with all we love below the verge we heard to-day that the saturday before our first arrival at rio the bar was quite impassable even for a man of war and that although she succeeded the next day the sea was extremely rough on our return to the sunbeam i went to bed to rest and the remainder of the party went ashore a great many visitors came on board in the course of the afternoon some remained to dine with us at half past nine we all went on shore again to a ball at the casino the grand public room in rio to which we had been invited some days ago it seemed a splendid place beautifully decorated in white and gold and crimson with frescoes and pictures let into the walls and surrounded by galleries it is capable of containing fifteen hundred persons and i believe that there were even more than that number present on the occasion of the ball given to the duke of edinburgh some years ago the arrangement of the large cloak-rooms refreshment rooms and passages downstairs and the balconies and supper-rooms upstairs is very convenient the ball this evening being comparatively a small affair the lower rooms only were used and proved amply sufficient there were not a great many ladies present but amongst those we saw some were extremely pretty and all were exquisitely dressed in the latest fashions from paris the toilettes of the younger ones looked fresh and simple while those of the married ladies displayed considerable richness and taste for although brazilian ladies do not go out much and as a rule remain in peignoir until late in the afternoon they never fail to exhibit great judgment in the selection of their costumes the floor was excellent but the band made rather too much noise and the dancing was different both in style and arrangement from what we are accustomed to at home the time had now come when we had to say farewell to the many kind friends whom we have met here and who have made life so pleasant to us during the last three weeks in order that we might return to the yacht to complete our preparation for an early start the last leave-takings were soon over and with mutually expressed hopes that we might ere long meet some of our friends in england tom and i drove off in the bright moonlight to the quay where our boat was waiting for us the other members of our party found the attractions of the ball so irresistible that they were unable to tear themselves away until a much later hour. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico The River Plate blue glossy green and velvet black they coiled and swam and every track was a flash of golden fire tuesday september fifth we got under way at six a m and soon bade adieu to rio where we have spent so many happy days 
and to our friends on board HMS Village and Ready, with whom we interchanged salutes in passing. It was a dull, wet morning, and we could not see much of the beauties we were leaving behind us. The peak of Tijolka and the summit of the Corcovado were scarcely visible, and the sugar loaf and gavia looked cold and grey in the early mist. It was not long before we were rolling on the bar, and then tumbling about in very uncomfortable fashion in the rough sea outside. One by one we all disappeared below, where most of us remained during the greater part of the day. As for me, I went to bed for good at six o'clock in the evening, but was called up again at ten to see some large bonitos playing about the bows of the yacht. It was really worth the trouble of getting up and climbing quite into the bows of the vessel to watch them, as they gambled and frisked about, brightly illumined by the phosphorescence of the water, now swimming together steadily in pairs or fours, now starting in sudden pursuit of one of their number, who would make an independent rush forward in advance of his companions. Saturday, September 9th. The last three days have been showery, with squalls which have freshened to a gale, and we are now scudding along under all storm canvas, followed by crowds of cape pigeons and cape hens, and a few albatrosses. Towards this evening, however, the wind fell light, and we got up steam in order to be prepared for any emergency, as a calm is frequently succeeded on this coast by a pampero, and we are now approaching a lee shore. Sunday, September 10th. Tom has been on deck nearly all night. The shore is very low and difficult to distinguish, and the lights are badly kept. If the lighthouse keeper happens to have plenty of oil and is not out shooting or fishing, he lights his lamp. Otherwise, he omits to perform this rather important part of his duties. The lighthouses can therefore hardly be said to be of much use. About 5 a.m., Kindred rushed down into our cabin and woke Tom, calling out, Land to the leeward, sir, and then rushed up on deck again. The first glimmer of dawn had enabled him to see that we were running straight on to the low sandy shore about three miles off, a very strong current having set us ten miles out of our course. The yacht's head was accordingly at once put round, and steaming seaward we soon left all danger behind. The sun rose brilliantly, and the weather during the day was very fine. Morning service was impossible, owing to the necessity for a constant observation of the land, but after making the lighthouse on Santa Maria, we had prayers at 4.30 p.m. with the hymn for those at sea. In the night, we made the light on Flores, burning brightly, and before morning, those in the harbor of Monte Video. Monday, September 11th. After making the Flores light, we proceeded slowly and dropped our anchor in the outer roads of Monte Video at 4 a.m. At 7 o'clock we got it up again, and by 8 were anchored close to the shore. We found that our arrival was expected, and the health officer's boat was soon alongside. Next came an officer from the United States Man of War Frolic, with polite messages and offers of service, and then a steam launch belonging to the Pacific Company, and another from the consul, Major Monroe, with piles of letters and newspapers for us. Montevideo, as seen from the water, is not an imposing-looking place. On the opposite side of the entrance to the harbor rises a hill, called the Cerro, 450 feet high, from which the town derives its name, and further inland on the town side is another eminence, 200 feet high, called the Cerrito. With these exceptions, the surrounding country looks perfectly flat, without even a tree to break the monotony. Soon after breakfast we went ashore, in more senses of the word than one, for they have commenced to build a mole for the protection of small vessels, which, in its unfinished state, is not yet visible above the water. The consequence was that, at a distance of about half a mile from the landing steps, we rowed straight on to the submerged stonework, but fortunately got off again very quickly, without having sustained any damage. On landing we found ourselves opposite the Custom House, a fine building, with which we afterwards made a closer acquaintance. There is a large and very good hotel here, L'Hotel Oriental. It is a handsome building outside, and the interior is full of marble courts, stone corridors, and lofty rooms, deliciously cool in the hottest weather. Having procured a carriage, Tom and I and the children drove through the streets, which are wide and handsome, though badly paved, and so full of holes that it is a wonder how the springs of a carriage can last a week. The houses seem built chiefly in the Italian style of architecture, with fine stucco fronts, and in many cases marble floors and facings, 
while the courtyards seen through the grills blazed with flowers all the lower windows were strongly barred a precaution by no means unnecessary against the effects of the revolutions which are of such frequent occurrence in this country to enable the inhabitants the better to enjoy the sea breeze the tops of the houses are all flat which gives the town from a distance somewhat of an eastern appearance there are a great many italian immigrants here and most of the building and plastering work is done by them the paseo del molino is the best part of the town where all the rich merchants reside in quintas surrounded by pretty gardens they are very fantastic in their ideas of architectural style and appear to bestow their patronage impartially not to say indiscriminately upon gothic cathedrals alhambra palaces swiss cottages italian villas and turkish mosques except for this variety the suburb has somewhat the appearance of the outskirts of many of the towns on the riviera with the same subtropical surroundings these are however hard times on the river plate and more than half the quintas are deserted and falling into ruins on our way back by the union road we met a great many of the native bullock carts going home from market these huge conveyances are covered with hides and are drawn by teams of from two to twelve bullocks yoked in pairs and driven by a man on horseback who carries a sharp pointed goad with which he prods the animals all round at intervals dressed in a full white linen shirt and trousers with his bright poncho and curious saddle gear he forms no unimportant figure in the picturesque scene in the large market-place there are hundreds of these carts with their owners encamped around them when we at last arrived on board the yacht again at three o'clock we found that the miseries of coaling were not yet over and that there had been numerous visitors from the shore everything on deck looked black while below all was pitch dark and airless every opening and crevice having been closed and covered with tarpaulin to keep out the coal dust it took seven hours to complete the work instead of two as was hoped and promised so our chance of starting to-day is over this seemed the more disappointing because had we foreseen the delay we might have made other arrangements for seeing more on shore tuesday september twelfth the anchor was up and we were already beginning to steam away when i came on deck this morning just in time to see the first faint streaks of dawn appearing in the gray sky the river plate here is over a hundred miles wide and its banks are very flat so there was nothing to be seen except the two little hills of cerro and cerrito and the town of montevideo fast vanishing in the distance the channels are badly buoyed and there are shoals and wrecks on all sides the lightships are simply old hulks with no special marks by which to distinguish them and as they themselves look exactly like wrecks they are not of much assistance in the navigation which is very confusing and sometimes perilous once we very nearly ran aground but discovered just in time that the vessel we were steering for with confidence was only a wreck on a dangerous shoal and that the light ship itself was further ahead the yacht was immediately put about and we just skirted the bank in turning the weather improved during the day and a fine sunset was followed by a clear starlit night at ten thirty p m we dropped our anchor outside all the other vessels in the roads at buenos aires eight miles from the shore the light ship only carried an ordinary riding light like any other vessel so that it was almost impossible unless you knew the port very well to go in closer to the land at night wednesday september thirteenth daylight did not enable us to distinguish the town for the river here is wide and the banks are low and we were lying a long way from the shore outside a great many fine-looking ships at anchor in the roads about nine o'clock a german captain in a large whaleboat came alongside and told us we were nearly eight miles from buenos aires tom arranged with him to take us ashore and accordingly we soon started the water was smooth and there was a nice breeze and we sailed gallantly along for about two hours until we reached the town after anchoring we transhipped ourselves into a small boat in which we were rowed to some steps at the end of the long rickety mole where we landed some of the planks of the pier were missing leaving great holes big enough to fall through and others were so loose that when you stepped upon one end of them the other flew up almost into your face our first business was to secure the services of a pilot to take us up to rosario the best man on the river was sent for but when he came he did not recommend our undertaking the voyage as the water is very low at present and we might get stuck on a sandbank and be detained for some days although no further harm would be likely to occur to us 
We decided, therefore, as our time is precious, to give up the idea of making the expedition in the yacht, and to go in the ordinary river boat instead. Under the guidance of some gentlemen, we then went to the central railway station to send off some telegrams, and thence to the River Plate Bank. The treasury contained six hundred thousand pounds in British sovereigns locked up in three strong safes, besides paper money and securities to the amount of two million pounds. It was the Rosario branch of this bank which was recently robbed of fifteen thousand pounds by an armed government force, an unprecedented proceeding in the history of nations, and one that might have led to the interference of foreign powers. There was time afterwards to go round and see something of the city, which, like many other South American towns, is built in square blocks, all the streets running exactly at right angles to one another. There is a fine plaza, or grand square, in which are situated the cathedral, theatre, etc., the centre being occupied by a garden containing statues and fountains. The various banks, with their marble facings, Corinthian columns, and splendid halls, are magnificent buildings, and look more like palaces than places of business. Some of the private houses, too, seem very handsome. Outside, they are all faced with marble, to a certain height from the ground, the interior, consisting of courtyard within courtyard, being rather like that of a Pompeian house. We next went to the agricultural show, which, though not an imposing affair to our eyes, appeared really very creditable to those who had organized it. The horses and cattle looked small, but there were some good specimens of sheep, especially the Rombonellus and Negretus, whose long fine wool was, however, only to be discovered by first turning aside a thick plaster of mud beneath which it was concealed. We saw also some curious animals, natives of the country, such as vicunias, llamas, bizcachas, and various kinds of deer, a very mixed lot of poultry and dogs, and two magnificent Persian cats. Another department of the show was allotted to the commercial products of the country, animal, vegetable, and mineral, the whole forming a very interesting collection. In re-embarking, the disagreeable process of this morning had to be repeated, rickety pier, rotten steps, and small boat included, before we reached the whale-boat, after which we had an eight-mile sail out to the yacht. It was a cold, dull night, and getting on board proved rather difficult work, owing to the rough sea. Thursday, September 14th. The pilot came on board at seven o'clock to take us in nearer the shore, but, after all, we found ourselves obliged to anchor again five miles off. No ship drawing more than ten feet can get inside the sandbanks, which makes it a wretched place to lie in, especially as the weather at this time of year is very uncertain. You may go ashore from your ship on a fine clear morning, and before you return a gale may have sprung up accompanied by a frightful sea. Open boats are therefore quite unsafe, a state of things which has given rise to the existence of a class of fine boats, specially built for the service, which attend all the ships lying in the roads. They are half-decked, will sail in any weather, and can be easily managed by two men. About ten o'clock we went ashore again in the whaleboat, which Tom had engaged to wait on us during our stay, and made the best of our way to a warehouse to look at some ponchos, which are the speciality of this part of South America. Everybody wears one, from the beggar to the highest official. The best kind of ponchos are very expensive, being made from a particular part of the finest hair of the vacunia, hand-woven by women in the province of Catamarca. The genuine article is difficult to get, even here. In the shops, the price usually varies from £30 to £80, but we were shown some at a rather lower price, from £20 to £60 each. They are soft as silk, perfectly waterproof, and will wear, it is said, forever. We met a fine-looking man in one of beautiful quality yesterday. He told us that it originally cost £30 in Catamarca 20 years ago, and that he gave £20 for it second-hand 10 years ago and with the exception of a few slight tears, it is now as good as ever. Before we came here, we were strongly advised, in case we should happen to go on a rough expedition up country, not to be tempted to take with us any good ponchos, as the gauchos are half-bred Indians of the Pampas, who are great connoisseurs of these articles, and can distinguish their quality at a glance, would not hesitate to cut our throats in order to obtain possession of them. The material of which they are made is of the closest texture, and as the hair has never been dressed or dyed, it retains all its natural oil and original color, the latter varying from a very pretty yellow fawn to a pale cream color. The majority of the ponchos worn here are, however, made at Manchester, 
of a cheap and inferior material. They look exactly like the real thing at first sight, but are neither so light nor so warm, nor do they wear at all well. Occasionally they are made of silk, but more often of bright-colored wool. In shape, a poncho is simply a square shawl with a hole in the middle for the head of the wearer. On horseback the appearance is particularly picturesque, and it forms also a convenient cloak, which comes well over the saddle, before and behind, and leaves the arms, though covered, perfectly free. The natives, as a rule, wear a second poncho, generally of a different color, tucked into the waistband of their long, full linen drawers, calzoncillos, so as to make a pair of short, baggy over-trousers. A poor man is content with a shirt, drawers, and two ponchos. A rich man has many rows of fringe and frills of lace at the bottom of his calzoncillos, and wears a short coat with silver buttons and a gorgeous silver belt covered with dollars. His horse fittings and massive stirrups, to say nothing of his enormous spurs, will be of solid silver, and his arms inlaid with the same metal. He will sometimes give as much as from ten pounds to twenty pounds for a pair of stirrups alone, and the rest of his dress and equipment is proportionately expensive. The cost of the silver articles is little more than the value of the metal itself, which is of very pure quality, and is only roughly worked by the Indians or gauchos. But as Manchester provides the ponchos, so does Birmingham the saddlery and fittings, especially those in use in the neighborhood of towns. After inspecting the ponchos, we breakfasted with some friends, and about noon started in the train for Campana. The line passes at first through the streets of Buenos Aires, and thence into the open country, beautifully green and undulating like the waves of the sea. Near the town and the suburb of Belgrano are a great many peach tree plantations, the fruit of which is used for fattening pigs, while the wood serves for roasting them. There is also some scrubby brushwood and a few large native trees, but these are soon left behind and are succeeded by far-spreading rich pasture land and occasional lagoons. We saw for the first time the holes of the biscachas, or prairie dogs, outside which the little prairie owls keep guard. There appeared to be always one, and generally two, of these birds, standing like sentinels at the entrance to each hole, with their wise-looking heads on one side, pictures of prudence and watchfulness. The bird and the beast are great friends, and are seldom to be found apart. We also passed several enormous flocks of sheep and herds of cattle, most of them quite unattended, though some were being driven by men on horseback. There were quantities of plovers and a great many partridges of two kinds, large and small, and the numerous lagoons were covered with and surrounded by waterfowl of all kinds, wild swans and ducks, snipe, white storks, gray herons, black cormorants, and scarlet flamingos, the last name standing at the edge of the water catching fish and occasionally diving below the surface. On the very top of some of the telegraph posts were the nests of the oven bird, looking like carved round blocks of wood placed there for ornament. These nests are made of mud and are perfectly spherical in form, the interior being divided into two quite distinct chambers. Campana was reached by four o'clock, the train running straight on to the pier, alongside of which the two vessels were lying with steam up. Passengers, baggage, and freight were immediately transferred from the train to the boats, and we soon found ourselves steaming along in the Uruguay, between the willow-hung banks of the broad Parana. The country, though otherwise flat and uninteresting, looks very pretty just now, in its new spring coat of bright green. We passed several small towns, amongst others San Pedro and San Nicolas, which are quite important-looking places, with a good deal of shipping, and occasionally stopped to pick up passengers, who had come in boats and steam launches from far distant villages, situated on lagoons, which our steamer could not enter. Just before arriving at each stopping place, we had a race with the Providor, and whenever she became visible at a bend in the river, half a ton more coal was immediately heaped on to our fires by the captain's order a piece of reckless extravagance, for, do what they would, they could not make us gain five minutes. The competition is, however, very fierce, and I suppose the two companies will not be satisfied until they have ruined one another, whereas, if each would run a steamer on alternate days, they and the public would be equally benefited. The fares are exceedingly reasonable, being less than three pounds for the whole journey from Buenos Aires to Rosario, including all charges. Friday, September 15th. 
A violent storm of thunder and lightning, apparently just above our heads, woke us at six o'clock this morning. Torrents of rain followed and continued to fall until we dropped our anchor at Rosario at 8.45 a.m., just as we were in the middle of breakfast in our cozy little stern cabin. Half an hour later we landed, though the rain still came down in sheets, but the steamer was now alongside the pier, and close carriages had been provided. A few minutes' drive through ill-paved streets brought us to the Hotel Universel, a handsome, spacious building with marble courtyards, full of trees, plants, and flowers, into which all the sitting-rooms open. Above our galleries, round which the various bedrooms are in like manner ranged, it all looked nice and cool and suitable for hot weather, but it was certainly rather droughty and cheerless on such a cold, pouring wet day, and all our efforts to make our large room, in which there were four immense windows, at all comfortable, were vain. Rosario, like Buenos Aires, is built in squares. The streets are generally well paved with black and white marble, but the roadways are composed of little round stones and are full of holes and inequalities, so that, in crossing the road after heavy rain, one steps from the trottoir into a very slough of despond. The universal tramway runs down the center of every street. After luncheon, we made a fresh start for Carcarana by a special train to which were attached two goods vans full of horses and a carriage truck containing a most comfortable American carriage, in shape not unlike a Victoria, only much lighter and with very high wheels. After a short journey through a rich, flat, grass country, we arrived at Roldan, the first colony of the Central Argentine Land Company. Here we all alighted, the horses were taken out of the vans, saddled, bridled, and harnessed, and the gentlemen rode and I drove round the colony, along what are generally roads, but today were sheets of water. We saw many colonists of every grade, from those still occupying the one-roomed wooden cottages, originally supplied by the Land Company, standing in the midst of ill-cultivated fields, to those who had built for themselves good houses in the town or nice cottages with pretty gardens surrounded by well-tilled lands. The drive ended at the mill belonging to a retired officer of the British Army who was settled here with his wife and two dear little children. Here we had tea and a pleasant chat and then returned to the train and proceeded to Carcarana, the next station on the line. Now, however, instead of the rich pasture lands and flourishing crops which we had hitherto seen on all sides, our road lay through a desolate-looking district, bearing two evident signs of the destructive power of the locust. People traveling with us tell us that, less than a week ago, the pasture here was as fresh and green as could be desired, and the various crops were a foot high, but that, in the short space of a few hours, the care and industry of the last ten months were rendered utterly vain and useless, and the poor colonists found their verdant fields converted into a barren waste by these rapacious insects. Carcarana may be called the Richmond, one might almost say the Brighton, of Rosario. It stands on a river, the Carcaranal, to the banks of which an omnibus runs twice a day from the railway station during the season to take people to bathe. Near the station is also an excellent little hotel, containing a large dining room and a few bedrooms, kept by two Frenchwomen, and here the Rosarians come out by train to dine and enjoy the fresh air. It was quite dark by the time we arrived, so that we could not see much of the flourishing little colony which has been formed here. We therefore paddled across the wet road to the inn, where, despite the somewhat rough surroundings, we enjoyed a capital dinner cooked in the true French style. They are specially celebrated here for their asparagus, but the locusts had devoured all but a very few stalks, besides which they were held responsible on the present occasion for the absence of other vegetables and salad. Yesterday there was a grand wedding party near here, the complete success of which was, we were told, somewhat marred by the fact that for six hours in the very middle of the day it became absolutely necessary to light candles, owing to the dense clouds of locusts about a league in extent by which the air was darkened. Trains are even stopped by these insects occasionally, for they appear to like a hard road, and when they get on the line, their bodies make the rails so greasy that the wheels of the engines will not bite. Moreover, they completely obscure the lights and signals, so that the men are afraid to proceed. The only remedy, therefore, is to go very slowly, preceded by a truckload of sand which is scattered freely over the rails in front of the engine. Horses will not always face a cloud of locusts, even to get to their stables, but turn round and stand doggedly still until it has passed. 
After dinner, we once more stepped into our special train, in which we arrived at Rosario at about half past nine o'clock, thoroughly tired out. End of chapter five. Chapter 6 of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Life on the Pampas There's tempest in yon horned moon, and lightning in yon cloud, but hark the music mariners, the wind is piping loud. Saturday, September 16th. Waking at half-past five, we busied ourselves until nine o'clock, when we again started in a special train for Carcarana. After a short stop at Roldan, it was reached two hours later, and breakfast was followed by a long ride through the land company's colony, and from thence to Candelaria, a purely Spanish settlement. I freely confess that I had hardly believed all the stories they told me last night about the terrible doings of the locusts, and thought they must have been slightly exaggerated. It all seemed too dreadful to be true, as if one of the plagues of Egypt had been revived by the wand of an evil magician. In this somewhat incredulous mood, I rashly said that, although I was very sorry to hear of the visit of these destructive creatures, as they were unfortunately here, I should like to see them. My wish was shortly to be gratified, for, in the course of our ride, we saw in the distant sky what looked very much like a heavy purple thundercloud, but which the experienced pronounced to be a swarm of locusts. It seemed impossible, but as we proceeded they met us, first singly, and then in gradually increasing numbers, until each step became positively painful, owing to the smart blows we received from them on our heads, faces, and hands. We stopped for a time at Mr. Holt's large estancia, where, notwithstanding the general appearance of prosperity, the traces of the ravages of the locusts were only too visible. On remounting, to proceed on our journey, we found that the cloud had approached much nearer, the effect produced by its varying position being most extraordinary. As the locusts passed between us and the sun, they completely obscured the light. A little later, with the sun's rays shining directly on their wings, they looked like a golden cloud, such as one sometimes sees in the transformation scene of a pantomime, and, at a greater distance, when viewed from the top of a slight eminence, they looked like a snowstorm, or a field of snow-white marguerites, which had suddenly taken to themselves wings. When on the ground, with their wings closed, they formed a close mass of little brown specks, completely hiding the ground and crops, both grass and grain. In riding over them, though not a quarter of their number could rise for want of space in which to spread their wings, they formed such a dense cloud that we could see nothing else, and the horses strongly objected to face them. They got into one's hair and clothes and gave one the creeps all over. I am sure I shall often dream of them for some time to come, and I have quite made up my mind that I never wish to see another locust as long as I live. I have, however, secured some fine specimens for anyone who is curious about them. The land we passed through appeared to be well farmed. We spoke to several of the colonists, especially to one Italian family living in a little mud rancho with a tile roof. They were all gathered together to witness the dying agonies of one of their best cows, perishing from the effects of the drought. The rest of the animals in the corral looked, I am sorry to say, thin and miserable, and as if they intended soon to follow their companion's example. The poor people, nevertheless, seemed very cheery and contented, and hospitably gave us each a drink of some remarkably muddy water. After a thirty-mile ride under a hot sun, fortunately on the easiest of horses, we were none of us sorry to stop for a short time at Carcarana and obtain some refreshment before proceeding, horses, carriage, and all, by train to Rosario, another colony on the line. Arrived at the latter place, I thought I had had enough riding for the first day, and therefore visited the various farms and houses in the carriage, the rest of the party going as before on horseback. After a round of about fifteen miles, we returned to the station, where we were kindly received by the sister of the station master. An excellent dinner was provided for us in the refreshment room, before we entered our special train, and Rosaria was reached at about ten o'clock. Sunday, September 17th. 
a kind friend sent his carriage to take us to the english church a brick building built to replace the small iron church that existed here previously and only opened last month the service was well performed and the singing of the choir excellent we paid a visit to the sunday schools after luncheon and then drove to the quinta of baron alvir the road lies through the town past the race course crowded with gauchos getting up scratch races amongst themselves and on over undulating plains and water courses into the open country sometimes there was a track sometimes none in some places the pastures were luxuriantly green in others the ground was carpeted with white lilac and scarlet verbena just coming into bloom for it is still early spring here here and there came a bare patch completely cleared by the locusts who had also stripped many of the fine timber trees in the garden of the quinta on the gate posts at the entrance were the nests of two oven birds like those we had already seen on the telegraph posts so exactly spherical as to look like ornaments in one of the shrubberies a fine jaguar was shut up in a cage who looked very like a tiger though he had evidently just had his dinner he was watching with greedy interest the proceedings of some natives in charge of a horse an animal which he esteems a great delicacy when procurable on our way across the camp we saw a great quantity of the seeds of the martinia proboscidea mouse-burrs as they call them devil's claws or toenails they are curious-looking things as the annexed woodcut will show frank buckland has a theory and very likely a correct one that they are created in this peculiar form for the express purpose of attaching themselves to the long tails of the wild horses that roam about the country in troops of hundreds they carry them thousands of miles and disseminate the seed wherever they go at large in search of food and water when we returned to rosario we noticed a great crowd still on the race course and were just in time to see the finish of one race ridden barebacked and for a very short distance all the races are short and as the natives are always engaging in these little contests of speed the horses get into the habit of extending themselves directly you put them out of a walk but the least touch is sufficient to stop them immediately and i never saw horses better broken than they are here the most fearful bits are used for the purpose but when once this is accomplished the mere inclination of the body or the slightest pressure of the finger upon the bridle is sufficient to guide them they will maintain for almost any length of time a quick canter what they call here a little gallop at the rate of three leagues ten miles an hour without showing the slightest sign of fatigue they don't like being mounted and always fidget a little then but are quite quiet directly you are in the saddle i rode several horses which had never carried a lady before but after the first few minutes they did not seem to mind the riding habit in the least they evidently dislike standing still unless you dismount and throw the rein on the ground when they will remain stationary for hours monday september eighteenth the early part of this morning was spent in much the same way as on saturday tom going as before to the land company's office whilst i remained at home to write at nine o'clock we proceeded to the station and started in our comfortable railway carriage for tortugas we formed quite a large party altogether and the journey over the now familiar line past roldan carcarana and cañada de gomez was a very pleasant one at tortugas we left the train and paid a visit to one of the overseers of the colony and his cheery little french wife who we found had been expecting us all day on saturday a few weeks ago this lady's sister was carried off by indians with some other women and children after riding many leagues she seized her opportunity pushed the indian who was carrying her off his horse turned the animal's head round and galloped back across the plain hotly pursued until within a mile or two of the colony by the rest of the band it was a plucky thing for a little bit of a woman to attempt with a great powerful savage and she is deservedly looked upon in the village as quite a heroine the journey between rosario and cordova occupies twelve hours by the ordinary train and as frail muerto is exactly halfway between the two places the trains going in either direction commence their journey at the same hours six a m and six p m by which means the passengers meet each other here in time to breakfast and dine together there is a fine bridge over the river near frail muerto but the place is principally celebrated as having been the site of the henleyite colony which caused disappointment to so many young men of family who were induced to come out here from england and to go up country with no other result than the loss of all their money the scheme was supposed to be perfect in all its details but proved upon a closer acquaintance to be utterly worthless 
the iron church at rosario is still standing which the members of the expedition took up there and we have also met some of the young men themselves at various times the train did not reach cordova until seven thirty p m and it was therefore too late for us to see much of the approach to the city but to-morrow we intend to do a good deal in that way in the middle of the night we were aroused by a violent thunderstorm the lightning was most vivid and illuminated our room with many colors the rain fell heavily flooding everything and making the streets look like rivers and the courtyard of the hotel like a lake it is one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most unhealthy of the cities of south america for it is built in the hollow of the surrounding hills where no refreshing breezes can penetrate traveling in brazil is like passing through a vast hothouse filled with gorgeous tropical vegetation and forms of insect life in the neighborhood of montevideo you might imagine yourself in a perpetual greenhouse here it is like being in a vast garden in which the greenest of turf the brightest of bedding out plants and the most fragrant flowering shrubs abound each country therefore possesses its own particular beauty equally attractive in its way shortly after leaving cordova we passed through an indian village but except at this point we did not meet many natives during our ride one poor woman however whom we did unfortunately encounter had a fall from her horse owing to the animal being frightened at the umbrella i carried yet my own horse had after a very brief objection quietly submitted to the introduction of this novelty into the equipment of his rider we found that the hotel on the caldera for which we were bound was shut up but one of the party had the keys and an excellent lunch quickly made its appearance the view from the veranda over the river to the sierras beyond was very fine it had become quite hot by this time and i was much interested in seeing all our horses taken down to the water to bathe they appeared to be perfectly familiar with the process and the river being shallow they picked out all the nice holes between the boulders where they could lie down and be completely covered by the water just as we were starting to return black clouds gathered from all around the lightning flashed the thunder muttered and big drops began to fall but the storm was not of long duration and we escaped the worst part of it though we had ample evidence of its severity during our homeward ride in the slippery ground the washed away paths and the swollen ditches we stopped halfway to see the drowning out of some poor little bizcachas from their holes the water had been turned into their dwellings by means of trenches and as the occupants endeavored to make their escape at the other end they were pounced upon by men and dogs the prairie owls meanwhile hovering disconsolately overhead two of the gentlemen of our party each managed to purchase a living bizcacha which was then wrapped up in a handkerchief and conveyed home when young they are pretty little creatures and are easily tamed it was late when we reached cordova but i was anxious to visit the observatory before our departure as it is one of the best though not by any means the largest in the world professor gould the astronomer is away just at present but we were kindly received by mrs gould who conducted us over the building they have a fine collection of various instruments and some wonderful photographs of the principal stars saturn with his ring and eight moons jupiter with his four moons venus mercury etc if we could have stayed longer we might have seen much more but it was now quite dark and we had only just time for a short visit to the observing room itself our ride down to the city in the dark would have been exceedingly risky if our horses had been less sure-footed for the roads had been washed away in many places but we reached the bottom of the observatory hill in safety and shortly afterwards arrived at the hotel just in time for dinner after dinner we drove to the station where we found all our own party assembled and many more people who had come to see us off i was given the chilean bit used for the horse i rode to-day as a remembrance of my visit it is a most formidable-looking instrument of torture and one which i am sure my dear little steed did not in the least require but i suppose the fact of having once felt it when being broken in is sufficient for a lifetime for the horses here have certainly the very lightest mouths i ever met with a gift of a young puma or small lion was also waiting for me it is about four months old and very tame but considering the children i think it will be more prudent to pass it on to the zoo in london the train started at eight thirty p m and took an hour to reach rio segundo where we found tea and coffee prepared after that we proceeded to make our arrangements for the night some of the gentlemen sleeping in the saloon carriages and some on beds made up in the luggage van tom and i turned into our two cosy little berths and knew nothing more until we were called at four thirty a m at cañada de gomez 
The lamp had gone out, and we found it rather difficult work dressing and packing in the cold and dark, but it was soon done, and a cup of hot coffee in the refreshment room afterwards made us feel quite comfortable. Then we all separated, Captain Dunlop to join his ship, Tom to complete his report on the colonies of the Central Argentine Land Company, which he is preparing in compliance with the request of the directors in London, while the rest of the party awaited the arrival of the wagonette, which was to take us to the Estancia of Las Rosas. Wednesday, September 20th. At 6.30 a.m. the wagonette arrived, a light but strong, unpainted vehicle, drawn by a pair of active little well-bred horses, both of whom had been raced in their day. There were but a few leagues of cultivated ground to be passed before we reached the broad, undulating, solitary pampas, where for some time the only visible signs of life were to be found in the teru teru birds, a sort of plover, who shrieked discordantly as we disturbed their repose. The partridges, large and small, put up by the retriever who accompanied us, some prairie fowls, a great many hawks of all sizes, and the pretty little wider birds, with their two immense tail feathers, four times the length of their bodies. The first glimpse of the far-spreading prairie was most striking in all its variations of color. The true shade of the pampas grass, when long, is a light dusty green, when short it is a bright fresh green. But it frequently happens that, owing to the numerous prairie fires, either accidental or intentional, nothing is to be seen but a vast expanse of black charred ground, here and there relieved by a few patches of vivid green, where the grass is once more springing up under the influence of the rain. The road, or rather track, was in a bad condition, owing to the recent wet weather, and on each side of the five cañadas, or small rivers, which we had to ford, there were deep morasses, through which we had to struggle as best we could, with the mud up to our axle trees. Just before arriving at the point where the stream had to be crossed, the horses were well flogged and urged on at a gallop, which they gallantly maintained until the other side was reached. Then we stopped to breathe the horses and to repair damages, generally finding that a trace had given way or that some other part of the harness had shown signs of weakness. On one occasion we were delayed for a considerable time by the breaking of the splinter bar, to repair which was a troublesome matter indeed. I don't know how we should have managed it if we had not met a native lad, who sold us his long lasso to bind the pieces together again. It was a lucky rencontre for us, as he was the only human being we saw during the whole of our drive of thirty miles, except the peon who brought us a change of horses halfway. In the course of the journey we passed a large estancia, the road to which was marked by the dead bodies and skeletons of the poor beasts who had perished in the late droughts. Hundreds of them were lying about in every stage of decay, those more recently dead being surrounded by vultures and other carrion birds. The next cañada that we crossed was choked up with the carcasses of the unfortunate creatures who had struggled thus far for a last strength, and had then not had sufficient strength left to extricate themselves from the water. Herds of miserable-looking half-starved cattle were also to be seen, the cows very little larger than their calves, and all apparently covered with the same rough shaggy coats. The pasture is not fine enough in this part of the country to carry sheep, but deer are frequently met with. A little later we began to approach cultivated land, and a mile or two further brought us to a broad road, with high palings on either side, down which we drove, and through the yard to the door of the estancia. The house is a one-story building, one room wide, with a veranda in front and at the back, one side of which faces the yard, the other a well-kept garden, full of violets and other spring flowers, and roses just coming into bloom. There are several smaller detached buildings, in which the sleeping apartments are situated, and which are also provided with verandas and barred windows. Having visited the various rooms, in company with our hosts, we sat down to a rough but substantial breakfast, to which full justice was done. Traveling all night, and a ride of thirty miles in the fresh morning air, have a tendency to produce a keen appetite, and the present occasion proved no exception to that rule. After breakfast I rested and wrote some letters, while the gentleman inspected the farm and stud. The proprietor of this estancia has the best horses in this part of the country, and has taken great pains to improve their breed, as well as that of the cattle and sheep, by importing thoroughbreds from England. Unlike the Arabs, neither natives nor settlers here think of riding mares, and it is considered quite a disgrace to do so. They are therefore either allowed to run wild in troops, or are used to trample out corn or to make mud for bricks. 
they are also frequently killed and boiled down for the sake of their hides and tallow the value of which does not amount to more than about ten shillings per head large herds of them are met with at this time of the year on the pampas attended by a few horses and accompanied by their foals the natives of these parts pass their lives in the saddle horses are used for almost every conceivable employment from hunting and fishing to brick making and butter churning even the very beggars ride about on horseback i have seen a photograph of one with a police certificate of mendicancy hanging round his neck taken from life for sir woodbine parish every domestic servant has his or her own horse as a matter of course and the maids are all provided with habits in which they ride about on sundays from one estancia to another to pay visits in fishing the horse is ridden into the water as far as he can go and the net or rod is then made use of by his rider at buenos aires i have seen the poor animals all but swimming to the shore with heavy carts and loads from the ships anchored in the inner roads for the water is so shallow that only very small boats can go alongside the vessels and the cargo is therefore transferred directly to the carts to save the trouble and expense of transshipment in out-of-the-way places on the pampas where no churns exist butter is made by putting milk into a goatskin bag attached by a long lasso to the saddle of a peon who is then set to gallop a certain number of miles with the bag bumping and jumping along the ground after him about four o'clock the horses much larger and better bred animals than those we have been riding lately were brought round from the corral mine was a beauty easy gentle and fast we first took a canter round the cultivated ground about three hundred acres in extent and in capital condition lucerne grows here splendidly and can be cut seven times a year as we left the yard mr neild's man asked if he would take the dogs he replied in the negative but i suppose he must have referred to the greyhounds only for we were certainly accompanied on the present occasion by eleven dogs of various sorts and sizes those left behind being shut up and kept without food in anticipation of the stag hunt to-morrow we rode over the race-course where the horses are trained and on to the partridge ground the larger kind of these birds are extremely stupid and are easily ridden down by a horseman or caught in a noose they rise three times and after the third flight they are so exhausted and terrified that it is easy to dismount and catch them with the hand as they lie panting on the long grass partridge hunting is considered good sport it is necessary to keep your eye constantly fixed upon the bird and to watch where he settles and then to gallop to the spot as hard as possible leaving your horse to look after himself amid the long grass and this manoeuvre has to be repeated until at last the unfortunate bird is overtaken and caught as we were riding along the dogs found and killed a biscacha in a bank just as mr elliot had pulled it out and had laid it dead in the field its little companion owl arrived and appeared to be in the most dreadful state of mind it shrieked and cried as it hovered over us and finally selected a small white fox terrier who i think really had been principally concerned in the death as the object of its vengeance pouncing down upon his head and giving him two or three good pecks at the same time flapping its wings violently the other dogs drove it off but more than half an hour afterwards while we were looking at some horses nearly a mile from the spot the plucky little owl returned to the charge and again swooped down upon the same dog with a dismal cry and administered a vigorous peck to him altogether it was a striking and interesting proof of the attachment existing between these curious birds and beasts the object of the owl in the present instance clearly being to revenge if possible the death of its friend on our return to the farm we went all round the place and found that everything was being made secure for the night after which we watched all the servants come in one by one for their daily ration of grog and then retired to dress for dinner shortly after which being thoroughly tired out i retired to my bedroom attended by a very kind old irishwoman who had been deputed to look after me my mind was at first somewhat disturbed by the discovery of one or two enormous toads and long-armed spiders in my apartment but they fortunately did not interfere with my repose for i slept like a top all the rooms being on the ground floor it is almost impossible entirely to exclude intruders of this description i admired very much what i took to be two fine ponchos of a delicate fawn colour used as tablecloths but upon closer examination i found that they were made of the finest silk and learned afterwards that they were imported from england 
I don't know why the same material should not be employed for a similar purpose at home, but I believe that those manufactured hitherto have been designed expressly for the South American market, to which they are exported in considerable quantities. Thursday, September 21st. At five o'clock, when I awoke, it was so misty that I could only see about halfway across the yard. By six, the hour at which we were to have started on our hunting expedition, matters had improved a little, but it was still considered unsafe to venture out for fear of being lost on the vast plains which surrounded us. An hour later, however, it was reported that the fog was clearing off, and a little before eight o'clock we started. Horses, riders, and dogs all appeared to be in the highest spirits, the former jumping and frisking about, hardly deigning to touch the ground, the latter tearing after one another and barking at every stray bird they met. The pack numbered seventeen and could hardly be called a level lot of hounds, comprising, as it did, two deer hounds, five well-bred greyhounds, two retrievers, one setter, one spaniel, one French poodle, two fox terriers, one black and tan terrier, and two animals of an utterly indescribable breed. But they all did their work well, as the event proved. Even the shaggy, fat, old French poodle arrived in each case before the deer was cut up. Two deer were soon descried in the distance, and we cantered steadily towards them at the rate of about ten miles an hour, until the dogs winded and sighted them. Then, directly the first short yelp was heard, every horse extended himself in an instant, galloping away as hard as he could go, almost literally vent à terre. They were nearly all thoroughbreds and had been raced, so that the speed was something delightful. But it only lasted ten minutes, at the end of which time the dogs ran into one of the deer, and thus put a temporary stop to our enjoyment. He proved to be a fine buck and was soon killed. His legs were cut off for trophies, but his horns being like velvet, the head was not worth having. Some of the dogs pursued the doe, but failed to pull her down, and returned half an hour later, fatigued and panting. It had become hot by this time, so we rode to the nearest water to enable the animals to drink and bathe, and then started afresh at a sharp canter. There were plenty of biscacha holes and boggy places to be avoided, but we allowed the horses to take care of themselves and us in this respect, and occupied ourselves almost exclusively in looking for fresh deer. For some time we found nothing, then two sprang out of the long grass close to the cañada which they crossed, and, on reaching the other side, started off in different directions. The pack pursued and divided, some going after each animal. I and two others of the party followed the doe, and after another short burst of ten minutes at a tremendous pace, we ran into and killed her. As soon as she had been dispatched, we wanted to follow the buck, in pursuit of which the rest of the riders had gone, but there was now nothing to be seen of him or them. Flat as the country looked, the slight undulations of the ground quite hid them from our view. After riding about for two hours in various directions, looking and listening most patiently, we abandoned the search in despair and returned to the house, where we found that our friends had already arrived. They had enjoyed the best run they have had for many months, seven miles from point to point, but the dogs had lain down, dead beat, at the end of the first six miles. The horsemen had galloped on, their animals tailing off one by one, until only two remained in it at all. Having mutually agreed to let the stag live till another day to afford perhaps as good a run and as much pleasure to someone else, they thereupon also abandoned the chase, and turned their horses' heads homewards. After a change of dress, we proceeded to pack up, preparatory to our departure, and then had breakfast, after which we bade adieu to our kind hosts, and started in the wagonette to retrace our steps to the station. It was very bright and hot, and the sun and wind had already begun to have a visible effect upon the vegetation of the Pampas. The streams were much more passable, and we reached Cañada de Gomez at about half-past five, in a shorter time than it had taken us to perform the outward journey yesterday. On reaching Rosario at about ten o'clock, we found several friends waiting to receive us with invitations to tea, but we felt too tired in body and too disreputable in appearance to accept them, and preferred going straight to our hotel and to bed. End of chapter six. Chapter 7 of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. More about the Argentine Republic. 
The twilight is sad and cloudy, the wind blows wild and free, and like the wings of seabirds flash the white caps of the sea. Friday, September 22nd. Mr. Fisher called for me at 8 a.m. to drive me in his little carriage to the railway yard and workshops, and then to pay some farewell visits. We also went to see the market and to get some photographs of Rosario, after which breakfast, packing up, and paying the bill occupied our time until 1 o'clock, when we started for the steamer to return to Buenos Aires. On our arrival alongside the Provador, I found that nearly all our Rosario friends had come down to the landing place to see us off, and had brought all manner of remembrances for me and the children. Flowers in profusion, a tame cardinal bird for Muriel, a pair of dear little long-tailed green parakeets, the skin of a seal shot at the Alexandria colony, a beautiful poncho, an Argentine bit, whip, and stirrups, a carpincha skin, two pretty little muletas, a sort of armadillo, very tame, and often kept in the houses here as a pet, and several other presents, all of which, when I look at them at home, will serve to remind me of the kind donors and of the happy days spent in the Argentine Republic. It was not long before we were off and steaming slowly astern of the Uruguay. This boat is not so large nor so fast as the Uruguay, though the difference in speed does not probably amount to more than 15 minutes in the 24 hours. Her saloon and deck are not so good, but her sleeping cabins are much larger and more comfortable. The Italian captains are equally agreeable on both steamers. The civility is the same, and the fares and food are precisely similar, so that there is not much left to influence one in the choice of vessels. We had a pleasant party at an excellent dinner in the evening, the captain only regretting that we had not been on board two days ago when Mademoiselle P. and the opera company went down from Rosario to Buenos Aires. They had a very cheery evening and some good music, which Tom told us afterwards he thoroughly enjoyed. There were no musicians on board tonight, and not any temptation to sit up late, which was perhaps as well. One of the reasons for our going back this way being that we wished to have an opportunity of seeing the River Tigre, which we should reach in the early morning. On the upward journey we had, to save time, embarked at Campania, which is situated above that river. Saturday, September 23rd. At 4.30 a.m. the captain called me, being anxious that I should not miss any of the beauties of the Tigre. On my arrival on deck, he kindly had a chair placed for me right in the bows, provided me with rugs and wraps, and sent for some hot coffee, which was particularly acceptable, as the morning air was fresh and chilly. The sky was flushed with rosy clouds, the forerunners of one of the most beautiful sunrises imaginable. The river itself is narrow and monotonous, the branches of the willow tree on either bank almost sweeping the sides of the steamer. The center channel is fairly deep, but we managed to run aground once, though we only drew nine feet, and in turning a sharp corner it was necessary to send a boat ashore with a rope to pull the vessel's head round. At half-past six we reached the port of Tigre, where we found many fine ships waiting for the tide to go up the river. Some delay occurred while the passengers' luggage was being examined, but in about half an hour we were able to land and walk to the railway station, through an avenue of shady trees, round the trunks of which the wisteria, now in full bloom, was climbing, and past several houses, whose pretty gardens were ablaze with all sorts of flowers. At the station I found a letter from Tom, telling me we were expected to breakfast at a quinta, not far from Buenos Aires, for about an hour and a half the line ran through a rich and fertile country, quite the garden of Buenos Aires, until we arrived at the station where we were to alight. Here Mr. Coglan met us and drove us to his house, which is charmingly situated in the midst of a grove of olive trees, formerly surrounding the palace of the viceroys. After breakfast the gardener cut us a fine bouquet of roses and violets, and we walked to the tramway and were conveyed by one of the cars, smoothly and quickly, to the city. The contrast between this mode of traveling and riding in an ordinary carriage through the ill-paved streets is very striking. It is really less fatiguing to walk than to adopt the latter mode of conveyance, and I believe that, but for the look of the thing, most people would prefer to do so. How the vehicles themselves stand the jolting I cannot imagine, for they are all large and handsome, and must suffer tremendous strains. At noon we went with Mr. Coughlin to see the market in the museum and to do some shopping. The market is a large open building, well supplied with everything at moderate prices, meat, game, fruit, vegetables, and flowers being especially cheap and good, house rent and fine clothes, what Muriel would call dandy things, are very dear in Buenos Aires, 
but all the necessaries of life are certainly cheap. People of the middle and lower classes live much better here than they do at home, and the development of bone and muscle in large families of small children, owing to the constant use of so much meat and strong soup, is very remarkable. When once they have attained the age at which they can run about, children get on very well, but the climate and the difficulty of obtaining a proper supply of milk in hot weather often prove fatal to infants. It is very difficult to get good servants here, as they can easily obtain much higher pay in other capacities, and are very soon enabled to set up in business for themselves. Returning to the hotel, we collected our parcels and had some luncheon, and then proceeded to the pier, where we found the children waiting for us to embark in the gig, and we soon arrived safely on board the Sunbeam. At about half-past six, Tom and Maybelle returned from their expedition to the largest and most comfortable estancia in the country, where they were received most hospitably and enjoyed themselves very much. After dinner, some of our party left in the whaleboat, being anxious to be present at Madame Almazilia's benefit performance at the opera, for which I fear they arrived too late after all. Whilst we were waiting at the railway station today, some of the bouquets, which were to be presented at the theatre tonight, arrived by train. The flowers were arranged in all manner of strange shapes and devices, full-sized tables and chairs, music stands and musical instruments, and many other quaint conceits, comprised entirely of grey Neapolitan violets, marked out with camillas and other coloured flowers. Sunday, September 24th. Most of us went ashore in the whaleboat at ten o'clock to attend the English church, reopened today for the first time for some months. After our own service, we met many friends and walked to the Roman Catholic Cathedral. The streets were full of well-appointed carriages, and in the interior of the building we found a great many well-dressed ladies and a few men. Mass had not commenced, and a constant stream of worshippers was still entering, but we remained only for a short time and then returned to the mole. By this time the wind had freshened considerably, and several of our friends tried to persuade us to remain on shore, but as we knew Tom was expecting us, and we wanted to get the things we required for our next journey, we thought it better to go off. It took us two hours and a half, beating against the wind, to reach the yacht, seasick and drenched to the skin. Directly we got outside the bar, the sea was very bad, and each wave broke more or less over the little half-deck under which the children had been packed away for shelter. Seeing how rough it was out at the anchorage, far worse than near the shore, Tom had quite given us up, for it was now half-past three and was preparing to come ashore, bringing our things with him. On board the yacht we found an unfortunate French maid and another servant, who had come off early in the morning to spend the day and have dinner with our people, but who were now lying prostrate and ill in the cabin. Champagne and luncheon revived us a little, and Tom hurried us off to get ashore again by daylight, before the weather became worse. It was a very pleasant twenty-minute sail to the shore, racing along before the wind, with two reefs in the mainsail, quite a different thing from beating out. The tide was high, and the captain therefore steered for the pier, where he hoped to land us. Unfortunately, however, he missed it, and, as it was impossible to make another tack out, all that could be done was to let go the anchor, to save running ashore, and wait until they sent out a small boat to fetch us. This took some little time, during which we pitched and tossed about in a very disagreeable fashion. When the boat did at last arrive, she turned out to be a wretched little skiff, rowed by two men with very indifferent oars and only capable of taking three passengers at a time. Tom went first, taking with him the two children and the two poor seasick maids, and the boat at once put off for the land, Tom steering. It was terrible to watch them from the whaleboat, and when one tremendous sea came and the skiff broached too, I thought for a moment that all was over, as did everyone who was watching our proceedings from the pier. I could not look any more till I heard shouts that they were safe ashore. Then came our turn. The boat returned for us, this time provided with better oars, and we were soon landed in safety, if not in comfort, and a third and last trip brought ashore the rest of the party and the luggage, Tom remaining at the tiller. Mr. Coglan had come down to meet us, but seeing the peril of the first boat had gone away until he heard we were all landed, and now returned to congratulate us on our narrow escape and present safety. After we had rested for a short time in the waiting room to recover from our fright and shake our dripping garments, we went to the Hôtel de la Paix, 
where we dined and at ten o'clock we walked down to the railway station where a large number of people had already assembled some of whom were to accompany us to azul while others had only come to see us off everything had been most comfortably arranged for us in the special train the interior fittings of two second-class american carriages had been completely taken out and a canvas lining divided into compartments each containing a cosy little bed had been substituted washstands looking-glasses etc had been provided and a profusion of beautiful flowers filled in every available spot in a third car two tables occupying its entire length with seats on one side of each table had been placed and here it was intended that we should breakfast lunch and dine monday september twenty fifth we slept soundly speaking for the children and myself until we were aroused at six o'clock this morning by the agreeable intelligence that we had reached our destination azul is about three hundred miles south of buenos aires on the southern railway it is a small and primitive place in itself but is situated in the midst of splendid pastures both for rearing sheep and cattle of which there are large flocks and herds whilst we were waiting for breakfast we walked a little distance to see a troop of mares treading mud for bricks it was a curious but rather sad sight inside a circular enclosure some fifty yards in diameter about fifty half-starved animals up to their hoofs in very sloppy mud were being driven round about and up and down as fast as they could go by a mounted peon assisted by five or six men on foot outside the enclosure armed with long heavy whips which they used constantly some of the poor creatures had foals which were tied up a little distance off and which kept up a piteous whinnying as an accompaniment to the lashings and crackings of the whips on our way back to the station we saw a horse attached to a light gig bolt across the pampas at full gallop vainly pursued by a man on horseback first one wheel came off and then the other then the body of the gig was left behind and then the shafts and most of the harness followed suit until at last as we afterwards heard the runaway reached his home about five miles off with only his bridle remaining at nine o'clock the breakfast bell rang and we found an excellent repast spread out for us on two long tables an hour later we started in seven large carriages and proceeded first to make the tour of the town afterwards visiting the bank and a fine new house in the course of construction by a native built entirely of white marble from italy then we paid a visit to some indians an old chief and his four wives who have settled quietly down in a toldo near the town they were not bad-looking and appeared fairly comfortable as they squatted in the open air round the fire above which was suspended a large iron pot containing to judge by the look and smell a most savoury preparation we next went to a store where we picked up a few curiosities and then drove to the mill of azul a new establishment of which the inhabitants of the town are evidently very proud there is a pretty walk by the mill stream overhung with willows and close by is another toldo inhabited by more indians leaving the town we now proceeded about two leagues across the pampas to mr frere's estancia he is a farmer on a very extensive scale and possesses about twenty four thousand sheep and five hundred horses besides goodly herds of cattle the locusts have not visited this part of the country and the pastures are consequently in fine condition after the late rains while the sheep look proportionately well we passed a large grasseria or place where sheep are killed at the rate of seven in a minute and are skinned cut up and boiled down for tallow in an incredibly short space of time the residue of the meat being used in the furnace as fuel running about loose outside were four or five curly-horned rams between two of which a grand combat took place apparently conducted in strict accordance with the rules of fighting etiquette the two animals began by walking round and round eyeing each other carefully and then retiring backwards a certain distance which might have been measured out for them they stopped so exactly simultaneously then gazing steadfastly at one another for a few moments as if to take aim they rushed forward with tremendous force dashing their foreheads together with a crash that might have been heard a mile away it seemed marvellous that they did not fracture their skulls for they repeated the operation three or four times before mr frere could get a man to help to stop the fight when the two combatants were led off in a very sulky state to be locked up apart 
Arrangements had been made for us to see as much of station life as possible during our short visit. The peons' dinner had been put back in order that we might witness their peculiar method of roasting, or rather baking their food and eating it. But we were rather later than was expected, and the men were so hungry that we were only able to see the end of the performance. Mr. Frere had also sent a long way across the Pampas for some wild horses belonging to him, in order that we might see them lassoed, and Colonel Donovan had brought with him one of his best domidors, or horse-breakers, that we might have an opportunity of seeing an unbroken colt caught and backed for the first time. About a hundred horses were driven into a large corral, and several gauchos and peons, some on horseback and some on foot, exhibited their skill with the lasso by catching certain of the animals, either by the foreleg, the hind leg, or the neck, as they galloped round and round at full speed. The captured animal got a tremendous fall in each case, and if the mounted horse was not very clever and active, he and his rider were very likely to be thrown down also. There was the risk, too, of the man receiving an injury from the lasso itself, if it should happen to get round his body, in which case he would probably be almost cut in half by the sudden jerk. The next proceeding was to cast a lasso at a patro, or unbroken colt, who was galloping about in the very centre of the troop at full speed. His forelegs were caught dexterously in the noose, which brought him up, or rather down instantly, head over heels. Another lasso was then thrown over his head and drawn quite tight round his neck, and a bridle, composed of two or three thongs of raw hide, was forced into his mouth by means of a slipknot rein. A sheepskin saddle was placed on his back, the man who was to ride him standing over him with one foot already in the stirrup. All this time the poor horse was lying on the ground with his legs tied close together, frightened almost out of his life, trembling in every limb, and perspiring from every pore. When the man was ready, the horse's legs were loosened sufficiently to allow him to rise, and he was then led outside the corral. The lassos were suddenly withdrawn, and he dashed forwards, springing and plunging upwards, sideways, downwards, in every direction, in the vain effort to rid himself of his unaccustomed load. The man remained planted like a rock in the saddle, pulling hard at the bridle, while a second domidor, mounted on a tame horse, pursued the terrified animal, striking him with a cruel whip to make him go in the required direction. After about ten minutes of this severe exercise, the captive returned to the corral, exhausted and perfectly cowed, and showing no desire to rejoin his late companions. In order to complete the process of breaking him in, we were told that it would be necessary to keep him tied up for two or three days, rather short of food, and to repeat daily the operation of saddling, bridling, and mounting, the difficulty being less on each occasion, until at last he would become as quiet as a lamb. We now saw our train approaching, orders having been given for it to come as far as it could from the station to meet us. We wished good-bye to Mr. Frere and his party, and, with many thanks to all, got into our carriages and drove across the plains to the railway. On our way we passed some large lagoons, full of wild fowl, and surrounded by scarlet flamingos and pelicans. The ground we had to traverse was very boggy, so much so that two of the carriages got stuck, and their occupants had to turn out and walk. At last we reached the train and climbed into the cars, where we found an excellent luncheon prepared, which we ate whilst the train dashed along at the rate of forty miles an hour. About seven o'clock we stopped for tea and coffee, and the children were put to bed. By nine we had reached the junction for Buenos Aires, where an engine met us and took most of our party into the city in one of the cars, while we went on to Punta Lara, the station for Ensenada. On arriving we were met by several of our men who had been allowed to go ashore at Buenos Aires on Sunday morning, and had not been able to rejoin the yacht since. On Sunday night, when they were to have returned, it was impossible for them to get off. Even the whaleboat was nearly dashed to pieces at anchor near the pier. They spent the early part of Monday morning in hunting everywhere with the pilot for the lost steward, and at last left the shore just in time to see the yacht steaming down the river, with only half her crew on board and without a pilot. It seems they had been waited for from eight o'clock until eleven. It then became necessary to get under way for fear of losing the tide. As it was, the yacht had not been able to get near the pier at Ensenada, and was now lying in the river two miles out. The station master, having been informed of the state of affairs, very kindly had steam got up in the railway tug to take us off. 
the children with their nurses remained in bed in the car which was shunted into a siding until the morning the doctor staying on shore in charge the rest of us then set out for the yacht which we reached at one a m only to be greeted with the pleasing intelligence that no fresh provisions had arrived on board for the party of friends we were expecting the captain of the tug was good enough to promise to do what he could for us on shore but everything is brought here from buenos aires and it is too late to telegraph for a supply we cannot help fearing that something must have happened to our steward for he has always been most steady and respectable hitherto and i fancy buenos aires is rather a wild place every inquiry is to be made and i can only trust the morning may bring us some news tuesday september twenty sixth the morning was fine with a nice breeze but the tide was so low that we should have been unable to get alongside the pier until ten o'clock when tom thought we should just miss our guests it was therefore decided that it would be better to send the steam tug to meet the special train especially as if we took the yacht in it would be impossible to get out again in the middle of the night when we had arranged to sail the steam tug came off early bringing two sheep half a bullock and some wild ducks much to the relief of the cook's mind but there were no vegetables to be had on shore and of course it was too late to send to buenos aires for any we had to do the best we could without them therefore and i really do not think any one knew of the dilemma we had been in until they were told at the end of the day the servants all turned to and worked with a will but it was rather a different matter from having a large luncheon party on board in the thames with our london servants and supplies to fall back on for our own part i think we all felt that the comparative scarcity of meat this morning was an agreeable change after our recent experiences animal food is so cheap and so good in this country that at every meal four or five dishes of beef or mutton dressed in various ways are provided in the camp as all the country round buenos aires is called people eat nothing but meat either fresh or dried and hardly any flour with it especially in the more distant estancias beef and mutton poultry and eggs form the staple food of the inhabitants very little bread is eaten and no vegetables and an attempt is rarely made to cultivate a garden of any sort this year too the ravages of the locusts have made vegetable food scarcer than ever and it must now be looked upon quite as a luxury by very many people for there can be little doubt that to live entirely on meat even of the best quality though probably strengthening must be exceedingly monotonous about one o'clock we saw the tug coming off again this time with her decks crowded we found she had brought us fifteen ladies and thirty gentlemen more than we had expected on account of the shortness of the notice we had been able to give the luncheon was managed by dividing our guests into three parties, the coffee and dessert being served on deck, but I am afraid the last division got very hungry before their time arrived. It could not, however, be helped, and it is to be hoped that the examination of the various parts of the yacht and her contents served to while away the time. Everyone seemed to be pleased with the appearance of the vessel, never having seen one like her before. Indeed, the only yacht that has ever been here previously is the Ilthen, which formerly belonged to us. Mr. St. John's servant brought me a most magnificent bouquet, composed entirely of violets, arranged in the shape of a basket three feet in width, full of camillas, and marked with my initials in alisum. Altogether, it was quite a work of art, but almost overpoweringly sweet. It was late before our friends began the task of saying goodbye. No light matter where, as in the present case, it is doubtful whether, or at any rate when, we shall meet again. At last they left us, steaming round the yacht in the tug, and giving us some hearty cheers as they passed. The minister's flag was run up, salutes were exchanged, and the little steamer rapidly started off in the direction of the shore, followed by a dense cloud of her own smoke. Through a telescope we watched our friends disembark at the pier, and saw the train steam away, and then we turned our thoughts to the arrangements for our own departure. Wednesday, September 27th. A fine breeze was blowing this morning, in a favorable direction for our start, but as ten and eleven o'clock arrived, and there were still no signs of the expected stores, Tom was in despair and wanted to sail without them. I therefore volunteered to go ashore in the gig and see what had happened to them, and telegraph, if necessary, to Mr. Crabtree. Fortunately, we met the tug on our way and returned in tow of her to the yacht. Then, after settling a few bills and obtaining our bill of health, we got the anchor up and proceeded down the river under sail. Between one and two o'clock we commenced steaming, 
and in the course of the evening were clear of the river plate and fairly on our way to the Straits of Magellan. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. River Plate to Sandy Point, Straits of Magellan. I have seen tempests when the scolding winds have rived the knotty oaks, and I have seen the ambitious ocean swell and rage and foam to be exalted with the threatening clouds. But never till to-night, never till now, did I go through a tempest-dropping fire. Thursday, September 28th. A fine, bright morning, with a strong, fair wind. The order to stop firing was given at noon, and we ceased steaming shortly after. There had evidently been a gale from the southward during the last few days, for the swell was tremendous, and not only made us all feel very uncomfortable after our long stay in harbor, but considerably diminished our speed. Still we managed to go twenty-seven knots in two hours and a half. I was lying down below after breakfast, feeling very stupid, when Maybell rushed into the cabin, saying, Papa says you are to come up on deck at once to see the ship on fire. I rushed up quickly, hardly knowing whether she referred to our own or some other vessel, and on reaching the deck I found everybody looking at a large bark under full sail, flying the red Union Jack upside down and with signals in her rigging, which our signal man read as ship on fire. These were lowered shortly afterwards, and the signals come on board at once hoisted in their place. Still we could see no appearance of smoke or flames, but we nevertheless hauled to the wind, tacked, hove to, and sent off a boat's crew well armed, thinking it not impossible that a mutiny had taken place on board, and that the captain or officers, mistaking the yacht for a gunboat, had appealed to us for assistance. We were now near enough to the bark to make out her name through a glass, the Monkshaven of Whitby, and we observed a puff of smoke issue from her deck simultaneously with the arrival of our boat alongside. In the course of a few minutes the boat returned, bringing the mate of the Monkshaven, a fine-looking Norwegian who spoke English perfectly, and who reported his ship to be sixty-eight days out from Swansea, bound for Valparaiso, with a cargo of smelting coal. The fire had first been discovered on the previous Sunday, and by 6 a.m. on Monday the crew had got up their clothes and provisions on deck, thrown overboard all articles of a combustible character, such as tar, oil, paint, spare spars and sails, planks and rope, and battened down the hatches. Ever since then they had all been living on deck with no protection from the wind and sea but a canvas screen. Tom and Captain Brown proceeded on board at once. They found the deck more than a foot deep in water and all awash, when the hatches were opened for a moment, dense clouds of hot, suffocating yellow smoke immediately poured forth, driving back all who stood near. From the captain's cabin came volumes of poisonous gas, which had found its way in through the crevices, and one man who tried to enter was rendered insensible. It was perfectly evident that it would be impossible to save the ship, and the captain therefore determined, after consultation with Tom and Captain Brown, to abandon her. Some of the crew were accordingly at once brought on board the sunbeam in our boat, which was then sent back to assist in removing the remainder, a portion of whom came in their own boat. The poor fellows were almost wild with joy at getting alongside another ship after all the hardships they had gone through, and in their excitement they threw overboard many things which they might as well have kept, as they had taken the trouble to bring them. Our boat made three trips altogether, and by half-past six we had them all safe on board, with most of their effects, and the ship's chronometers, charts, and papers. The poor little dinghy, belonging to the Monkshaven, had been cast away as soon as the men had disembarked from her, and there was something melancholy in seeing her slowly drift away to leeward, followed by her oars and various small articles, as if to rejoin the noble ship she had so lately quitted. The latter was now hove to under full sail, an occasional puff of smoke alone betraying the presence of the demon of destruction within. The sky was dark and lowering, the sunset red and lurid in its grandeur, 
the clouds numerous and threatening, the sea high and dark with occasional streaks of white foam. Not a breath of wind was stirring. Everything portended a gale. As we lay slowly rolling from side to side, both ship and boat were sometimes plainly visible, and then again both would disappear, for what seemed an age, in the deep trough of the South Atlantic rollers. For two hours we could see the smoke pouring from various portions of the ill-fated bark. Our men, who had brought off the last of her crew, reported that, as they left her, flames were just beginning to burst from the fore hatchway, and it was therefore certain that the rescue had not taken place an hour too soon. Whilst we were at dinner, Powell called us up on deck to look at her again, when we found that she was blazing like a tar-barrel. The captain was anxious to stay by and see the last of her, but Tom was unwilling to incur the delay which this would have involved. We accordingly got up steam, and at 9 p.m. steamed round the Monkshaven as close as it was deemed prudent to go. No flames were visible then, only dense volumes of smoke and sparks issuing from the hatches. The heat, however, was intense and could be plainly felt even in the cold night air as we passed some distance to leeward. All hands were clustered in our rigging, on the deck-house or on the bridge, to see the last of the poor Monkshaven, as she was slowly being burnt down to the water's edge. She was a large and nearly new, three years old, composite ship, built and found by her owners, Messrs. Smalls of Whitby, of 657 tons burden, and classed A-1 for ten years at Lloyd's. Her cargo, which consisted of coal for smelting purposes, was a very dangerous one, so much so that Messrs. Nicholas of Sunderland, from whose mines the coal is procured, have great difficulty in chartering vessels to carry it, and are therefore in the habit of building and using their own ships for the purpose. At Buenos Aires we were told that, of every three ships carrying this cargo round to Valparaiso or Cayo, one catches fire, though the danger is frequently discovered in time to prevent much damage to the vessel or loss of life. The crew of the Monkshaven, Danes, Norwegians, Swedes, Scotch, and Welsh, appear to be quiet, respectable men. This is fortunate, as an incursion of fifteen rough, lawless spirits on board our little vessel would have been rather a serious matter. In their hurry and fright, however, they left all their provisions behind them, and it is no joke to have to provide food for fifteen extra hungry mouths for a week or ten days, with no shops at hand from which to replenish our stores. The sufficiency of the water supply, too, is a matter for serious consideration. We have all been put on half allowance, and sea water only is to be used for washing purposes. Some account of the disaster, as gathered from the lips of various members of the crew at different times, may perhaps be interesting. It seems that, early on Monday morning, the day following that on which the fire was discovered, Another bark, the Robin Hines of Liverpool, was spoken. The captain of that vessel offered to stand by them or do anything in his power to help them, but at that time they had a fair wind for Montevideo, only 120 miles distant, and they therefore determined to run for that port and do their best to save the ship and possibly some of the cargo. In the course of the night, however, a terrible gale sprang up, the same, no doubt, as the one of which we had felt the effects on first leaving the river plate. They were driven hither and thither, the sea constantly breaking over them and sweeping the decks, though fortunately without washing any of them overboard. After forty-eight hours of this rough usage, the men were all exhausted, while the fire was gradually increasing in strength beneath their feet, and they knew not at what moment it might burst through the decks and envelop the whole ship in flames. They were beginning to abandon all hope of a rescue, when a sail was suddenly discovered, and as soon as the necessary flags could be found, the same signal which attracted us was displayed. The vessel, now quite close to them, proved to be a large American steamer, but she merely hoisted her own ensign and code pennant, and then coolly steamed away to the southward. "'I think that captain deserved tar and feathering anyway,' one of the men said to me. Another observed, I wonder what will become of that man, for we had put all our lives in his hand by signaling as we did, and every seaman knows that right well. Another said, when we saw that ship go away, we all gave in and lay down in despair to die. But our captain, who is very good to his crew, and a religious man too, said, There is one above who looks after us all. That was true enough, for about ten minutes afterwards, as I was talking to the cook and telling him it was all over with us, 
I saw a sail to leeward and informed the captain. We bore down a little, but did not like to go out of our course too much, fearing you might be a Portuguese, and play us the same trick as the American. They could not understand our white ensign, for, our funnel being stowed, we looked like a sailing vessel, while all gunboats of our size are steamers. When we saw it was an English vessel, and that you answered our signals and sent a boat off, we were indeed thankful, though that was nothing to what we feel now at once more having a really dry ship under our feet. Not that we have really suffered anything very terrible, for we had a bit of shelter and plenty to eat, and the worst part was seeing our things washed overboard and thinking perhaps we might go next. We have not had a dry deck since we left Swansea, and the pumps have been kept going most of the time. Why, with this sea, ma'am, our decks would be under water. This surprised me, as though low in the water, the Monkshaven did not appear to be overladen, and the plimsoll mark was plainly visible. Our boats were all ready for launching, but we had no sails and only one rudder for the three, so we should have had hard work to fetch anywhere if we had taken to them. We lashed the two boys, apprentices, fourteen and sixteen years old, in one of the boats, for fear they should be washed overboard. The youngest of them is the only son of his mother, a widow, and you could see how she loved him by the way she had made his clothes and fitted him out all through. He was altogether too well found for a ship like ours, but now most of his things are lost. His chest could not be got up from below, and though I borrowed an old bread bag from the steward, it was not half big enough, and his sea boots and things his mother had given him to keep him dry and cover his bed, not oilskins like ours. Mackintoshes, I suggested. Yes, that's the name. They were all lost. It did seem a pity. The boy never thought there was much danger till this morning, when I told him all hope was gone, as the American ship had sailed away from us. He said, Will the ship go to the bottom? And I replied, I fear so, but we have good boats, so keep up your heart, little man. He made no further remark, but laid down gently again, and cried a little. This poor child was dreadfully frightened in the small boat coming alongside, and his look of joy and relief when once he got safely on board was a treat to me. Everyone on board, including the captain, seems to have been very kind to him. One of the men had his foot broken by the sea, and the captain himself had his leg severely injured, so the doctor has some cases at last. It was almost impossible to sleep during the night, owing to the heavy rolling, by far the most violent that we have yet experienced. Friday, September 29th. Again a fine morning. A fair breeze sprang up, and, the dreaded storm having apparently passed over, we ceased steaming at 6 a.m. All on board are now settling down into something like order. The stewards are arranging matters below and measuring out the stores to allowance the men for twelve days. The men belonging respectively to the port and starboard watches of the Monkshaven have been placed in the corresponding watches on board the Sunbeam. The cook and steward are assisting hours below, and the two boys are very happy helping in the kitchen and making themselves generally useful. The deck does not look quite as neat as usual. Such of the men's sea chests as have been saved are lashed round the steam chest so that they can be got at easily, while their bags and other odd things have been stowed on deck wherever they can be kept dry, for every inch of available space below is occupied. Captain Runciman is writing, with tears in his eyes, the account of the loss of his fine ship. He tells me that he tried in vain to save sixty pounds worth of his own private charts from his cabin, but it was impossible on account of the stifling atmosphere which nearly overpowered him. Fortunately, all his things are insured. He drowned his favorite dog, a splendid Newfoundland, just before leaving the ship, for, although a capital watchdog and very faithful, he was rather large and fierce, and when it was known that the Sunbeam was a yacht with ladies and children on board, he feared to introduce him. Poor fellow! I wish I had known about it in time to save his life. The great danger of smelting coal as a ship's cargo, besides its special liability to spontaneous combustion, appears to be that the fire may smolder in the very center of the mass for so long that when the smoke is at last discovered, it is impossible to know how far the mischief has advanced. It may go on smoldering quietly for days, or at any moment the gas that has been generated may burst up the vessel's decks from end to end without the slightest warning, or it may burn downwards and penetrate some portion of the side of the ship below water, 
so that before any suspicion has been aroused the water rushes in and the unfortunate ship and her crew go to the bottom on board the monkshaven the men dug down into the cargo in many places on sunday night only to find that the heat became more intense the deeper they went and several of them had their hands or fingers burnt in the operation this has been about the best day for sailing that we have had since we left the tropics the sea has been smooth and a fair breeze has taken us steadily along at the rate of nine knots an hour the sun shone brightly beneath a blue sky and the temperature is delightful the sunset was grand though the sky looked threatening but the moon rose brilliantly and until we went to bed at ten o'clock the evening was as perfect as the day had been at midnight however tom and i were awakened by a knock at our cabin door and the gruff voice of powell saying the barometer's going down very fast please sir and it's lightning awful in the southwest there's a heavy storm coming up we were soon on deck where we found all hands busily engaged in preparing for the tempest around us a splendid sight presented itself on one side a heavy bank of black clouds could be seen rapidly approaching while the rest of the heavens were brilliantly illuminated by forked and sheet lightning the thunder meanwhile rolling and rattling without intermission an ominous calm followed during which the men had barely time to lower all the sails on deck without waiting to stow them the foresail and jib only being left standing when the squall struck us not very severely but with a blast as hot as that from a furnace we thought worse was coming and continued our preparations but the storm passed rapidly away to windward and was succeeded by torrents of rain so that it was evident we could only have had quite the tale of it saturday september thirtieth the morning broke bright and clear and was followed by a calm bright sunny day of which i availed myself to take some photographs of the captain and crew of the monkshaven the wind failed us entirely in the afternoon and it became necessary to get up steam in the ordinary course of things we should probably have had sufficient patience to wait for the return of the breeze but the recent large addition to our party made it desirable for us to lose as little time as possible in reaching sandy point another grand but wild-looking sunset seemed like the precursor of a storm but we experienced nothing worse than a sharp squall of hot wind accompanied by thunder and lightning sunday october first a fine morning with a fair wind at eleven we had a short service at four a longer one with an excellent sermon from tom specially adapted to the rescue of the crew of the burning ship as usual the sunset which was magnificent was succeeded by a slight storm which passed over without doing us any harm i have said that it was found impossible to save any provisions from the monk's haven as far as the men are concerned i think this is hardly to be regretted for i am told that the salt beef with which they were supplied had lain in pickle for so many years that the saltpetre had eaten all the nourishment out of it and had made it so hard that the men instead of eating it used to amuse themselves by carving it into snuff-boxes little models of ships etc i should not however omit to mention that captain runciman managed to bring away with him four excellent york hams which he presented to us and one of which we had to-day at dinner wednesday october fourth at six a m on going on deck i found we were hove to under steam and closely reefed sails a heavy gale blowing from the southwest right ahead the screw was racing round in the air every time we encountered an unusually big wave the spray was dashing over the vessel and the water was rushing along the deck altogether an uncomfortable morning as the sun rose the gale abated and in the course of the day the reefs were shaken out of the sails one by one until by sunset we were once more under whole canvas beating to windward there were several cries of land ahead during the day but in each case a closer examination through a glass proved that the fancied coastline or mountain top existed only in cloudland thursday october fifth we made the land early and most uninteresting it looked consisting as it did of a low sandy shore with a background of light clay-coloured cliffs not a vestige of vegetation was anywhere to be seen and i am quite at a loss to imagine what the guanacos and ostriches with which the chart tells us the country hereabouts abounds fine to live upon 
about twelve o'clock we made cape virgins looking very like berry head to the north of torbay and a long spit of low sandy land stretching out to the southward appropriately called dungeness some of the charts brought on board by captain runciman were published by messrs imray of london and in one of them it is represented that a fine fixed light has been established on cape virgins this we knew to be an impossibility not only on account of the general character of the country but because no indication is given of the light in our newest admiralty charts captain runciman however had more confidence in the correctness of his own chart and could hardly believe his eyes when he saw that the light really had no existence on the bare bleak headland his faith was terribly shaken and i hope he will not omit to call messrs emre's attention to the matter on his return home for the mistake is most serious and one which might lead to the destruction of many a good ship footnote i have since received a letter from messrs emre requesting me to state that the light was inserted on erroneous information from the hydrographic office at washington and has since been erased from their charts End footnote about two o'clock we saw in the far distance what looked at first like an island and then like smoke but gradually shaped itself into the masts funnel and hull of a large steamer from her rig we at once guessed her to be the pacific company's mail-boat homeward bound when near enough we accordingly hoisted our number and signalled we wished to communicate whereupon she bore down upon us and ceased steaming we then rounded up under her lee and lowered a boat and tom maybell and i with captain runciman and four or five of the shipwrecked crew went on board our advent caused great excitement and seamen and passengers all crowded into the bows to watch us as we approached the ladder the passengers ran aft and directly we reached the deck the captain took possession of tom the first and second officers of maybell and myself while captain runciman and each of his crew were surrounded by a little audience eager to know what had happened and all about it at first it was thought that we all wanted a passage but when we explained matters captain thomas the commander of the Ilimani, very kindly undertook to receive all our refugees and convey them to england we therefore sent the gig back for the rest of the men and the chests of the whole party and then availed ourselves of the opportunity afforded by the delay to walk round the ship it was most amusing to see the interest with which we were regarded by all on board passengers who had never been seen out of their berths since leaving valparaiso and others who were indulging at the time of our visit in the luxury of a day sleep between the twelve o'clock luncheon and four o'clock dinner suddenly made their appearance in dressing gowns and wraps with dishevelled hair and wide-opened eyes gazing in mute astonishment at us quite unable to account for our mysterious arrival on board in this out-of-the-way spot a mail steamer does not stop for a light cause and it was therefore evident to them that the present was no ordinary occurrence the captain told us that the last time he passed through the straits he picked up two boats crews who had escaped from a burning ship and who had suffered indescribable hardships before they were rescued captain runciman is convinced after comparing notes with the chief officer of the Ilimani, that the vessel which refused to notice his signal of distress was the wilmington sent down from new york with a party of forty wreckers to try and get the steamer georgia off the rocks near port famine in the straits of magellan if this be so it is the more surprising that no attempt was made to render assistance to the monkshaven provided her signals were understood as the Wilmington had plenty of spare hands and could not have been in a particular hurry. Moreover, one would think that, with her powerful engines, she might have made an attempt to tow the distressed vessel into Montevideo and so secure three or four thousand pounds of salvage money. The captain of the Ilimani kindly gave us half a bullock, killed this morning, a dozen live ducks and chickens, and the latest newspapers thus supplied with food for body and mind we said farewell and returned to the sunbeam our ensigns were duly dipped we steamed away on our respective courses and in less than an hour we were out of sight of each other it is a sudden change for the monkshaven men who were all very reluctant to leave the yacht many of them broke down at the last moment particularly when it came to saying good-bye to tom and me at the gangway of the steamer they had seemed thoroughly to appreciate any kindnesses they received while with us 
and were anxious to show their gratitude in every possible way. The two boys especially were in great grief at their departure, and were very loath to part with their boatswain, who remains with us to make up our compliment. Footnote. After our return to England, the following letter reached us from Monsieur Smales. Whitby, June 30th, 1877. Thomas Brassey, Esquire. Dear Sir, Observing by the newspapers that you have returned home after your cruise, we take this opportunity of thanking you most heartily for the valuable assistance you rendered to the crew of our late bark Monkshaven, in latitude 4328 south, longitude 6221 west, after she proved to be on fire and beyond saving. Your kind favor of October 1 last duly reached us, and it was very satisfactory to know from an authority like your own that all was done under the trying circumstances that was possible to save the ship and cargo. The inconvenience of having so many extra hands for the time on board your vessel must have tried your resources, but you will be probably aware that the Board of Trade willingly compensate for loss sustained in rescuing a crew when a claim is made. You will be glad to learn that the master and crew arrived all well in due course at Liverpool by the Illimani, and were very grateful for your kindness to them. Our ill-fated vessel must have sunk very soon after you took off the crew, as nothing more has been heard of her, and it was a most fortunate circumstance that you were so near at hand, more especially as the captain reported to us that a vessel carrying the American colors took no notice of his signal of distress. As shipowners, we generally find that our own countrymen are more heroic and always ready to lend a helping hand to brother mariners in distress, so that, as you say, we do not doubt you experienced some satisfaction in rendering this service. Trusting that you have enjoyed your trip, we beg to remain yours, truly obliged, Smales Brothers. End footnote. About 8 p.m., we anchored for the night in Possession Bay. It was thick at sunset, but afterwards clear and cold, with a splendid moon. Friday, October 6th. We got under way at 5.30 a.m. and steamed past the low sandy coast of Patagonia and the rugged mountains of Tierra del Fuego and through the first and second narrows to Cape Negro, where the character of the scenery began to improve a little, the vegetation gradually changing from low scrubby brushwood to respectable-sized trees. When passing between Elizabeth Island, so named by Sir Francis Drake, and the island of Santa Madalena, we looked in vain for the myriads of seals, otters, and sea lions with which this portion of the straits is said to abound, but we saw only seven or eight little black spots on the shore in the distance, which disappeared into the sea as we approached. At 3 p.m. we reached Sandy Point, the only civilized place in the straits. It is a Chilean settlement, and a large convict establishment has been formed here by the government. Almost before we had dropped our anchor, the harbor master came on board, closely followed by the officers of the two Chilean men-of-war lying in the harbor. The rain, which had been threatening all day, now descended in torrents, and we landed in a perfect downpour. We thought the pier at Buenos Aires unsafe and rickety, but here matters were still worse, for the head of the structure had been completely washed away by a gale, and no little care was necessary in order to step across the broken timbers in safety. The town, which contains between 1,200 and 1,300 inhabitants, is composed entirely of one-storied log huts, with slate or tile roofs, and with or without verandas. They are all arranged in squares, separated from each other by wide roads, and the whole settlement is surrounded by stockades. At the further end of the town stands the convict prison, distinguished by its tower, and the governor's house, which, though built of wood, is the most pretentious-looking edifice in the place. There is a nice little church close by, and some tidy-looking barracks. We went straight to the house of the British vice-consul, who received us very kindly, and promised to do what he could to assist us in obtaining supplies, but the resources of the place are limited, and eggs, ship's beef and biscuits, and water will, I expect, be the sum total of what we shall be able to procure. In fact, it is rather doubtful whether we shall even be able to renew our stock of coal. In the meantime, we started off to potter about the town, 
finding, however, very little to amuse us. There were some new-laid ostrich eggs to be bought, and some queer-looking worked Patagonian saddlebags. I fear we shall not see any of the Patagonians themselves, for they come to the colony only three or four times a year to purchase supplies and to sell skins and ostrich eggs. They are a mounted tribe of Indians living on the northern plains and are now on their way down here to pay one of their periodical visits, but, being encumbered with their families, they move very slowly and are not expected to arrive for another ten days. They will no doubt bring a splendid supply of skins, just too late for us, which is rather disappointing, particularly as we are not likely to have another opportunity of meeting with them at any of the places we touch at. They live so far in the interior of the country that they very seldom visit the coast. We went to see three Fuegian females who are living in a house belonging to the medical officer of the colony. They were picked up a short time since by a passing steamer from a canoe, in which they had evidently sought refuge from some kind of cruelty or oppression. The biggest of them, a stout, fine-looking woman, had a terrible gash in her leg, quite recently inflicted, and the youngest was not more than eight years old. They appeared cheerful and happy, but we were told that they are not likely to live long. After the free life and the exposure to which they have been accustomed, civilization, in the shape of clothing and hot houses, almost always kills them. Their lungs become diseased, and they die miserably. Their skin is slightly copper-colored, their complexions high-colored, their hair thick and black, and though certainly not handsome, they are by no means so repulsive as I had expected from the descriptions of Cook, Dempier, Darwin, and other more recent travelers. Saturday, October 7th. My birthday. Tom gave me a beautiful guanaco skin robe, and the children presented me with two ostrich rugs. The guanaco is a kind of large deer, and it is said that the robes made from its skin are the warmest in the world. People here assure me that, with the hair turned inside, these robes have afforded them sufficient protection to enable them to sleep in comfort in the open air, exposed to snow, frost, and rain. They are made from the skin of the young fawns, killed before they are thirteen days old, or, better still, from the skins of those which have never had an independent existence. In color, the animals are a yellowish brown on the back and white underneath, and they are so small that when each skin is split up, it produces only two triangular patches about the size of one's hand. A number of these are then, with infinite trouble, sewed neatly together by the Indian women, who use the fine leg sinews of the ostrich's thread. Those worn by the caciques, or chiefs, have generally a pattern in the center, a brown edging, and spots of red and blue paint on the part which is worn outwards. Such robes are particularly difficult to obtain on account of the labor and time necessary to produce them. Each cacique keeps several wives constantly employed in making them, of the best as well as of the ordinary description. The ostrich rugs, which are made here, are more ornamental, though not so warm and light as the guanaco robes. They are made of the entire skin of the ostrich, from which the long wing feathers have been pulled out. Maybelle has been given a beautiful little rug composed of the skins of thirty little ostriches, all from one nest, killed when they were a fortnight old, each skin resembling a prettily marked ball of fluff. At eleven o'clock we went ashore. The governor had kindly provided horses for all the party, and while they were being saddled I took some photographs. There are plenty of horses here, but the only saddles and bridles to be had are those used by the natives. The saddles are very cumbrous and clumsy to look at, though rather picturesque. They are formed of two bits of wood, covered with about a dozen sheepskins and ponchos, not at all uncomfortable to ride in, and very suitable for a night's bivouac in the open. Plenty of nice soft rugs to lie upon and cover yourself with instead of a hard English saddle for your bed and stirrups for blankets, as a native once said when asked which he preferred. About one o'clock we started, accompanied by the officers commanding the garrison and two attendant cavaliers, equipped in Chilean style, with enormous carved modern stirrups, heavy bits and spurs much bigger than those whose size struck us so much in the Argentine Republic. 
we had a pleasant ride first across a sandy plain and through one or two small rivers to a sawmill situated on the edge of an extensive forest through which we proceeded for some miles the road was a difficult one and our progress was but slow being often impeded by a morass or by the trunk of a tree which had fallen right across the path and was now rapidly rotting into touchwood under the influence of the damp atmosphere and incessant rain lichens of every colour and shape abounded and clothed the trunks gracefully contrasting with the tender spring tints of the leaves while the long hairy tillandsia like an old man's beard three or four feet long hung down from the topmost branches the ground was carpeted with moss interspersed with a few early spring flowers and the whole scene though utterly unlike that presented by any english forest had a strange weird beauty of its own not a sound could be heard not a bird beast or insect was to be seen the larger trees were principally a peculiar sort of beech and red cedar but all kinds of evergreens known to us at home as shrubs such as laurestine and various firs here attain the proportions of forest trees there is also a tree called winter's bark drymis wintiri the leaves and bark of which are hot and bitter and form an excellent substitute for quinine but the most striking objects were the evergreen berberis and mahonia and the darwinia the larger sort of which was covered with brilliant orange almost scarlet flowers which hung down in bunches of the shape and size of small outdoor grapes on our way back we took a sharp turn leading to the seashore to which the forest extends in places and rode along the beach towards the town it was low water or this would not have been possible and as it was we often had considerable difficulty in making our way between wood and water the day was bright and clear with a bitterly cold wind and occasional heavy showers of rain a fair average day for sandy point it is further west they say that the weather is so hopeless lieutenant byron in his terribly interesting account of the wreck of the wager says that one fine day in three months is the most that can be expected i wonder not without misgivings if we really shall encounter all the bad weather we not only read of but hear of from every one we meet though very anxious to see the celebrated straits i shall not be sorry when we are safely through and i trust that the passage may not occupy the whole of the three weeks which tom has been advised to allow for it we saw a few seabirds especially some steamer ducks so called from their peculiar mode of progression through the water they neither swim nor fly but use their wings like the paddles of a steamer with a great noise and splutter and go along very fast on reaching the plains we had an opportunity of testing the speed of our horses which warmed us up a little after our slow progress by the water's edge in the bitter wind we rode all round the stockades outside the town before dismounting but i saw nothing of special interest before the party broke up arrangements were made for us to go to-morrow to one of the government corrals to see the cattle lassoed and branded an operation which is always performed twice a year we reached the yacht again at half past five dr fenton came on board to dinner and from him we heard a great deal about the colony the patagonians or horse indians and the fuegians or canoe indians the former inhabit or rather roam over a vast tract of country they are almost constantly on horseback and their only shelter consists of toldos or tents made of the skins of the old guanacos stretched across a few poles they are tall and strong averaging six feet in height and are bulky in proportion but their size is nothing like so great as old travellers have represented both men and women wear a long flowing mantle of skins reaching from the waist to the ankle with a large loose piece hanging down one side ready to be thrown over their heads whenever necessary which is fastened by a large flat pin hammered out either from the rough silver or from a dollar this their sole garment has the effect of adding greatly in appearance to their height they never wash but daub their bodies with paint and grease especially the women their only weapons are knives and bolas the latter of which they throw with unerring precision during their visits to the sandy point settlement their arms are always taken from them for they are extremely quarrelsome particularly when drunk nobody has been able to ascertain that they possess any form of sacred belief or that they perform any religious ceremonies their food consists principally of the flesh of mares troops of which animals always accompany them on their excursions 
They also eat ostrich flesh, which is considered a great delicacy, as well as the fish the women catch and the bird's eggs they find. Vegetable food is almost unknown to them, and bread is never used, though they do sometimes purchase a little flour, rice, and a few biscuits on the occasion of their visits to the colony. The Fuegians, or canoe Indians as they are generally called, from their living so much on the water and having no settled habitations on shore, are a much smaller race of savages inhabiting Tierra del Fuego, literally land of fire, so called from the custom the inhabitants have of lighting fires on prominent points as signals of assembly. The English residents here invariably call it Fireland, a name I had never heard before and which rather puzzled me at first. Whenever it is observed that a ship is in distress or that shipwrecked mariners have been cast ashore, the signal fires appear as if by magic, and the natives flock together like vultures round a carcass. On the other hand, if all goes well, vessels often pass through the straits without seeing a single human being, the savages in their canoes lying concealed beneath the overhanging branches of trees on the shore. They are cannibals and are placed by Darwin in the lowest scale of humanity. An old author describes them as magpies and chatter, baboons and countenance, and imps and treachery. Those frequenting the eastern end of the straits wear, if they wear anything at all, a deerskin mantle descending to the waist. Those at the western end wear cloaks made from the skin of the sea otter, but most of them are quite naked. Their food is of the most meager description and consists mainly of shellfish, sea eggs, for which the women dive with much dexterity, and fish which they train their dogs to assist them in catching. These dogs are sent into the water at the entrance to a narrow creek or small bay, and they then bark and flounder about and drive the fish before them into shallow water, where they are caught. Bishop Sterling of the Falkland Islands has been cruising about these parts in a small schooner and visiting the natives for the last twelve years, and the governor here tells us that he has done much good in promoting their civilization while the hardships he has endured and the difficulties and dangers he has surmounted have required almost superhuman energy and fortitude on his part. The Fuegians, as far as is known, have no religion of their own. The Wilmington came in this morning. Her captain declares that as the Monk's Haven was not hove to, he never thought that there could be anything seriously amiss with her. His glass was not good enough to enable him to make out the Union Jack reversed or the signal of distress, which he therefore supposed to be merely the ship's number. It was satisfactory to hear this explanation, and as not only the interests of humanity, but his own, were involved, there is every reason to believe that his account of the transaction is perfectly true. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Sandy Point to Lota Bay. And far abroad the canvas wings extend, along the glassy plain the vessel glides, while azure radiance trembles on her sides. The lunar rays in long reflection gleam with silver deluging the fluid stream. Sunday, October 8th. At 6 a.m. we weighed anchor and proceeded on our voyage. At first there was not much to admire in the way of scenery, the shores being low and sandy with occasional patches of scrubby brushwood and a background of granite rocks and mountains. Soon after passing Port Famine, we saw the bold outline of Cape Froward, the southernmost point of South America stretching into the straits. It is a fine headland, and Tom ordered the engines to be stopped in order to enable Mr. Bingham to sketch and me to photograph both it and the splendid view back through the channel we had just traversed to the snowy range of mountains in the distance, crowned by Mount Sarmiento, not unlike the Matterhorn in appearance. At this point the weather generally changes, and I suppose we must look forward to living in Mackintoshes for some little time to come. In the afternoon, when in English Reach, where many vessels have been lost, great excitement was caused on board by the appearance of a canoe on our port bow. She was stealing out from the Barbara Channel, and as she appeared to be making direct for us, Tom ordered the engines to be slowed. Her occupants thereupon redoubled their efforts, 
and came paddling towards us shouting and making the most frantic gesticulations one man waving a skin round his head with an amount of energy that threatened to upset the canoe this frail craft upon a nearer inspection proved to be made only of rough planks rudely tied together with the sinews of animals in fact one of the party had to bail constantly in order to keep her afloat we flung them a rope and they came alongside shouting tobacco galleta biscuit a supply of which we threw down to them in exchange for the skins they had been waving whereupon the two men stripped themselves of the skin mantles they were wearing made of eight or ten sea otter skins sewed together with finer sinews than those used for the boat and handed them up clamoring for more tobacco which we gave them together with some beads and knives footnote these skins proved to be the very finest quality ever plucked and each separate skin was valued in england at from four pounds to five pounds End footnote. finally the woman influenced by this example parted with her sole garment in return for a little more tobacco some beads and some looking-glasses i had thrown into the canoe the party consisted of a man a woman and a lad and i think i never saw delight more strongly depicted than it was on the faces of the two latter when they handled for the first time in their lives probably some strings of blue red and green glass beads they had two rough pots made of bark in the boat which they also sold after which they reluctantly departed quite naked but very happy shouting and jabbering away in the most inarticulate language imaginable it was with great difficulty we could make them let go the rope when we went ahead and i was quite afraid they would be upset they were all fat and healthy looking and though not handsome their appearance was by no means repulsive the countenance of the woman especially wore quite a pleasing expression when lighted up with smiles at the sight of the beads and looking-glasses the bottom of their canoe was covered with branches amongst which the ashes of a recent fire were distinguishable their paddles were of the very roughest description consisting simply of split branches of trees with wider pieces tied on at one end with the sinews of birds or beasts steaming ahead past port gallant we had a glorious view over carlos the third island and thornton peaks until at about seven o'clock we anchored in the little harbour of borea bay this place is encircled by luxuriant vegetation overhanging the water and is set like a gem amid the granite rocks close at hand and the far distant snowy mountains our carpenter had prepared a board on which the name of the yacht and the date had been painted to be fixed on shore as a record of our visit and as soon as the anchor was down we all landed the gentlemen with their guns and the crew fully armed with pistols and rifles in case of accident the water was quite deep close to the shore and we had no difficulty in landing near a small waterfall to penetrate far inland however was not so easy owing to the denseness of the vegetation large trees had fallen and rotting where they lay under the influence of the human atmosphere had become the birthplace of thousands of other trees shrubs plants ferns mosses and lichens in fact in some places we might almost be said to be walking on the tops of the trees and first one and then another of the party found his feet suddenly slipping through into unknown depths below under these circumstances we were contented with a very short ramble and having filled our baskets with a varied collection of mosses and ferns we returned to the shore where we found many curious shells and some excellent mussels while we had been thus engaged the carpenter and some of the crew were employed in nailing up our board on a tree we had selected for the purpose it was in company with the names of many good ships a portion of which only were still legible many of the boards having fallen to the ground and become quite rotten near the beach we found the remains of a recent fire and in the course of the night the watch on deck which was doubled and well armed heard shouts and hoots proceeding from the neighbourhood of the shore towards morning too the fire was relighted from which it was evident that the natives were not far off though they did not actually put in an appearance I suppose they think there is a probability of making something out of us by fair means, and that, unlike a sealing schooner with only four or five hands on board, and no motive power but her sails, we are rather too formidable to attack. Monday, October ninth, We are indeed most fortunate in having another fine day. At 6 a.m. the anchor was weighed and we resumed our journey. 
It was very cold, but that was not to be wondered at, surrounded as we are on every side by magnificent snow-clad mountains and superb glaciers. First we passed Snowy Sound in Tierra del Fuego, at the head of which is an immense blue glacier. Then came Cape Notch, so called from its looking as if it had had a piece chopped out of it. Within a few yards of the surrounding glaciers and close to the sea, the vegetation is abundant and in many places semi-tropical, a fact which is due to the comparatively mild winters, the temperate summers, the moist climate, and the rich soil of these parts. Passing up English Reach, we now caught our first glimpse of the Pacific Ocean, between Camp Pillar on one side and Westminster Hall, Shell Bay, and Lecky Point on the other. Steering to the north and leaving these on our left hand, we issued from the Straits of Magellan and entered Smith's Channel, first passing Glacier Bay and Ice Sound, names which speak for themselves. Mount Joy, Mount Burney, with its round snow-covered summit rising 6,000 feet from the water and several unnamed peaks, were gradually left behind, until at last, after threading a labyrinth of small islands, we anchored for the night in Otter Bay, a snug little cove, at the entrance to the intricacies of the main channel. It was almost dark when we arrived, but the children, Captain Brown, and I went on shore for a short time and gathered a few ferns and mosses. We also found the embers of a fire, which showed that the natives were not far off, and we therefore thought it prudent to hurry on board again before nightfall. No names of ships were to be seen, but in our search for ferns we may possibly have overlooked them. We have not come across any Fuegians today, though in two of the places we have passed, Shell Bay and Deep Harbor, where a few wigwams are left standing as a sort of headquarters, they are generally to be met with. During the night the watch again heard the natives shouting, but no attempt was made to relight the fire we had noticed, until we were steaming out of the bay the next morning. Tuesday, October 10th. In the early morning, when we resumed our voyage, the weather was still fine, but a few light clouds were here and there visible, and an icy wind, sweeping down from the mountains, made it appear very cold, though the thermometer, which averages, I think, 40 degrees to 50 degrees all the year round, was not really low. The line of perpetual snow commences here at an elevation of from 2,500 to 3,500 feet only, which adds greatly to the beauty of the scene, and, as it is now early spring, the snow is still unmelted, 500 feet and even less from the shore. The stupendous glaciers run right down into the sea, and immense masses of ice, sometimes larger than a ship, are continually breaking off with a noise like thunder and falling into the water, sending huge waves across to the opposite shore, and sometimes completely blocking up the channels. Some of these glaciers, composed entirely of blue and green ice and the purest snow, are fifteen and twenty miles in length. They are by far the finest we have any of us ever seen, and even those of Norway and Switzerland sink into comparative insignificance beside them. The mountains here are not so high as those of Europe, but they really appear more lofty, as their entire surface from the water's edge to the extreme summit is clearly visible. At this end of the straits they terminate in peaks resembling Gothic spires, carved in the purest snow, truly virgin peaks on which the eye of man has but seldom rested and which his foot has never touched. They are generally veiled in clouds of snow, mist, and driving rain, and it is quite the exception to see them as distinctly as we now do. After leaving Maine's Channel and passing through Union and Collingwood Sounds, we found ourselves beneath the shadow of the splendid Cordilleras of Sarmiento, quite distinct from Mount Sarmiento, already referred to, along the foot of which extended the largest glacier we have yet seen. Footnote. I should explain that the names of places in these straits frequently occur in duplicate and even triplicate, which is rather confusing. End footnote. With Tarleton Pass on our right hand and Childers Pass on the left, we came in sight of Owens Island, one extremity of which is called Main Head and the other Cape Brassy, these places having all been so named by Captain Maine during his survey in the Nassau in 1869. Near the island of Esperanza, the clouds having by that time completely cleared away and the sun shining brightly, we had a splendid view of another range of snowy mountains, with Stokes Monument towering high in their midst. 
the numerous floating icebergs added greatly to the exquisite beauty of the scene some loomed high as mountains while others had melted into the most fanciful and fairy-like shapes huge swans full-rigged ships schooners under full sail and a hundred other fantastic forms and devices the children were in ecstasies at the sight of them as we gradually opened out our anchorage puerto bueno we found a steamer already lying there which proved to be the dacia telegraph ship just in from the pacific coast having dropped our anchor at about five p m we all went on shore armed as before some of the gentlemen hoping to find a stray duck or two at a fresh-water lake a little way inland we met several of the officers of the dacia who being the first comers did the honours of the place and told us all they knew about it the vegetation was as luxuriant and beautiful as usual in fact rather more so for we are now advancing northwards at the rate of about a hundred miles a day there were no ducks in the lake but we enjoyed the scramble alongside it to the point where it falls over some rocks into the sea the gig was drawn under this waterfall and having been loaded to her thwarts with about three tons and a half of excellent water she was then towed off to the yacht where the water was emptied into our tanks which were thus filled to the brim a small iceberg also towed alongside afforded us a supply of ice and we were thus cheaply provided with a portion of the requisite supplies for our voyage the dacia had an iceberg half as big as herself lying alongside her and all hands were at work until late at night aided by the light of lanterns and torches chopping the ice up and stowing it away our boat being thus engaged we were obliged to wait on shore until long past dark but as we were a large and strong party it did not much matter our men amused themselves by collecting a number of large and excellent mussels some of which distinguishable by the peculiar appearance of their shells arising from a diseased condition of the fish contained from ten to thirty very small seed pearls the captain of the dacia came to dinner and the officers in the evening and they gave us much valuable information about the anchorages further up the straits and many other things the captain kindly gave tom all his chilean charts of the darien channel which has not yet been fully surveyed by the english government though the nassau passed through in eighteen sixty nine wednesday october eleventh i never in my life saw anything so beautiful as the view when i came on deck this morning at a quarter to five the moon was shining large and golden high in the heavens the rosy streaks of dawn were just tinging the virgin snow on the highest peaks with faint but ever-deepening colour whilst all around the foliage rocks and icebergs were still wrapped in the deepest shade as the sun rose the pink summits of the mountains changed to gold and yellow and then to dazzling white as the light crept down into the valleys illuminating all the dark places and bringing out the shades of olive greens greys and purples in the most wonderful contrasts and combinations of colour the grandeur of the scene increased with every revolution of the screw and when fairly in the guia narrows we were able to stop and admire it a little more at our leisure mr bingham making some sketches while i took some photographs to describe the prospect in detail is quite impossible imagine the grandest alpine scene you ever saw with tall snowy peaks and pinnacles rising from huge domed tops and vast fields of unbroken snow glaciers running down into the sea at the heads of the various bays each bank and promontory richly clothed with vegetation of every shade of green bold rocks and noble cliffs covered with many hued lichens the floating icebergs the narrow channel itself blue as the sky above dotted with small islands each a mass of verdure and reflecting on its glassy surface every object with such distinctness that it was difficult to say where the reality ended and the image began i have seen a photograph of the mirror lake in california which as far as i know is the only thing that could possibly give one an idea of the marvellous effect of these reflections unfit bay on chatham island looking towards the mountains near pill channel and ladder hill which looks as if a flight of steps had been cut upon its face were perhaps two of the most striking points amid all this loveliness all too soon came the inevitable order to steam ahead and once more resuming our course we passed through innocence and conception channels and entered wide channel which is frequently blocked up with ice at this time of year 
though today we only met with a few icebergs on their way down from Eyre Sound. I have already referred to the extraordinary shapes assumed by some of the mountain peaks. That appropriately called Singular Peak on Chatham Island, and Two Peak Mountain and Cathedral Mountain, both on Wellington Island, specially attracted our attention today. The first named presents a wonderful appearance from whichever side you view it. The second reminds one of the beautiful double spires at Tours, while the last resembles the tapering spire of a cathedral, rising from a long roof, covered with delicate towers, fretwork, and angles. In wide channel, we felt really compelled to stop again to admire some of the unnamed mountains. One we christened Spire Mountain, to distinguish it from the rest. It consisted of a single needle-like point, piercing deep into the blue vault of heaven, and surrounded by a cluster of less lofty, but equally sharp, pinnacles. This group rose from a vast chain of exquisitely tinted snow peaks that looked almost as if they rested on the vast glacier beneath, seamed with dark blue and green crevasses and fissures. All this time the weather continued perfect. Not a cloud was to be seen, the sun was hot and bright, and the sky was blue enough to rival that of classic Italy. If we could but be sure that this delightful state of things would continue, how pleasant it would be, to stop and explore some of these places. We have, however, been so frequently warned of the possibility of detention for days and even weeks at anchor, owing to bad weather, that we are hurrying on as fast as we can, expecting that every day will bring the much-dreaded deluge, gale, or fog. In thick weather, it is simply impossible to proceed, and if it comes on suddenly, as it generally does, and finds you far from an anchorage, there is nothing to be done but to heave to and wait till it clears, sending a party ashore, if possible, to light a fire, to serve as a landmark, and so enable you to maintain your position. How thankful I am that we have been hitherto able to make the passage under such favorable circumstances. It has been a vision of beauty and variety, the recollection of which can never be effaced. Europe Inlet, on our right, going up wide channel, was full of ice. Husband's Inlet looked as if it was frozen over at the farther end, and Penguin Inlet seemed quite choked up with huge hummocks and blocks of ice. Tom therefore decided not to attempt the passage of Icy Reach, for fear of being stopped, but to go round Salmora's Island to Port Grappler by way of Tasm Reach, rather a longer route. It was a happy decision, for nothing could exceed the weird, impressive splendor of this portion of the Straits. We were passing through a deep, gloomy mountain gorge, with high perpendicular cliffs on either side. Below, all was wrapped in the deepest shade. Far above, the sun gilded the snowy peaks and many tinted foliage with his departing light that slowly turned to rose color ere the shades of evening crept over all, and the stars began to peep out one by one. We could trace from the summit to the base of a lofty mountain the course of a stupendous avalanche which had recently rushed down into the sea, crushing and destroying everything in its way and leaving a broad track of desolation behind it. It must for a time have completely filled up the narrow channel, and woe to any unfortunate vessel that might happen to be there at such a moment. Port Grappler is rather a difficult place to make in the dark, but Tom managed it with much dexterity, and by eight o'clock we were safely anchored for the night. We all wanted Tom to stay here tomorrow to get some rest, which he much needs, but he has determined to start at five o'clock in the morning as usual, for fear of being caught by bad weather. Even I, who have, of course, had no anxiety as to the navigation, felt so fatigued from having been on the bridge the whole day since very early this morning that I went straight to bed before dinner in order to be ready for tomorrow. Thursday, October 12th. A day as perfect as yesterday succeeded a clear, cold night. We weighed anchor at 5.15 a.m. and, retracing our course for a few miles, passed round the end of Samara's Island and entered the narrow channel leading to Indian Reach. The greatest care is here necessary to avoid several sunken rocks which have already proved fatal to many ships, a large German steamer having been wrecked as recently as last year. The smooth but treacherous surface of the channel reflected sharply the cliffs and foliage, and its mirror-like stillness was only broken at rare intervals by the sudden appearance of a seal in search of a fresh supply of air, or by the efforts delayed until the very last moment of a few steamer ducks 
gannets, or cormorants, to get out of our way. Having accomplished the passage of Indian Reach in safety, we were just passing Eden Harbor when the cry of, Canoe ahead, was raised. A boat was seen paddling out towards us from behind Morton Island, containing about half a dozen people, apparently armed with bows and arrows and spears, and provided with fishing rods, which projected on either side. One man was standing up and waving, in a very excited manner, something which turned out ultimately to be a piece of cotton waste. Our engines having been stopped, the canoe came alongside, and we beheld six wild-looking half-naked creatures, two men, three women, and a very small boy, who was crouching over a fire at the bottom of the boat. There were also four sharp, cheery-looking little dogs, rather like Eskimo dogs, only smaller, with prick ears and curly tails, who were looking over the side and barking vigorously in response to the salutations of our pugs. One man had on a square robe of sea otter skins, thrown over his shoulders and laced together in front. Two of the women wore sheepskins, and the rest of the party were absolutely naked. Their black hair was long and shaggy, and they all clamored loudly in harsh, guttural tones, accompanied by violent gesticulations for tobacco and galleta. We got some ready for them, and also some beads, knives, and looking-glasses, but through some mistake they did not manage to get hold of our rope in time, and as our way carried us ahead they were left behind. The passage was narrow and the current strong, and Tom was anxious to save the tide in the dangerous English narrows. We could not, therefore, give them another chance of communicating with us, and accordingly we went on our way, followed by what were, I have no doubt, the curses, not only deep but loud, of the whole party, who indulged at the same time in the most furious and threatening gestures. I was quite sorry for their disappointment at losing their hoped-for luxuries, to say nothing of our own at missing the opportunity of bargaining for some more furs and curiosities. Shortly afterwards, there were seen from the masthead crowds of natives among the trees armed with long spears, bows, and arrows, busily engaged pushing off their canoes from their hiding places in creeks and hollows. So perhaps it was just as well we did not stop, or we might have been surrounded. Not far from here are the English Narrows, a passage which is a ticklish but interesting piece of navigation. A strong current prevails, and to avoid a shoal, it is necessary at one point to steer so close to the western shore that the bowsprit almost projects over the land, the branches of the trees almost sweep the rigging, and the rocks almost scrape the side of the vessel. Two men were placed at the wheel as a matter of precaution, and we appeared to be steering straight for the shore at full speed, till Tom suddenly gave the order, Hard a port! And the sunbeam instantly flew round and rushed swiftly past the dangerous spot into wider waters. It is just here that Captain Trevette was knocked off the bridge of his vessel by the bows, a mishap he warned Tom against before we left England. Whilst in the narrows we looked back, to see everything bright and cheerful, but ahead all was black and dismal. The sky and sun were obscured, the tops of the mountains hidden, and the valleys filled up with thick fog and clouds, all which seemed to indicate the approach of a storm of rain, although the glass was still very high. We went up South Reach and North Reach in the Messier Channel, till, just as we were off Liberta Bay, in latitude 48 degrees 50 seconds south, longitude 74 degrees 25 seconds west, the blackest of the black clouds came suddenly down upon us and descended upon the deck in a tremendous shower, not of rain, but of dust and ashes. Windows, hatches, and doors were shut as soon as we discovered the nature of the strange visitation, and in about half an hour we were through the worst of it whereupon dustpans, brooms, and dusters came into great requisition. It took us completely by surprise, for we had no reason to expect anything of the sort. Assuming the dust to be of volcanic origin, it must have traveled an immense distance, the nearest volcano, as far as we know, being that of Corcovado, in the island of Chilo, nearly 300 miles off. We had heard from Sir Woodbine Parish and others at Buenos Aires of the terrible blinding dust storms which occur there, causing utter darkness for a space of ten or fifteen minutes. But Buenos Aires is on the edge of a river, with hundreds and thousands of leagues of sandy plains behind it, the soil of which is only kept together by the roots of the wiry pampas grass. For this dust to reach the Messier Channel, where we now are, 
it would have to surmount two chains of snowy mountains six or seven thousand feet in height and in many places hundreds of miles in width and traverse a vast extent of country besides the weather was still so fine and the barometer so high thirty point five two inches that tom determined to go to sea to-day instead of stopping at hale cove for the night as we had originally intended directly we got through the english narrows therefore all hands were busily engaged in once more sending up the square yards top masts etc and in making ready for sea just before sunset as we were quitting the narrow channels the sun pierced through the clouds and lightened up the lonely landscape as well as the broad waters of the pacific ocean its surface was scarcely rippled by the gentle breeze that wafted us on our course the light of the setting sun rested in soft and varied tints on the fast-fading mountains and peaks and thus under the most favourable and encouraging circumstances we have fairly entered upon a new and important section of our long voyage although perhaps i ought not to say so i cannot help admiring the manner in which tom has piloted his yacht through the straits for it would do credit not only to any amateur but to a professional seaman he has never hesitated or been at a loss for a moment however intricate the part or complicated the directions but having thoroughly studied and mastered the subject beforehand he has been able to go steadily on at full speed the whole way it has however been very fatiguing work for him as he hardly ever left the bridge whilst we were under way we steamed the whole distance from cape virgins to the gulf of peñas six hundred fifty nine knots in seventy six hours anchoring six times this gives seven days steaming of an average length of eleven hours each and as we stopped two or three hours at different times for fuegians photographs and sketches our average speed was nine and a half knots though sometimes when going with strong currents it was twelve or fourteen and when going against them barely six knots just at dark we passed between wager island and cheap channel where h m s wager commanded by captain cheap was wrecked and we spent the night in the gulf of peñas almost becalmed friday october thirteenth we ceased steaming at seven thirty a m and made every effort throughout the rest of the day by endless changes of sail to catch each fleeting breath of wind we did not however make much progress owing to the extreme lightness of the breeze sorry as we are to lose the scenery of the straits it is pleasant to find the weather getting gradually warmer day by day and to be able to regard the morning bath once more as a luxury instead of a terror the change is also thoroughly appreciated by the various animals we have on board especially the monkeys and parrots who may now be seen sunning themselves in every warm corner of the deck in the straits though the sun was hot there was always an icy feeling in the wind owing to the presence of enormous masses of snow and ice on every side saturday october fourteenth light winds and calms prevailed the whole day about two p m we were off the island of socorro in the afternoon a large shoal of whales came round the yacht i was below when they first made their appearance and when i came on deck they were spouting up great jets of water in all directions suggestive of the fountains at the crystal palace we were lying so still that they did not seem to be in the least afraid of us and came quite close swimming alongside round us across our bows and even diving down under our keel there was a shoal of small fish about and the whales most of which were about fifty or sixty feet in length constantly opened their huge pink whalebone fringed mouths so wide that we could see right down their capacious throats the children were especially delighted with this performance and baby has learned quite a new trick when asked what do the whales do she opens her mouth as wide as she can stretches out her arms to their fullest extent then blows and finishes up with a look round for applause soon after eight p m the wind completely died away and fearing further detention we once more got up steam sunday october fifteenth still calm we had the litany and hymns at eleven a m prayers and hymns and a sermon at five p m in the course of the afternoon we were again surrounded by a shoal of whales we passed the island of chilo to-day where it always rains and where the vegetation is proportionately dense and luxuriant it is inhabited by a tribe of peculiarly gentle indians 
who till the ground and who are said to be kind to strangers thrown amongst them. Darwin and Byron speak well of the island and its inhabitants, who are probably more civilized since their time, for a steamer now runs regularly once a week from Valparaiso to San Carlos and back for garden produce. The potato is indigenous to the island. Tuesday, October 17th. At 6 a.m., there being still no wind, Tom, in despair of ever reaching our destination under sail alone, again ordered steam to be raised. Two hours later, a nice sailing breeze sprang up, but we had been so often disappointed that we determined to continue steaming. Just before sunset, we saw the island of Mocha in the distance. It is said to have been inhabited at one time by herds of wild horses and hogs, but I think they have now become extinct. One of our principal amusements during the calm weather has been to fish for cape pigeons, cape hens, gulls, and albatrosses, with a hook and line. We have caught a good many in this way, and several entangled themselves in the threads left floating for the purpose over the stern. The cape pigeons were so tame that they came almost on board, and numbers of them were caught in butterfly nets. Their plumage is not unlike greb, and I mean to have some muffs and trimmings for the children made out of it. Alan, the coxswain of the gig, skins them very well, having had some lessons from Ward before we left England. I want very much to catch an albatross in order to have it skinned and to make tobacco pouches of its feet and pipe stems of the wing bones for presents. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Chile. Sunbeam of summer, O oh what is like thee? Hope of the wilderness, joy of the sea. Wednesday, October 18th. At 3.30 a.m. we were close to the land lying south of the Bay of Lota. At 4 a.m. the engines were stopped on account of the mist, and at 6 a.m. we began to go slowly ahead again, though it was still not very easy to make out the distance and bearing of the coast. The passage into the bay between the island of Santa Maria and Lavapie Point is narrow and difficult, and abounds with sunken rocks and other hidden dangers not yet fully surveyed. Tom said it was the most arduous piece of navigation he ever undertook on a misty morning, but happily he accomplished it successfully. Just as he entered, the sun broke through the mist, displaying a beautiful bay, surrounded on three sides by well-wooded hills and sheltered from all winds except the north. One corner is completely occupied by the huge establishment belonging to Madame Cusinho, consisting of coal mines, enormous smelting works, and extensive potteries. The hill just at the back is completely bare of vegetation, which has all been poisoned by the sulphurous vapors from the furnaces. This spot, from its contiguity to the works, has been selected as the site of a village for the accommodation of the numerous laborers and their families. It is therefore to be hoped that sulphur fumes are not as injurious to animal as they evidently are to vegetable life. As we drew nearer to the shore, we could distinguish Madame Cusinho's house, in the midst of a park on the summit of a hill, and surrounded on all sides by beautiful gardens. Every prominent point had a little summer house perched upon it, and some of the trees had circular seats built round their trunks halfway up, approached by spiral staircases, and thatched like wigwams. The general aspect of the coast which is a combination of rich red earth, granite cliffs, and trees to the water's edge, is very like that of Cornwall and Devonshire. We had scarcely dropped our anchor before the captain of the port came on board and told us we were too far from the shore to coal, which was our special object in coming here. So up went the anchor again, and we steamed a few hundred yards further in, and then let go close to the shore in deep water. Captain Mahler waited to go ashore with us, introduced our steward to the butcher and postmaster of the place, and then accompanied us to Madame Cusinho's gardens. It was a steep climb up the hill, but we were well rewarded for our labor. Tended by over a hundred men, whose efforts are directed 
by highly paid and thoroughly experienced Scotch gardeners, these grounds contain a collection of plants from all the four quarters of the globe, and from New Zealand, Polynesia, and Australia. Amid them were scattered all kinds of fantastic grottoes, fountains, statues, and ferneries, flights of steps leading downwards to the beach and upwards to sylvan nooks, arcades arched over with bamboos and containing trellis work from Derbyshire, and Minton tiles from Staffordshire, seats of all sorts and shapes, under trees, in trees, and over trees, besides summer houses and pagodas, at every corner where there was a pretty view over land or sea. One of the heads of the establishment, a great friend of Madame Cousinho's, was unfortunately very ill, and as she was nursing him, she could not come out to see us, but she kindly gave orders to her gardener to send some cut flowers and some ferns on board the yacht to decorate the saloon, and as she was unable to invite us to luncheon at the big house, she sent some champagne and refreshments down to the Casa de la Administración, where we were most hospitably entertained. She has had the latter place comfortably fitted up for the use of the principal employés on the works, and has provided it with a billiard table, a very fair library, and several spare bedrooms for the accommodation of visitors. After luncheon, we went to see the copper smelting works, which were very interesting. The manager walked through with us and explained the processes very clearly. He could tell at once, on taking up a piece of rough ore fresh from the mine, what percentage of copper or iron it contained, the amount varying from 10 to 75 percent of the gross weight. The furnaces are kept burning night and day and are worked by three gangs of men, and the quantity of copper produced annually is enormous. In fact, three parts of the copper used in Europe comes from here. The ore is brought from various parts of Chile and Peru, generally in Madame Cosinio's ships, and coal is found in such abundance and so near the surface that the operation of smelting is a profitable one. Our afternoon, spent amid smoke and heat and dirt and half-naked workmen, manipulating with dexterous skill the glowing streams of molten ore, was a great contrast to our morning ramble. Having seen the works and received a curious and interesting collection of copper ore as a remembrance of our visit, we started in a little car, lined with crimson cloth and drawn by a locomotive, to visit the various coal mines. First we went through the park, and then along a valley near the sea, full of wild flowers and ferns, and trees festooned with capigay, the Chilean name for a creeper, which is a specialty of this country, and which imparts a character of its own to the landscape during the month of May, when its wreaths of scarlet, cherry, or pink flowers are in full bloom. We went to the mouths of three coal pits and looked down into their grimy depths, but did not descend as it would have occupied too much time. They are mostly about 1,000 yards in depth and extend for some distance under the sea. We next visited a point of land whence we could see an island, which closely resembles St. Michael's Mount. It is quite uninhabited except by a few wild goats and rabbits. The seashore is lined with trees to the water's edge, and there are many bold rocks and fine white sandy caves in different parts of it. Some boats were drawn up high and dry on the beach, along which several picturesque-looking groups of shellfish collectors were scattered. The mussels that are found here are enormous, from five to eight inches in length, and they, together with cockles and limpets, form a staple article of food. A steam launch had been sent to meet us, but it could not get near enough to the shore for us to embark. A rickety, leaky, small boat, half full of water, was therefore, after some delay, procured, and in this we were sculled out, two by two, till the whole party were safely on board. Outside there was quite a swell, and a north wind and rain are prophesied for tomorrow. Mr. McKay returned with us to the yacht and stayed to dinner. Before he left, the prognostications of bad weather were to some extent justified, for the wind changed, and rain the first we have felt for some time, began to fall. Thursday, October 19th. We have been persuaded by our friends here to try and see a little more of the interior of Chile than we should do if we were to carry out our original intention of going on to Valparaiso in the yacht and then merely making an excursion to Santiago from that place. We have therefore arranged to proceed at once overland to Santiago, 
by a route which will enable us to see something of the cordillera of the andes to have a peep at the araucanian indians on the frontier and to visit the baths of calcanus tom however does not like to leave the yacht and has decided to take her up to valparaiso and then come on to santiago and meet us in about five or six days time the anchor was accordingly hove short and the mizzen hoisted when we landed this morning in a drenching rain a coach runs daily from lota to concepcion the first stage of our journey but a special vehicle was engaged for our accommodation and a curious affair it was to look at it seemed to be simply a huge wooden box suspended by means of thick leather straps from sea springs without windows or doors but provided with two long narrow openings through which you squeezed yourself in or out and which could be closed at pleasure by roll-up leather blinds inside it was roomy well padded and comfortable the rain had made the road terribly greasy and several times the carriage slewed halfway round and slid four or five feet sideways down the hill causing us to hold on in expectation of a spill at last we reached the bottom in safety and crossing a small river emerged upon the seashore at playa negra or black beach along which we drove for some distance through the deep loose sand the horses being up to their fetlocks in water most of the time then we forded another little river and leaving the beach proceeded up a steep road not more than three yards wide with a ditch on one side and a steep precipice on the other to the little village of coronel overlooking the bay of the same name while the horses were being changed we walked down to the little wooden pier on the seashore and saw the sunbeam just coming out of lota bay drawn up by the side of the pier was a picturesque-looking market-boat full of many sorts of vegetables and little piles of sea eggs with their spines removed and neatly tied up with rushes in parcels of three the people seemed to enjoy them raw in which state they are considered to be most nutritious and when roasted in their shells or made into omelettes they are a favorite article of food with all classes coronel is a great coaling station and the bay which is surrounded by tall chimneys shafts and piers connected with the mines was full of steamers and colliers our road now ran for some time through undulating pasture land in which were many large trees the scene resembling a vast park masses of scarlet verbena yellow calceolaria and white heath grew on all sides while the numerous myrtle mimosa and other bushes were entwined with orange-coloured nasturiums and a little scarlet tropalum with a blue edge whose name i forget beneath the trees the ground was thickly carpeted with adiantum fern the road over which we travelled was of the worst description and our luncheon was eaten with no small difficulty but with a considerable amount of merriment once when we jolted into an unusually big hole the whole of our provisions basket and all made a sudden plunge towards one side of the coach and very nearly escaped us altogether half way between coronel and concepcion we met the return stage coach crowded with passengers and looking as if it had just come out of the south kensington museum or madame tussauds or like the pictures of a coach of queen elizabeth's time it was a long low vehicle with unglazed windows all round it painted bright scarlet decorated with brilliant devices on every panel and suspended like our own by means of innumerable leather straps from huge sea springs the seats on either side held three passengers and there was a stool in the middle like the one in the lord mayor's coach on which four people sat back to basque soon after we drew up to rest the horses at a little posada kept by two germans called halfway house and seven miles more brought us to a rich and well-cultivated farm belonging to mr herman where we stopped to change horses it was six o'clock in the evening when we reached the bio bio a wide shallow river at the entrance of the town of concepcion it had to be crossed in a ferry-boat carriage and all and as it was after hours we had some difficulty in finding any one to take us over at last in consideration of a little extra pay six men consented to undertake the job and having set a square sail to keep us from being carried down the river by the current they punted us over with long poles sometimes there was nine feet of water beneath us but oftener not more than four or five the boat could not get close to the opposite shore and it was a great business to get the carriage out and the horses harnessed in some eighteen inches of water 
First the carriage stuck in the sand, and then the horses refused to move, but after a great deal of splashing and an immense display of energy in the way of pulling, jerking, shrieking, shouting, and, I am afraid, swearing, we reached the bank, emerged from the water, struggled through some boggy ground, and were taken at full gallop through the streets of the town, until we reached the Hotel Comercio, where we found comfortable rooms and a nice little dinner awaiting us. This was all very well as far as it went, but when we came to inquire about our onward route, we were disappointed to learn that the line to Angol was closed, owing to the breaking down of a bridge, and would remain so until next month, and that, with the exception of a contractor's train, which runs only once a week, there was nothing by which we could travel. "'Tomorrow is Friday,' added Monsieur Letelier, "'and that is so near Monday. What can Madame do better than wait here till then?' By way of consolation, he informed us that there were no Indians now at Angle, as the Araucanian Indians had recently all been driven further back from the frontier by the Chilenos, but that, if we were still bent on trying to get there, we could go by boat as far as Nacimiento, where we might with some difficulty procure a carriage. The river just now, however, is so low that the boat frequently gets aground and remains for two or three days. Therefore, taking everything into consideration, we have decided to abandon this part of our program, for otherwise we shall not reach Santiago in time. In any case, the journey will be a much longer one than we expected. Footnote. I have lately received a letter from a friend in Paris who says, Strange to tell, it is only a few days ago that poor Aurelie Antoine I, ex-king of Araucania, died at Bordeaux in a hospital. He reigned for some years and then made war upon Chile, which gave him a warm reception, even captured his majesty and sent him back to his native land. I met him here a few years ago, surrounded by a small court, which treated him with great deference. I found him a dignified, intelligent sovereign. He attempted to return to his kingdom, but was captured on the high seas by a Brazilian cruiser and sent back to France to die a miserable death. End footnote. Friday, October 20th. We went out for a short stroll round the plaza before breakfast, which meal was scarcely over when Mr. Mackay arrived in a carriage and took us off to see what there was to see in the town. The plaza was full of bright-looking flower beds, in which were superb roses and many English flowers, shaded by oranges, pomegranates, and doitsias. Each plot belongs to one of the principal families in the town, and great emulation is displayed as to whose little garden shall be in the best order and contain the finest collection of plants and flowers. Concepcion has suffered and still suffers much from earthquakes. The existing town is only 35 years old. The houses are all one story high only, and the streets, or rather roads between them, are wide in order to afford the inhabitants a chance of escape should their dwellings be thrown down by a sudden shock. In summer, everybody rushes out into the street, no matter what hour of the day or night it may be, as soon as the first symptoms of an earthquake are felt. But during the winter, when the shocks are not so severe, the alarm caused is not so great. The old town was about two miles distant from the present site, near a place now called Pinko, but after being demolished in the ordinary way, an immense wave rolled up and completely destroyed all traces of its existence. We drove out to Puchakai, Mr. McKay's hacienda, a pretty little thatched cottage surrounded by a veranda in the midst of a garden, where laburnums and lilacs bloom side by side with orange trees and pomegranates. Round the garden are groves of shady English oaks, the first we have seen since leaving home, and Norfolk Island pines, the effect of the whole scene being strangely suggestive of the idea that a charming little bit of English rural scenery has in some mysterious manner been transported to this out-of-the-way spot in Chile. The interior of the house, which is simply but tastefully furnished, and at the time of our visit was full of fresh flowers, arranged with an artistic eye to color, bears the same indescribable home-like air. We were kindly received and regaled with luncheon, including, amongst other good things, fried pejere, king of fish, deservedly so called. In the afternoon, we strolled about the garden and looked at the farm and stable, and were shown the probable winner of one of the prizes at the forthcoming race meeting. In the cottages on the estate, some specimens of mignonique lace were offered to us, 
a lace made by most of the peasants in this part of the country. It varies considerably in quality, from the coarse kind used for covering furniture, to the finest description used for personal adornment. It is very cheap, wears forever, and strongly resembles the torchon lace now so fashionable in Paris and London for trimming petticoats and children's frocks. The women also spin, dye, and weave the wool from the fleece of their own sheep into the bright-colored ponchos universally worn, winter and summer, by the men in this country. These ponchos are not made of nearly such good material as those used in the Argentine Republic, but they are considerably gayer and more picturesque in appearance. After dinner there was nothing to do except to stroll about the town and buy photographs. They are extremely good in Chile, both views and portraits, but proportionately dear, the price being double what would be charged in London or Paris for the same thing. Saturday, October 21st. Having wished good-bye to Mr. McKay and taken our seats on the train for Linares, we were now fairly launched on our own resources in a strange country, I being the only one of the party who could speak even a little Spanish. At San Romda we stopped half an hour to allow the train from Chilean to pass. Most of the passengers took the opportunity of breakfasting, but as we were not hungry we occupied the time in having a chat with the engine driver, a very intelligent Canadian. He told us that, as it happened, we might have gone to Angol today after all, as a special car and engine were going there to take a doctor to see a patient, returning early tomorrow morning. The railroad runs alongside the Bio Bio all the way to San Romde. On either bank are low wooded hills on whose sides vines are cultivated in considerable quantities. The wildflowers grow luxuriantly everywhere, calceolarias especially, in huge bushes of golden bloom, two or three feet high. At San Romda we left the river and traveled through a pretty and well-cultivated country to Chilean, which derives its name from an Indian word, signifying saddle of the sun, and is so called from the fact that the sun shines upon it through a saddle-shaped pass in the chain of the Andes. Like Concepcion, the existing town has been recently built at a distance of about a mile from the remains of the old place of the same name, which was overthrown by an earthquake about thirty years ago. The destruction was, however, not so complete as in the case of Concepcion, and some few of the better-conditioned houses are still inhabited by very poor people, though the walls have great cracks in them from top to bottom, and they are otherwise in a deplorable state. A large cattle and horse market is held at Chilean every Saturday, and it is said that, on these occasions, $100,000 frequently change hands in the course of the morning in the open marketplace. All the business of the day was over by the time we got there, and there was nothing to be seen but a few stray beasts and quaint bullock carts, and some peasants selling refreshments, menyake lace, and other trifles. In several of the old-fashioned shops on the plaza there were curious-looking stirrups, bits, spurs, and other horse gear, all made of solid silver, roughly worked by the Indians themselves. Having had our baths, we returned to the hotel, where we found dinner laid out in my bedroom, which happened to be the largest for our host did not approve of our dining at the table d'hote, as we should have preferred to do. He gave us an excellent dinner, with good wine, and attended to us most assiduously himself. While the gentlemen were smoking, I went to see a poor engine driver who had met with a bad accident, and who was lying at this hotel. He is a fine, healthy-looking Englishman, and he told me that, until this misfortune, he had never known a day's illness in his life. It seems that, at four o'clock in the afternoon of this day week, he was sent off with a special engine to convey an important message. Something going wrong during the journey, he slackened speed, and, in stepping off the engine to see what was the matter, his foot slipped and the wheel of the tender went over it. He had no one with him who could manage the engine alone, so he was obliged to get up again and endeavor to struggle on to Talca, but after going a few miles further, the engine suddenly ran off the track at a part of the unfinished line that had not yet been sufficiently ballasted. They could not get it on again unaided, and one of the men had to start off and walk many miles before he could procure assistance. Altogether, poor Clark underwent forty-two hours of intense agony from the time of the accident until he received any medical attention. 
In spite of this, he is now doing well, and though the foot, which is in a bath of carbolic acid and water, looks very bad, he is in great spirits, because the three local doctors in consultation have decided that amputation will not be necessary. He spoke in the highest terms of the kindness of our French host and his Spanish wife, the latter of whom, he says, has nursed him like a mother. He certainly has the one large room in the house, and when I saw him, his bed was comfortably made and arranged, flowers and fruit were on a table by his side, and everything looked as neat and snug as possible. It was a treat to him to see someone fresh from the old country, and to hear all the news, and our voyage appeared to interest him greatly. While I was with him, one of his friends came in, who remembered me quite well, and who knew one or two people with whom we are acquainted, including the manager of Messier's Boudler and Schaefer's Yard, where the sunbeam was built. Sunday, October 22nd. Though it was Sunday, we had no choice but to travel on, or we should not have been able to start until Tuesday. We were therefore up at five o'clock, and at the station before seven. From San Carlos, where we arrived at 8.15 a.m., we started for Linares, which was reached a couple of hours later. It is a much smaller town than Chilean, but is built on exactly the same plan. Plaza, cathedral, and all. Today the streets were crowded with men on horseback who had brought their wives in, seated pillion fashion on the crupper behind them, to attend mass. Our road lay through a rich country, intersected by small rivers, with a distant snowy chain of the Andes as a background, and through thickly planted groves of poplars growing in long shady avenues, fragrant with perfume from the magnificent roses which blossomed beneath their shade. In the course of our four hours' drive, we crossed a great many streams, in some of which the water was deep enough to come in at the bottom of the carriage, and cause us to tuck ourselves up on the seats. There was always a little pleasing excitement and doubt as we approached one of these rivulets, as to whether we were to be inundated or not. We met a good many people riding and walking about in their holiday clothes, and at all the cabarets groups of talkers, drinkers, and players were assembled. The cottages we have seen by the roadside have been picturesque, but wretched-looking edifices, generally composed of the branches of trees stuck in the ground, plastered with mud, and thatched with reeds. Two outhouses, or arbors, consisting of a few posts and sticks, fastened together and overgrown with roses and other flowers, serve respectively as a cool sitting-room and a kitchen, the oven being invariably built on the ground outside the latter for the sake of coolness. The women, when young, are singularly good-looking, with dark complexions, bright eyes, and luxuriant tresses, which they wear in two plaits hanging down their backs far below the waist. The men are also, as a rule, fine-looking. In fact, the land is good, and everybody and everything looks prosperous. The beasts are up to their knees in rich pasture, are fat and sleek, and lie down to chew the cud of contentment, instead of searching anxiously for a scanty sustenance. The horses are well fed, and their coats are fine and glossy, and the sheep, pigs, and other animals are in equally good condition. It is, therefore, a cheery country to travel through, and at this springtime of the year one sees in it its highest perfection. Before reaching Talca, we had to cross the Malay, a wide, deep river with a swift current. The carriage was first put on board a large, flat-bottomed boat, into which the horses then jumped one by one the last to embark tumbling down and rolling among the legs of the others. With a large oar, the boat was steered across the stream, down which it drifted about 200 yards into shallow water, where the boatmen jumped out and towed us to a convenient landing place. Here we found several people waiting to be ferried over. A troop of mules, having been driven into the water, which they seemed rather to enjoy, swam across safely, though they were carried some distance down the river. About five o'clock we arrived at Talca, and went straight to the Hotel Colon, kept by Gasseroni. Every Italian who starts an hotel in this part of the world calls it, as a matter of course, the Columbus Hotel, for they are very anxious to claim the great navigator as a countryman, though the Spaniards dispute their right to do so, on the ground that Genoa, where he was really born, was at that time an independent state. While we were waiting for dinner, we walked about the town, which so exactly resembles Concepcion and Chilean in the arrangement of its streets, buildings, and trees, that I doubt whether any one familiar with the three places could tell immediately which town he was in, if transported suddenly to the middle of the plaza, though I believe Talca is rather the largest. 
It still retains its old Indian name, meaning thunder, doubtless on account of the frequency and violence of the thunderstorms by which it is visited. Monday, October 23rd. Soon after midnight, I was aroused by a great noise. At first I thought I was dreaming, but a very brief reflection convinced me of the existence of an energetically played big drum somewhere in the immediate neighborhood of my bedroom. I had once got up and peeping through the window in the door saw a military band of 25 performers standing on the other side of the courtyard blowing and hitting their hardest. It must be confessed that they played well and that their selection of music was good but it was nevertheless rather annoying after a long and fatiguing day and with the prospect of an early start to be kept awake until half past three in the morning while they serenaded and toasted the prima donna and each of the other members of the theatrical company who are staying here. The noise was, of course, increased by the reverberation from the walls of the courtyard, and finding it impossible to sleep, I abandoned the attempt and took to writing instead. At last the welcome notes of the Chilean national air gave me hope that the entertainment was over for the night, or rather morning, and soon afterwards all was once more quiet. We left Talca by the 7.30 train, Mr. Budge, who had business at Curico, accompanying us. All the engines and rolling stock this side of Santiago are of American make and pattern. Mr. Budge had secured one of the long cars, with a passage down the center and a saloon at each end for us, so we were very comfortable, and he told us a great deal about the country as we went along. Like all Chilenos, he is very patriotic and is especially proud of the financial stability of his country. He often said, if English people would only invest their money here instead of in Peru or the Argentine Republic, they would get 8% on good security. We heard the same thing from many other sources, and it certainly does seem that this country is the most settled and the least liable to be disturbed by revolutions of any in South America. At Curico, we breakfasted at a little restaurant on Chilean dishes and the wine of the country. The latter is excellent and of various kinds, but it is so cheap that none of the innkeepers can be persuaded to supply it to travelers, whose only chance of tasting it, therefore, is at some small inn. Footnote. Curico is an Indian name, signifying black waters, having reference to the mineral springs in the neighboring mountains. End footnote. Mr. Budge left us at Peliquin, the next station to San Fernando, having put us in charge of the conductor, who promised to see after us at Calcanes, but who woefully betrayed his trust. There was no regular station at the latter place, but as the train stopped, and we saw Benzta Calcanes on an hotel close by, we jumped out just in time to see it go on again. Luckily, the other passengers were kind enough to interest themselves on our behalf, and shrieked and hallooed to such good purpose that the engine was once more brought to a standstill, and our luggage was put out. Half a dozen little boys carried it to the inn, where I had to explain to the patron, in my best Spanish, that we wanted a carriage to go to the baths, seven leagues off. In a wonderfully short space of time, four good horses were harnessed to a queer sort of vehicle, which held four inside and one out, besides the driver, and which had to be entered by means of a ladder. Having all packed in and paid our fare beforehand, we were rattled off at a merry pace towards the Andes. The road went up and down and round about and crossed many rivers, but was fairly good throughout. We changed once at a large hacienda, where a man went into a large yard containing about sixty horses, and dexterously lassoed the particular four required for our use. Several horsemen were waiting about, and I looked at their saddles, which were made of a dozen or more sheepskins, laid one on top of the other, forming a soft seat to ride in by day, and a comfortable bed to sleep on at night. Early in the afternoon we saw some buildings in the distance, which we rightly guessed to be the baths, and soon afterwards we passed in at the entrance gate of the establishment, by the side of which was a rock with the word, Welcome, painted upon its face. The whole distance from the station was twenty-three miles, which we had accomplished in a little over two hours. Driving between hedgerows of roses in full bloom, we were not long in reaching the door of the hotel, where we were received by the proprietor. He told us he was very full, but he managed to find us some small rooms, and then conducted us to the luxuriously fitted bathing establishment. After this came the table d'hôte, to which about seventy sat down, though many of the visitors were dining in their own rooms. 
In the evening we walked about the garden and chatted with several people, who all seemed to have heard of us and our voyage, and to be anxious to know what we thought of the straits. We saw some English papers too, which was a great treat, though there did not seem to be much news in them. Tuesday, October 24th. This is a wonderful place, built entirely of wood. The center part is a square, 70 yards in extent, surrounded by a single row of one-storied rooms, with doors opening into the courtyard, and windows looking over the river or up into the mountains. In the middle of the square are a pavilion containing two billiard tables, a boot-blacking arbor, covered with white and yellow jessamine and scarlet and cream-colored honeysuckle, plenty of flower beds full of roses and orange trees, and a monkey on a pole, who must, poor creature, have a sorry life of it, as it is his business to afford amusement to all the visitors to the baths. He is very good-tempered, does several tricks, and is tormented from early dawn to dewy eve. I remonstrated with our host on his behalf, but he merely shrugged his shoulders and said, Mais il faut que le monde se divertit, madame. From the center square, marble steps lead to a large hall, with marble baths on either side, for ladies and gentlemen, respectively. A few steps further bring one to a delightful swimming bath, about 40 feet square, filled with tepid water. The water, as it springs from the rock, is boiling hot, and contains, I believe, a good deal of magnesia and other salts beneficial in cases of rheumatism and gout. But the high temperature of the water makes the air very muggy, and we all found the place relaxing, though perhaps it was because we indulged too freely in the baths, which are a great temptation. In the afternoon we went for a ride to see a celebrated view of the Andes. Unfortunately, it was rather misty, but we could see enough to enable us to imagine the rest. Some condors were soaring round the rocky peaks, and the landscape, though well clothed with vegetation, had a weird, dreary character of its own, partly due to the quantity of large cacti that grew in every nook and corner, singly or in groups of ten or twelve, to the height of twenty or thirty feet though they say it hardly ever rains in Chile, a heavy shower fell this afternoon, and our landlord thoughtfully sent a boy on horseback after us with umbrellas. Wednesday, October 25th. The bath was so delightful this morning that we felt quite sorry it was to be our last. One could very well spend a week or two here, and find plenty to do in the way of excursions into the valleys of the Andes, which look most inviting in the distance. At half-past ten, we set out on our return journey to the railway, changing horses at the same place where we had stopped at coming up, and which we reached half an hour before the train was due. When it arrived, we were allowed to get in with our belongings, in rather a less hurried fashion than we had alighted. Luncheon was procured at Rancagua, and we finally reached Santiago at about 4.50 p.m., no sooner had we got fairly into the station than the car was invaded by a crowd of porters touting for employment. They are all dressed in white and wear red caps, on which is a brass number by means of which they are easily recognized. The landlord from the Hôtel Inglés, Monsieur Tellier, met us, and we at once drove off, leaving our luggage to follow, in charge of one of the red-capped gentlemen. The drive from the station was along the Alameda, on either side of which were many fine houses, but the road was ill-paved and shaky as usual. The Grand Hotel, which used to be considered the best in South America, is now shut up, the company who owned it having recently failed, so all the smaller hotels, none of which are very good, are crowded to overflowing. The Hotel Inglés is considered the best, though I cannot say much in its favor. The rooms are good, but the situation is noisy, being at the corner of two streets. The servants are attentive, but the cuisine and arrangements are bad. Independently of all this, we have great reason to complain of the conduct of the landlord, for my first question, as soon as he had introduced himself, was, of course, Have Mr. and Miss Brassy arrived? Yes, madame, and went away this morning. What? And left no letter? No, but monsieur returns tomorrow. Imagine my surprise and disappointment. But there was nothing to be done but to go to the hotel and wait patiently. We afterwards found that Tom had left a long letter, and that he had never said a word about returning. The wretched man would not give me the letter, because he thought he could detain us, and he never sent the telegram I handed to him to forward to Tom at once, asking for an answer. Our luggage arrived just in time to enable us to dress for the second table d'hôte at six o'clock. 
after which we went for a walk through some arcades paved with marble and full of fine shops past the grand hotel which was situated at the end of the alameda and is built over an arcade of shops it is a handsome building and must command a fine view the cathedral and the archbishop's palace large but rather dull-looking brick buildings are close by the surrounding gardens looked pretty by gaslight and the scent of roses pervaded the evening air end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Santiago and Valparaiso. Gems of the changing autumn, how beautiful you are, shining from your glassy stems like many a golden star. Thursday, October 26th. Our kind hostess at Lota had given us a letter of introduction to her manager at Santiago, who called this morning to inquire what arrangements he could make which would be most agreeable to us during our stay. She had also given orders that her carriages and horses should be placed at our disposal, and at about ten o'clock we all started in an open break, drawn by a pair of good-looking half-bred brown horses, bigger than any we had seen before in this country. We went first to the Campania, a large open square planted with flowers, the site of the old Jesuit church, which was burnt down on December 8, 1863. Well known as the story is, I may here recall the tragic details standing on the very spot where they took place. It was the Feast of the Virgin, and the church was densely crowded with a congregation composed almost entirely of women, principally young, many of whom were servant girls. Some of the draperies used in the decoration of the building caught fire. The flames spread rapidly, destroying in their course the cords by which the numerous paraffin and oil lamps were suspended across the nave and aisles, and precipitating their burning contents upon the people beneath. The great doors opened inwards. The crowd, trying to press out, closed them, and kept them hermetically sealed. The priests, anxious to save the church properties and sacred relics, shut the large iron gates across the chancel and kept them fastened notwithstanding the agonizing shrieks of the unhappy victims many of whom might otherwise have escaped their conduct on this terrible occasion created at the time a feeling of bitter and universal indignation and caused a shock to the popularity and authority of the priesthood in this country from which it will take them a long time to recover Mr. Long told us that, between seven and eight o'clock on the evening of the catastrophe, he was walking with some friends on the Alameda when he saw smoke rising in dense volumes from the quarter of the city where the house in which he resided was situated. He and his friends ran quickly in the direction of the fire, giving the alarm as they went, and on reaching the church they found the doors closely shut while fearful screams were issuing from the interior and smoke and flames pouring from the windows. They got a party of men together accustomed to the use of the lasso, no difficult task here, and with them climbed from the neighboring houses to the top of the church. Making a hole in the roof, they then dropped their lassos over some of the women beneath, and so dragged them out of the building. But the number thus saved was necessarily very small, and it happened too often that many of the poor creatures below, in their eagerness to escape, hung on to the legs or body of the one they saw lassoed, and by their weight literally dragged her to pieces. Sometimes even a lasso broke, and those clinging to it, when almost within reach of safety, were again precipitated into the burning mass below. Anyone who has seen a rawhide lasso, capable of withstanding the sudden rush of the fiercest bull ever captured, will be able to realize the immense strain which would be required to cause one to give way. The next morning at daybreak, the interior of the church presented a terrible spectacle. Mr. Long described it as being full of women, standing up, tightly wedged together, their hands stretched out as if in an attitude of supplication, their faces and the upper part of their bodies charred beyond recognition, the lower part, from the waist downwards, completely untouched. Their remains were buried in one large grave in the cemetery of the Recoleta, and the spot is now marked by a square piece of ground, full of bright flowers, enclosed by iron railings, 
almost hidden by the creepers that entwine them, and shaded by willows, orange trees, cypresses, and pomegranates. In the center is a large cross, and on either side of the iron railings there is a marble tablet, with the simple but touching inscription in Spanish. Encendio de la Iglesia de la Campania, el ocho de diciembre, mil ochocientos sesenta y tres, restos de las victimas, dos mil más o menos. Burning of the Church of the Campania, December the 8th, 1863. Remains of the victims, 2,000, more or less. Almost every household in Santiago had lost one of its members. One lovely girl of 17 was pulled out through the roof and taken to Madame Cosigno's residence, where she lay for nearly a fortnight. She suffered the greatest agonies, but was sensible to the last, and gave a graphic account of the whole harrowing scene. The site of the church, hallowed by such sad memories, has never been built upon, but is preserved as an open space, surrounded by a strip of garden, and having in its center a finely carved monument. The Houses of Congress were the next thing we went to see, after which we drove through a great part of the city and over a handsome bridge with statues and small niches on either side. Beneath it, however, there is little more than a dry torrent bed, and it is said that an American, when visiting this spot with a Santiago friend who was showing him round, remarked, I guess you ought either to buy a river or sell this here bridge. We also went to the church of La Recoleta. From the church we went to the cemetery of the same name, which is prettily laid out, and well stocked with flowers and trees. It being now past eleven o'clock, we began to think about breakfast, and accordingly returned to the hotel, where I was disappointed to find no news from Tom, and no answer to the telegram I sent last night. At one o'clock we started again, and had a pleasant but rather dusty drive of eight miles to Macul, the stud farm established by the late Don Luis Cusino. We had some luncheon at Mr. Canning's house, in a room that had recently been split from top to bottom by an earthquake, and afterwards sat in the veranda to see the horses and some of the cattle which were brought round for our inspection. Amongst them were Fanfaron, Fandango, and other beautiful thoroughbreds, three fine Cleveland coach horses, Suffolk cart horses and Percherons, and some of the young stock. We saw only a few of the beasts, as at this time they are away feeding on the hills, but I believe they are as good as the horses. Mr. Long had arranged for us all to ride round the farm, and I was mounted on a lovely chestnut mare, sixteen hands high, daughter of Fanfaron, and niece to Kettledrum. I should have liked to have bought her and sent her home, but she was not for sale, though her value was four hundred pounds. English horses here are as dear in proportion as native horses are cheap. The latter may be bought for from twenty to sixty dollars apiece, and some of them make capital little hacks. We rode all over the farm, attended by half a dozen peons, who drove the young thoroughbred stock together in the enormous fields for us to see, and afterwards did the same thing with some of the cattle. We also went through the farm buildings, in one part of which we saw the operation of making lassos. The best are composed of neatly plaited strips of cured hide, about a quarter of an inch wide, the commoner sort being made from an undressed cow's hide, with the hair on, cut from the center in an ever-increasing circle, so that they are in one piece many yards in length. In another part of the farm there were a few acres more of flower gardens, orange trees, and kitchen gardens. Beautiful as the whole place is, it loses much in interest from its vastness. You never seem to know where you are or when you have come to an end. I hear that Madame Cosigno talks of extending the park still further, right up into the mountains, which seems almost a pity, as it is already too big to be kept in really perfect order, even with a 120 men employed upon it. Everything is completely surrounded and overgrown with flowers. Even the fields are separated by hedges of sweet-smelling, double-pink roses, and these hedges are larger than many a bullfinch in the old country. After a delightful gallop of about two hours, we returned to the farmhouse, where we found a fresh pair of horses waiting for us in the break, and drove back to Santiago by moonlight. It was eight o'clock when we reached the hotel, and as the table d'hote dinner only lasts from five till half-past seven, I asked for a private dinner in our own room, or in the general dining room, for our own party and two guests in addition. 
but the landlord said he was not at all sure about giving us dinner he must see what there was in the kitchen first we then declared we would go and dine at a cafe and in less than half an hour managed to get an excellent little dinner at the cafe santiago though even mr long who ordered it for us could not induce them to give us native wine i am bound to confess however that we punished ourselves at least as much as the landlord for as we paid so much a day for board and lodging he was of course bound to provide us with dinner and we had thus to pay for our food twice over friday october twenty seventh still no news from tom mr long called at half past eight to take me to the market and my first step was to send another telegram this time taking care to see that it really was dispatched we then walked through the streets to the market hall a handsome iron building commodiously arranged which was sent out from England in pieces and put together here. All round at our stalls, where you can get a capital breakfast, generally consisting of coffee, tender beefsteak, buttered toast, and boiled beans, for a small sum. One of our party, who had been at the market since half-past five, tried one, and fully confirmed the report we had heard as to their excellence and cleanliness. At the time of our visit, all these refreshment stalls were crowded, and I felt rather tempted to join one of the hungry, merry-looking groups myself. The market was well supplied with meat, fish, vegetables, fruit, and flowers of all kinds, green peas, French beans, and strawberries being specially abundant. There were quantities of queer-looking baskets to be seen, and some curious pottery made by the nuns from a kind of cement. Outside the building there were men and women hanging about with ponchos of their own manufacture, which they had brought in from the country for sale. We bought some bright specimens as presents for the children, but it took some time to collect them, as each individual had only one to offer. They are the work of the women in the intervals of household labor, and as soon as one is completed it is sold, in order that materials for a fresh one may be purchased. We also bought some of the carved wooden stirrups, made in the country and used by all the natives. They are rather like a small coal scuttle in shape, and must be heavy and cumbersome. From the market we went to hear high mass at the cathedral. This is a fine building, though the interior seemed very dark. The high altar was illuminated by hundreds of candles, whose light shone on a crowd of kneeling women, all dressed in black and with black veils over their heads, the contrast between their somber appearance and the gilding and paintings on the walls, handsome at a distance but tawdry on a closer examination, being very striking. The organ is of splendid tone and quality, and reverberated grandly through the aisles, and the whole scene was not without a certain impressiveness. I had not thought of paying a visit to the cathedral when I went out this morning, and it was not until I saw everyone staring at me that I remembered I had committed the terrible mistake of going to church in a hat, and without any veil, but we remained in a dark corner most of the time, and emerged into open daylight again before any of the authorities of the place had time to observe or remonstrate with me. My wearing a hat was, however, quite as much against all church rules as a similar proceeding on the part of a man would have been. The women of this city are almost always good-looking when young, and they glide gracefully about the streets in their long black clinging gowns and mantos, by which they are completely enveloped from head to foot." In the afternoon we went for a drive in the park and to see Santa Lucia, of which, as the only hill in Santiago, the inhabitants of the city are very proud, and from thence drove to the Cosimio Park, an extensive piece of ground near the Alameda, laid out and arranged under the direction of the late Don Luis Cosimio, and presented by him to the city of Santiago. After a stroll round the park, Mr. Long took us to an emporium for Panama hats, which are made in Lima, Guayaquil, and other states of Chile, as well as in Panama, from a special kind of grass, split very fine, and worn by almost everybody on this coast. The best made cost $340, or about 60 guineas, and 50 pounds is not at all an uncommon price to pay, though the inferior kind may be had for 2 pounds. Those ordinarily worn by the gentlemen here cost from 20 to 30 pounds each, but they are so light, pliable, and elastic, that they will wear for ever, wash like a pocket handkerchief, do not get burnt by the sun, and can be rolled up and sat upon, in fact ill-treated in any way you like, without fear of their breaking, tearing, or getting out of shape. For the yacht, however, where so many hats are lost overboard, 
they would, I fear, prove a rather unprofitable investment. We now drove back to the hotel, past the Mint, a handsome building guarded by soldiers, and with windows protected by iron gratings. On our return, I found that one of the valuable ponchos given to me in the Argentine Republic had been taken from our room. The landlord declined to trouble himself about its recovery, as he said it was most unlikely that anyone would take a thing of no value to him here, the real truth being that the guanaco ponchos are worth nearly double as much in Chile as they are on the other side of the Andes. After dinner, we walked to the theater, where we saw La Sanambula, well put on the stage and well sung and acted by an Italian opera company. The prima donna, contralto, baritone, and bass were all good, but the scenery was occasionally somewhat deficient. The house, which is highly decorated, perhaps too much so for the ladies' dresses, looked well by night, though if it had been full, the effect would have been still better. The box tiers are not divided into pigeonholes as they are with us, and everybody can therefore see equally well. The presidential box seemed commodious and handsome, and had the Chilean coat of arms in front of it, making it look very much like a royal box. The walk back by moonlight was delightful. Some of our party afterwards went to the Union Club, where they met several English gentlemen, who were most kind and pressing in their invitations to them to stay a few days longer and go up the mountains to see the views and to have some guanaco shooting. About twenty-four hours from here, they say you can have your first shot, and a little further on you meet them in herds which may be counted by thousands. There are also wild horses and wild donkeys. Quagas and humals used to be found, but are now extinct. The last named is a rare animal, exactly resembling a horse in every particular, except that its hoofs are cloven. It used only to be found in the mountains of Chile, and it is one of the supporters of the National Coat of Arms. Saturday, October 28th. At 5 a.m. we were called, and soon afterwards parting gifts of flowers began to arrive, and even I was obliged to confess that four large clothes baskets full of rosebuds were more than I quite knew what to do with. At seven, Mr. Long came to know if he could help us in any way, and a little later, Madame Cousineau's coachman appeared with the carriage to take us to the station. We had a pleasant drive down the Alameda, the sun shining brilliantly in a bright blue sky, and the distant mountains for the first time being clearly visible. The station was crowded with vendors of pottery, curious things in buffalo horn, sweetmeats, etc., the rolling stock on this line is of English manufacture, and we were therefore put into the too familiar, close, stuffy first-class carriage and duly locked up for the journey down to Valparaiso. The line, running as it does through the mountain gorges for a great portion of the way, must have been a difficult one to make. Just now the whole country wears a golden tint from the bloom of the Espinosa, which seems to grow everywhere and which is now in perfection. The branches of this shrug are so completely covered with little yellow balls of flowers which come before the leaves and which have no separate stalk but grow along the shiny, horny branches that they look as if they were made of gold. It is called the burning bush here, and its wood is said to be the hardest in the country. The flowers are often plucked off and dried, in which state they are most fragrant and are used for scenting linen and for keeping away moths. The thorns, however, are a terrible nuisance to the shepherds and owners of cattle, catching their clothes and tearing them as they gallop swiftly across over the plains. If I bore you by saying too much about the flowers, forgive me. I want to make you all realize, if possible, what a lovely flowery land Chile is. The whole air is quite perfumed with roses, principally large double pink roses, something like the old-fashioned cabbage rose, though there are a good many of the monthly kind, and a few white and deep scarlet ones. They formed hedgerows on either side of the road, and in many places climbed thirty or forty feet up the trees, and then threw down long brambles laden with bloom, almost producing the effect of a wall of pink. There were also plenty of wild flowers of other sorts, such as scarlet and white lilies, larkspurs, eschlatzias, evening primroses, and many others whose names I do not know. At Yayai, we stopped for breakfast, procured at a small restaurant at the station. While waiting for the train for Santiago to come in, we had plenty of time to observe the half-Indian girls selling fruit, flowers, cakes, etc., 
and jabbering away in a sort of patois Spanish, in recommendation of their wares. Some of them were really pretty, and all were picturesquely dressed in bright-coloured stuffs, their hair neatly done up and decorated with flowers, their faces clean and smiling. At 11.15 a.m. we reached Quilota, where the train was literally besieged by men, women, and children offering bouquets for sale, two or three of which were thrust in at every carriage window, and baskets of strawberries, cherimoyas, nesperos, melons, oranges, sugar cane, plantain, bananas, asparagus, green peas, French beans, eggs, chickens, and even fish, nice little pergeres, fresh from the stream close by. It must evidently be the custom of the Chilenos to visit by rail these fertile districts for the purpose of doing their marketing, for the occupants of the train soon absorbed the entire stock of the vendors, who were left with empty baskets. I never saw such a country as this is for eggs and chickens. A hen seems never to have a smaller brood than ten, and I have often counted from seventeen to twenty-one chickens with the mother, and more than once as many as twenty-four. However well you may have breakfasted or dined, the waiters always come at the end of the meal to ask, not whether you will have any eggs, but how you will have them, fried, boiled, poached, or in some sort of omelette. If you refuse altogether, the chances are that two very lightly boiled eggs will be placed by your side, with the suggestion that you should beat them up and drink them. The inhabitants of the country always seem to finish their meals with eggs in some form or another. The celebrated Bell of Quilota, a mountain which derives its name from its peculiar shape, and which serves as a good landmark in entering the harbour of Valparaiso, is well seen from the railway, a little below Quilota station. We stopped again at Limache, a little village situated in the midst of a fertile country, about twenty-five miles from Valparaiso, where fruit, flowers, etc., were as freely offered for sale as before, and again at Viña del Mar, the next station to Valparaiso. There is a good hotel here in the midst of a pretty garden, where you can get an excellent breakfast or dinner. From this spot the line runs close along the edge of the sea, and we strained our eyes in vain trying to discover the yacht. At the station we were assailed by porters and touts of every description, but, seeing no one to meet us, and not knowing where to go, we contented ourselves with collecting our luggage in a little heap, while a fight went on close by between a policeman and a coachman, who had been too persistent in his endeavours to obtain a fare. They knocked one another about a good deal and broke one or two windows, after which they appeared quite satisfied, shook hands, and were good friends again. Tom, Maybell, and Muriel arrived before it was over, and we were very glad to meet again after our short absence. A long, dusty drive brought us to the mole, and while the luggage was being packed into the boat, Tom and I went to call on the British consul, where we found some letters. We were on board in time for two o'clock luncheon, after which, amid many interruptions from visitors, we devoured our news from home and other parts, for amongst our letters were some from Natal, India, Japan, Canada, Tenerife, South American ports, St. Petersburg, Constantinople, and several other places, besides those from dear old England. About four o'clock, Tom and I went ashore. We had intended going alone in the Flash, our lightest boat, but a strong southerly wind had sprung up, which at once made the sea so rough that we went in the gleam, the gig, instead, with six oars. It took the men all their time to get us ashore, though we had not far to go, for wind, tide, and waves were all against us. Valparaiso consists mainly of two interminable streets running along the edge of the sea at the foot of the hills, which rise immediately behind them and on which are built all the residences and villas of the gentlemen of the place. Very few live in the town itself, which is composed almost entirely of large warehouses and fine shops, where you can get almost anything you want by paying between three and four times as much for it as you would do in England. For instance, the charge for hair cutting is a dollar and a half, four shillings. A three and six penny let's diary costs two dollars and a half, ten shillings. A tall hat costs fifty-eight shillings. You must pay six pence each for parchment, luggage labels, three pence apiece for quill pens, four shillings for a quire of common note paper, and so on in proportion. 
We had, as I have said, seen the yacht leave Lota Bay with a strong headwind blowing on Thursday, the 19th instant. In a few hours, the wind fell to a calm, which then changed to a light, favorable breeze, and the sunbeam reached Valparaiso on the following Saturday afternoon, anchoring out in the bay, not far from HMS Opal. Here they rolled and tumbled about, even more than if they had been at sea, the swinging capacities of the saloon tables and lamps being tried to the utmost. On Sunday, half the men went ashore for a few hours' leave, but neither they nor the boat returned until the next morning, as they had not been allowed to leave the shore after nine o'clock. In the meantime, Tom had been told that smallpox was raging in the town, and he was much annoyed at their having to pass the night on shore, owing to proper inquiries as to the regulations of the port not having been made by them on landing. The next day, the doctor went to see some medical confrères at the hospital, and found that the reports were much exaggerated, the reality being that smallpox is always more or less prevalent, both here and at Santiago. Three months ago it was very bad, but at the present time it is not worse than usual. Tom and Mabel started for Santiago on Monday, but unfortunately left their letters of introduction behind, and as they did not like the hotel, they found it rather dull. We could not telegraph to them from Cacanes, or anywhere en route, for there were no wires, so on Wednesday morning, not hearing or seeing anything of us, they returned to Valparaiso. Tom left a long letter for me, with enclosures, which I never received, in the innkeeper's hands, asking for a telegraphic reply as to our plans and intentions, and, as I have already mentioned, never said a word about coming back. Thursday was spent in seeing what little there is to see in Valparaiso, and in visiting the Opal. On Friday, Tom went for a sail, moved the yacht close in shore, had a dinner party on board, and went to a pleasant ball afterwards, given by the Philharmonic Society, an association of the same sort as the one at Rio. It was not, however, called a regular ball, but a teriulia, so the ladies were in demi-toilette. Tom described the room as good, the floor first-rate, the music excellent, the ladies good-looking, and the men agreeable. Today he met us at the station with the children, and now, therefore, one account will describe the movements of the whole reunited party. Sunday, October 29th. We all went ashore to church, having been told it was only five minutes' walk from the landing place, instead of which it took us at least a quarter of an hour, in an intensely hot sun, to climb up a steep hill. The building itself was large, airy, and cool, and there is a good organ and choir, but most of the choristers had gone away today to a picnic in the country. During the litany, our attention was suddenly drawn to the fact that earthquakes are a matter of frequent occurrence in this country, by a special prayer being offered up for preservation from them and their destructive effects. At four o'clock, we went ashore for a ride, and having climbed the hills at the back of the town, which command extensive views over land and sea, we galloped across the downs and through some villages on to the old high road, from Valparaiso to Santiago, along which we rode only for a few yards, turning off into a romantic valley, where the path was so narrow that we could barely squeeze through between the thickly growing shrubs and trees. At last we went up a steep hill on to another high road, and re-entered the town quite at the opposite end to that at which we had left it, after which a ride of two miles along the stony, ill-paved streets brought us to the landing place. Monday, October 30th. We were to be off directly the sea breeze sprang up at about eleven o'clock, and as I had many letters to write, I was called at four a.m. and finished them all before breakfast at eight. But first one visitor and then another arrived, and it was nearly eleven o'clock when we landed to make the final preparations for starting on our long voyage of eleven thousand miles across the Pacific. Our route, as at present arranged, will be via the Society, Friendly, and Sandwich Islands. Juan Fernandez, Robinson Crusoe's Island, which we at first thought of visiting, we have been obliged, I am sorry to say, to give up, not on account of its distance from Valparaiso, as it is only 270 miles off, but because it lies too far to the southward, and is consequently quite out of the track of the trade wind, which we ought to pick up, according to the charts and sailing directions, about 500 miles to the northward and westward of this place. I have been trying to persuade Tom to steam out five or six hundred miles, 
so that we may make a quick passage and economize our time as much as possible but he is anxious to do the whole voyage under sail and we are therefore taking very little coal on board in order to be in the best trim if we do not pick up a wind however there is no knowing how long we may lollop about i suppose till we are short of water and fresh provisions when the fires will be lighted and we shall steam away to the nearest island uninhabited we will hope or at any rate peopled by friendly natives which is rather the exception than the rule in the southeast corner of the low archipelago there we shall fill up with fresh water bananas breadfruit and perhaps a wild hog or two and resume our voyage to tahiti but this is the least favorable view of the matter and we must hope to fall in with the trades soon and that they will blow strong and true the island of juan fernandez now belongs to the chilean government but is let on a long lease to a man who they say here is somewhat of a robber he was very desirous that we should give him a passage in the yacht and another man wanted to come too with some pointers to show us the best spots for game goats turtle crayfish and sea fish with all of which the place abounds some cattle have also been introduced and the island is much frequented by whalers who go there for fresh provisions and water there is nothing particular to be seen however and the scenery of the island is not remarkable at least so people who have been there tell us and the photographs i have bought quite confirm their report admiral simpson who stayed there once for a fortnight told us a good deal about the place and strongly recommended us not to go there unless we had plenty of time to spare as we should not be repaid for our trouble which would probably only result in the dissipation of all our childish illusions our first step on landing this morning was to go to the consuls to post our letters by the by i hope people in england will appreciate them for they cost between nine and ten pounds to send home for our outward letters although prepaid in england we had to pay over eight pounds before we were allowed to have them from the office twenty-nine cases of stores provisions wine etc which had also been sent out all arrived safely and cost comparatively little there are very good french hairdressers here a tempting hat shop and a well-stocked bookshop but everything as i have said is frightfully dear it was half past three when the harbour tug arrived to tow us out of the harbour and so save our getting up steam there was not a breath of air stirring but tom hoped we should find more outside when the tug cast us off as we dropped slowly out we had a good view of the harbour and town and we soon found ourselves once more fairly embarked on the bosom of the wide ocean end of chapter eleven Chapter 12 of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Valparaiso to Tahiti. The western sea was all aflame, the day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad bright sun. Tuesday, October 31st. Throughout the night, a flat calm prevailed. The morning was wet and foggy, or we might still have seen Valparaiso, and perhaps have had a peep at Aconcagua. There was a light contrary wind from the northwest throughout the day. In the afternoon, we saw two whales blowing in the distance. Wednesday, November 1st. An almost calm day, with a few light showers, and fitful but unfavorable breezes some thirty or forty little birds which the sailors called mother carrie's chickens but which were smaller and more graceful than any i have seen of that name followed closely in our wake i was never tired of watching the dainty way in which they just touched the tips of the waves with their feet and then started off afresh like a little maiden skipping and hopping along from sheer exuberance of spirit thursday november second a bright sunny morning with a heavy swell and light contrary wind but the sea became more tranquil towards the evening the sunset was superb and the afterglow as is often the case in these latitudes lighted up sky and sea with an indescribable beauty which attained its greatest magnificence about five minutes after the sun had disappeared reminding one of the glorious sunsets of the african deserts 
so often described by travellers. Friday, November 3rd. Still a blue sky, bright sunshine, smooth sea, and light headwind. The crew have all turned tailors, and are making themselves new suits from some dungaree we bought at Valparaiso, the clothes we expected for them, not having met us there. Saturday, November 4th. As fine as ever. This is certainly sailing luxuriously, if not swiftly. We have now settled down into our regular sea ways, and have plenty to do on board, so the delay does not much signify. Still our time is limited, and we all hope to fall in with the trades shortly to carry us to Tahiti or some of the South Sea Islands. We caught half a dozen of the little petrels for stuffing by floating lines of black cotton astern, in which they became entangled. Tonight's sunset was more superb than ever. Each moment produced a new and ever-increasingly grand effect. I mean to try and take an instantaneous photograph of one. It would not, of course, reproduce all the marvelous shades of coloring, but it would perhaps give some idea of the forms of the masses of cloud, which are finer than any I ever saw before. This ocean seems to give one, in a strange way, a sense of solemn vastness, which was not produced to the same extent by the Atlantic. Whether this results from our knowledge of its size, or whether it is only fancy, I cannot say, but it is an impression which we all share. Sunday, November 5th. Fine and considerably hotter, though not unpleasantly so. We had the litany at eleven, and evening prayers and a sermon at four o'clock. Not a single ship has passed within sight since we left Valparaiso, and the only living creatures we have seen are some albatrosses, a few white boobies, a cape hen, the little petrels already mentioned, a shoal of porpoises, and two whales. Monday, November 6th. Passed at 3 a.m. today a large bark steering south, and at 8 a.m. a full-rigged ship steering the same course. We held, as we do with every ship we pass, a short conversation with her through the means of the mercantile code of signals. This habit of exchanging signals afterwards proved to have been a most useful practice, for when the report that the sunbeam had gone down with all hands was widely circulated through England, I might almost say the world, for we found the report had preceded us by telegram to almost all the later ports we touched at, the anxiety of our friends was relieved many days sooner than it would otherwise have been by the fact of our having spoken the German steamer Sakara in the Magellan Straits, October 13th four days after we were supposed to have gone to the bottom. The weather continues fine, and we have the same light, baffling winds. We hoped when we started to average at least 200 miles a day, but now we have been a week at sea, and have only made good a little more than 700 miles altogether, though we have sailed over 800 miles through the water. It is, however, wonderful, in the opinion of the navigators, that we have made even as much progress as this, considering the very adverse circumstances under which the voyage has so far been performed, and we must endeavor to console ourselves with the reflection that the sailing qualities of the yacht have undergone another severe test in a satisfactory manner. How the provisions and water will last out, and what time we shall leave ourselves to see anything of Japan, are questions which, nevertheless, occasionally present themselves to our minds. Independently of such considerations, Nothing could be more luxurious and delightful than our present mode of existence. With perfect weather, plenty of books to read and writing to do, no possibility of interruptions, one can map out one's day and dispose of one's time exactly as one pleases, until the half-past six o'clock dressing bell, which always seems to come long before it is wanted, recalls one to the duties and necessities of life. Wednesday, November 8th. A gray cloudy morning and a flat calm. At twelve o'clock, to the great joy of everybody on board, Tom decided to get up steam, as we have now been becalmed quite twenty-four hours and have made but little progress in the right direction for some days. The clarity with which the order to stow sails and raise the funnel was obeyed, everyone lending a hand, and the delight expressed on every countenance must have assured him of at least the popularity of his decision. Whilst we were waiting for steam to be got up, Tom took Muriel and me for a row in the flash, his own particular little boat, with about four inches of freeboard. 
the possibility of doing this will give you a better idea of the tranquillity of this vast ocean than any description i can write at the same time when we wanted to get into the boat we found there was a considerable roll on and that it was no easy matter without the aid of a gangway or ladder we rowed a little way from the yacht and considering how quiet it had seemed to us when on board it was wonderful to observe how she rolled in the trough of the sea without sails to steady her or motive power to guide her the lota coals though black and dirty beyond description burn up very quickly and in about an hour we were steaming merrily along the arabian horseshoe on our bowsprit's end being now pointed direct for the island of tahiti instead of for wherever the wind chose to blow us thursday november ninth a flat calm at six a m a very light fair wind at nine a m in spite of my remonstrances tom determined at half past nine to cease steaming and try sailing again about twelve o'clock a puff came that sent us along at the rate of ten and a half knots for a short time but it soon dropped and during the rest of the afternoon and evening our average speed was only three or four knots an hour this is very poor work for the trades, but I don't believe we are really in them yet, in spite of the wind charts. It is possible that they may vary in different years, besides which it is now the height of summer, with the sun south of the line, which would naturally make them lighter. Saturday, November 11th. At last we seem to be feeling the influence of the trades, as the wind continues to blow from the same direction, though it varies much in force. Sometimes we are going along at the rate of eleven and three-quarters knots, sometimes barely five. In the afternoon, we had the usual Saturday singing practice. Sunday, November 12th. Another lovely day. We had the litany and hymns at eleven, evening service and sermon at four. Just before morning church, someone turned on the water in the nursery bath and forgot to turn it off again, so that when we came aft from the saloon we had the pleasure of finding everything in the children's cabins afloat and that a good deal of water had got down into the hold it was rather annoying at the time but i dare say like many other present troubles it was a good thing in the end it obliged us at any rate to have all the stores brought up on deck and led to our taking an inventory of our resources sooner than we should otherwise have done I am sorry to say we found that, owing to the departure of our head steward and the illness of his successor, they have not been husbanded as carefully as they should have been, especially those provided for use forward. Sailors are more like children than grown-up men and require as much looking after. While there is water in the tanks, for instance, they will use it in the most extravagant manner, without thought for the morrow, and they are quite as reckless with their other stores." I find, however, that one of the drawbacks to taking a very close personal interest in the housekeeping arrangements on board is the too intimate acquaintance one makes with various individuals composing the livestock, the result being that the private particular history of every chicken, duck, turkey, and joint of mutton is apt to be remembered with a damaging effect to appetite. In the afternoon, two boobies, the first birds we have seen for some days, paid us a visit. I suppose we are too far out to see anything more of our pretty little friends, the petrels. Monday, November 13th. We had a regular turnout and rearrangement of our stores today, and discovered that the waste and mismanagement have been greater even than we at first supposed. Fortunately, we found some spare tins of provisions stowed away under the nursery floor and forgotten, and which will now come in very opportunely but I fear that, even as it is, we may be seriously inconvenienced before getting to the end of our voyage. Of the six sheep, sixty chickens, thirty ducks, and four dozen pigeons brought on board alive at Valparaiso, we have comparatively few left and not a great deal to give those few to eat, so we must depend mainly on our potted meats and vegetables, which happen to be excellent. We often wonder how the earlier navigators got on when there were no such things as tinned provisions and when the facilities for carrying water were of the poorest description while they were often months and months at sea without an opportunity of replenishing their stores and with no steam power to fall back upon in case they were becalmed still more wonderful in my opinion is the successful manner in which the spaniards managed to convey their hordes in tiny vessels together with a sufficient quantity of forage for them to the new world where according to all accounts 
they generally arrived in good condition, fit to go to work or to war immediately. The wind increased in the evening and blew dead aft. In the middle of the night, the mizzen halyards broke, and blocks in all came down with a tremendous crash, which caused both Tom and me to rush up on deck. About an hour and a half's work put everything straight again, however, though it looked a sad mess at first. We had been remarking at dinner how lucky we had been, with all this rolling about in calms and running before the wind, not to have had anything carried away or any of the ropes chaffed. Personally, I think the accident is not to be regretted, for now all the fore and aft canvas is stowed, and we are running under square canvas alone, which is much steadier work, though we still roll considerably. Tuesday, November 14th. Fine with a strong fair wind. I have been laid up for a few days with a touch of my old enemy, Syrian fever, but am gradually recovering and enjoy very much lying on deck and reading. Our victiculing arrangements have now been satisfactorily settled, and everybody has been put on an allowance of water, our supply of which will last the whole ship's company of forty persons for five weeks, leaving one tank still in reserve in case of accidents. As we expect to reach our destination in about three weeks from the present time, we have therefore, I hope, an ample supply for all our requirements. Wednesday, November 15th. Pleasant as we have found life at sea in the South Pacific, hitherto it is, I fear, monotonous to read about, and I dare say you will find it difficult to realize how quickly the days fly past and how sorry we are when each one comes to an end. I am afraid they are among those things which do not repeat themselves. At any rate, they afford a golden opportunity for reading, such as we are not likely to have again often, if ever, in our busy lives, and Tom and I are endeavoring to make the best use of it by getting through as many of the seven hundred volumes we brought with us as possible. The weather favors us in our endeavors to be industrious, for, while it is sufficiently warm to indispose one for a very severe course of study, it has never been so hot as to compel us to lie down and do nothing but gasp for breath, which is what we were warned to expect. There is indeed one slight drawback to the perfect enjoyment of our present state of existence, and that is the incessant motion of the vessel. When she rolls as quickly as she has done today, it is difficult to settle down steadily to any occupation, and at last one cannot help feeling aggravated at the persistent manner in which everything, including oneself, refuses to be still for a single instant. Thursday, November 16th. Today it is really warm, not to say hot, with a bright cloudless sky which renders an awning acceptable. We saw some bosun birds for the first time, and more shoals of flying fish. I wish a few of the latter would come on board. They would be an agreeable addition to our breakfast table. The rolling still continues, the wind being dead aft, and nothing but our square canvas being set. The effect is rather wearisome, and one longs to be able to say, Catch hold of our head and keep her still, if only for five minutes, peace and quietness. Cooking is difficult, and even eating is a hazardous occupation and at our evening game of cards we have to pocket our counters and markers and hold on as best we can. Friday, November 17th. At 8 a.m. the course was altered, our fore and aft canvas was set again, and we were once more gliding along swiftly and smoothly through the water, to the great relief of everyone on board. The day was lovely, and though it was warm, a pleasant breeze throughout the ship prevented our feeling uncomfortably hot. Saturday, November 18th. The days are so much alike that it is difficult to find anything special to say about them. They fly so quickly that I was surprised to be reminded by the usual seeking practice this afternoon that another week had gone by. The two green paracuts, Coco and Meta, given to me by Mr. Fisher at Rosario, have turned out dear little pets with the most amusing ways. They are terrible thieves, especially of sugar, pencils, pens, and paper, and being nearly always at liberty, they follow me about just like dogs, and coax and caress me with great affection. They do not care much for anyone else, though they are civil to all, and good-tempered even to the children, who, I am afraid, rather bore them with their attempts at petting. The other foreign birds, of which I have a large collection, are doing well, and I begin to hope I shall get them home safely after all. We had at one time about twenty parrots belonging to the men on board, all running about on deck forward with their wings clipped, but about half of them have been lost overboard. 
The dogs keep their health and spirits wonderfully. Thelia's is quite young again, and she and Lulu have great games, tearing up and down and around the decks as hard as they can go. Sunday, November 19th. I am convalescent at last, and appeared at breakfast this morning for the first time for ten days. The wind was very variable throughout the day. Between 6 and 7 a.m. we were going 12 knots, between 7 and 8 only 3, but as we never stop we managed to make up a fair average on the whole. At 11 o'clock we had the communion service and two hems. At midday the week's work was made up with the following result. Our position was in latitude 15 degrees 38 seconds south, longitude 117 degrees 52 seconds west. We were 3,057 miles from Valparaiso, 1,335 of which had been accomplished since last Sunday, and 1,818 miles from Tahiti. Today we were not far from Easter Island, the southernmost island of Polynesia. Here, as in the Ladrones, far away in the northwest quarter of the Pacific, most curious inscriptions are sometimes found carved in stone, annexed as a photograph taken from one I saw at a later stage of the voyage. The sails had been flapping more or less all day, and at the change of the dog watches at six o'clock, Tom ordered the men aft to stow the mizzen. This they had scarcely begun to do when a light breeze sprang up, and in a few minutes increased to a strong one, before which we bowled along at the rate of nine knots. These sudden changes are of constant occurrence, and coming as they do without the slightest warning, are quite inexplicable. If only we had our old square sails and our bigger yards and topmast, we should have saved a good deal of time already, for one or two knots an hour extra amount to from 25 to 50 miles a day, and in a month's run the difference would not be far short of 1,500 miles. But we heard so much from people in England who had visited these parts of squalls and hurricanes that Tom did not like to run the risk of being oversparred, especially with a wife and children as passengers. Monday, November 20th. The fore and aft sails were taken in, as they were doing no good, and the square canvas was drawing. This allowed the mizzen awning to be spread, making a pleasant place to sit in and a capital playground for the children, who scamper about all day long and do not appear to feel the heat a bit. Tuesday, November 21st. Certainly a very hot day. We made steady progress under the same canvas as yesterday. Wednesday, November 22nd. Between 2 and 3 a.m., a nice breeze sprang up, and between 3 and 4.30 a.m., all the fore and aft sails were again set. It was deliciously cool on deck at that time, but the sun rose fierce and hot, and more or less killed the breeze as the day wore on. Thursday, November 23rd. 24 days out. We had hoped to reach Tahiti today, and Tom begins to regret that he did not steam some distance out from Valparaiso, so as to pick up the trades sooner. Still, it is satisfactory to know how well the sunbeam can and does sail against light contrary winds, and to have an opportunity of developing some of her good points, of which we were previously hardly aware. How she manages to slip along as she does, four or five knots an hour, with not sufficient wind to blow a candle out, is a marvel to everyone on board. More than once, when the hand log has shown that we were going five knots, I have carried a naked light from one end of the deck to the other without its being extinguished. The sunrise was magnificent, and a splendid albatross, the largest we have yet seen, was at the same time visible in mid-air, floating against the rose-colored clouds. He looked so grand and calm and majestic that one could almost fancy him the bird of Jove himself, descending direct from the sun. Where do these birds rest? How far and how fast do they really fly? Are questions for the naturalist. We have seen them many times at a distance of at least 2,000 miles from the nearest land. About nine o'clock there was a slight breeze, but it fell as the sun rose and the day was intensely hot. Friday, November 24th. A fine breeze in the early morning, which, however, gradually died away. Having now quitted the regular track of the trade winds and got into the variables, we lighted fires at two o'clock. Then another light breeze sprang up for a few minutes, only to fall away again immediately, and at six o'clock we commenced to steam. Saturday, November 25th. 
A very wet morning, the sky clearing at about ten, but the weather remaining dull, heavy, hot, and oppressive throughout the day. But we were making good progress under steam, which rendered the state of things more endurable than it would otherwise have been. Whilst I was standing on deck at night, a flying fish flew against my throat and hung there, caught in the lace of my dress. He is a pretty specimen, but only his wings are to be preserved, for Muriel will have his body for breakfast tomorrow. Sunday, November 26th. Our fourth consecutive Sunday at sea, and out of sight of land. At 4 a.m. the sails were spread to a good breeze. At 7 we stopped steaming, but at 10 the wind again fell light. The litany was read on deck this morning on account of the heat. The observations at noon showed that we were in latitude 15 degrees 47 seconds south, longitude 135 degrees 20 seconds west, the distance accomplished during the last 24 hours being 181 miles. We have now made good 4,067 miles from Valparaiso and are 815 miles distant from Tahiti. At 5 p.m. we had prayers and a sermon, also on deck. It was then almost calm, and at 8 o'clock we again began steaming, in order to ensure our making the island of Tata Kotoroa, 200 miles off, before dark tomorrow. Monday, November 27th. I was on deck at 3.30 a.m. Everybody on board was more or less excited at the prospect of making land, after 28 days at sea. It was a delicious morning with a favorable breeze, and under steam and sail, we progressed at the rate of from ten to eleven and a half knots an hour. Several birds flew on board, amongst whom were two boobies, who hovered round us and appeared to examine everything with great curiosity, especially the little wind vanes at the extremity of the masts. At last they settled on the foretop mast, whereupon one of the sailors went up to try and catch them. They observed his movements closely, and appeared to be specially interested in his cap, but as he approached, first one and then the other flew away for a few yards, and then returned to his former position. At last the man, watching his opportunity, managed to seize one of them by his legs and bring him down in triumph, despite flapping wings and pecks from a sharp beak. He was shut up in the fowl pen, now, alas, empty of its proper denizens, where we had an opportunity of examining him before he was killed. He was a fine, handsome gray bird with large blue eyes and a wild hawk-like look. At one o'clock we were almost sailing over the spot marked by Findlay as the situation of Tadakotopoto, or Anonymous Island, but there was nothing whatever visible in the shape of land, even from the masthead, where a man was stationed and from which it was possible to see a distance of ten or fifteen miles. Tom went up himself several times, and scanned the horizon carefully but in vain. It is therefore evident either that the position of the island is incorrectly stated, or that it has become submerged. I believe that in these seas there are many islands marked that have no existence, and that several that do exist are not marked, which renders it necessary to keep a constant good lookout. What a charming task it would be thoroughly to survey these parts, and to correct the present charts where necessary, and how much I should like to be one of the officers appointed for the service. At one thirty p.m. land was sighted from the masthead, and at two o'clock I saw from the deck what looked like plumes of dark ostrich feathers rising from the sea. This was the island of Tetecotoroa, also known as Narcissus, or Clark Island, to the eastward of the Paumotu, or low archipelago of the South Seas. The sailing directions describe the inhabitants as hostile, and Sir Edward Belcher mentions that some of them tried to cut off the boats sent from a man-of-war for water. We were therefore afraid to attempt a landing, but sailed as near as we could to the shore, which, surrounded by a rampart of snow-white coral, and clothed almost to the water's edge with feathery palms, coconut trees, and luxuriant vegetation of various kinds, looked very tempting." A few canoes were drawn up on the beach near a large hut, out of which three or four natives came, and, having looked at us for some time, ran off into the woods. Blue smoke could be seen curling up from several points of the forest, no doubt indicating the presence of more natives, whose dwellings were concealed by the trees. After lunch, Tom had me hoisted up to the fore topmast head in a boatswain's chair, which is simply a small plank suspended by ropes at the four corners, and used by the men to sit on when they scrape the masts. 
I was very carefully secured with a rope tied round my petticoats, and knocking against the various ropes on my way, was then gently hoisted up to what seemed at first a giddy height, but when once I got accustomed to the smallness of the seat, the airiness of my perch, and the increased roll of the vessel, I found my position by no means an unpleasant one. Tom climbed up the rigging and joined me shortly afterwards. From our elevated post, we could see plainly the formation of the island and the lagoon in the center, encircled by a band of coral, in some places white, bare, and narrow, in others wide and covered with palm trees and rich vegetation. It was, moreover, possible to understand better the theory of the formation of these coral islands. I was so happy up aloft that I did not care to descend, and it was almost as interesting to observe what a strange and disproportioned appearance everything and everybody on board the yacht presented from my novel position, as it was to examine the island we were passing. The two younger children and the dogs took the greatest interest in my aerial expedition, and never ceased calling to me and barking, until I was once more let down safely into their midst. As soon as we had seen all we could of the island, fires were banked, and we proceeded under sail alone throughout the evening and night. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. The South Sea Islands And all throughout the air there reigned the sense Of waking dream with luscious thoughts o'erladen, Of joy too conscious made and too intense By the swift advent of excessive Aden, Bewilderment of beauty's affluence. Tuesday, November 28th we passed Anna, or Chain Island, in the morning watch before daybreak. I came on deck to try and get a glimpse of it, and was rewarded by a glorious sunrise. We had a nice eight-knot breeze and a strong current in our favor, and just before breakfast Tom descried from the masthead Amanu, or Muller Island, which we had hardly expected to make before ten or eleven o'clock. Someone remarked that it seemed almost as if it had come out to meet us. The reef encircling this island varies much in height and vegetation. In some places it supports a noble grove of trees, in others the sea breaks over the half-submerged coral bed, the first obstacle it has met for four thousand miles, with a roar like thunder. Before we had lost sight of Amanu, the island of Hau Harp, or Bow Island, was visible on our port bow. I wished very much to land, and at last persuaded Tom, who was rather anxious on the score of the natives, to allow some of us to make the attempt, us cautioning to turn away from the shore directly, in case the islanders looked at all doubtful in their attitude and intentions. After lunch, therefore, we hove to, and the gig's crew were ordered to arm themselves with revolvers and rifles, which they were not to show unless required to do so. All the gentlemen had revolvers, and Mabel and I were also provided with two small ones, Phillips and Muriel being the only unarmed members of the party. I took a bag full of beads, knives, looking-glasses, and pictures, for barter and presents, and with these preparations we set off to make our first personal acquaintance with the islanders of the South Pacific. Tom gave us a tow to windward, and we then rowed direct to a point on one side of the entrance to the lagoon, where we saw some natives waving something white. As we approached, we could distinguish several figures standing on the point, under the shade of some coconut trees, and on the opposite side of the entrance, some canoes were drawn up on the beach, by the side of a hut, close to a large clump of low trees. We were by this time surrounded by breakers, and it required no little skill to steer the boat safely through the broken water, between the race of the tide on one side and the overfall from the coral reef on the other. It was successfully done, however, and, having rounded the point, we found ourselves at once in the waters of the tranquil lagoon. We should have preferred to land at the point had it been possible, as it was doubtful whether it would be safe to go round the corner and so lose sight of the yacht, but the intentions of the natives seemed peaceable, several of them running into the water up to their waists to meet us, while others could be seen hurrying along the beach, the women carrying what looked like bunches of fruit. 
It is really impossible to describe the beauty of the scene before us. Submarine coral forests of every color, studded with sea flowers, anemones, and echidnidae, of a brilliancy only to be seen in dreamland shoals of the brightest and swiftest fish darting and flashing in and out shells every one of which was fit to hold the place of honor in a conchologist's collection moving slowly along with their living inmates this is what we saw when we looked down from the side of the boat into the depths below the surface of the water glittered with every imaginable tint from the palest aquamarine to the brightest emerald from the pure light blue of the turquoise to the deep dark blue of the sapphire and was dotted here and there with patches of red brown and green coral rising from the mass below before us on the shore there spread the rich growth of tropical vegetation shaded by palms and coconuts and enlivened by the presence of native women in red blue and green garments and men in motley costumes bringing fish fowls and bunches of coconuts born like the grapes brought back from the land of canaan by the spies on poles as soon as we touched the shore the men rushed forward to meet us and to shake hands and having left the muskets and revolvers judiciously out of sight in the boat we were conducted to a cluster of huts made of branches or rather leaves of the palm tree tied by their footstalks across two poles and hanging down to the ground here we were met by the women and children who likewise all went through the ceremony of shaking hands with us after which the head woman who was very good-looking and was dressed in a cherry-coloured calico gown with two long plaits of black hair hanging down her back spread a mat for me to sit upon just outside the hut by this time there was quite a little crowd of people assembled round amongst whom i noticed one woman with a baby who had her hair sticking straight out all round her head and another who held a portion of her dress constantly before her face. After the gentleman had walked away, she removed the cloth, and I then saw that her nose had been cut off. Most of the women were good-looking, with dark complexions and quantities of well-greased, neatly plaited black hair, but we did not see a single young girl, though there were plenty of children and babies and lots of boys, the latter of whom, like some of the older women, had only a piece of palm matting round their loins. We therefore came to the conclusion that the girls must have been sent away intentionally when the approach of the yacht was observed. As soon as I was seated, the head woman told one of the men to knock down some coconuts from the trees close by, and after cutting off the ends, she offered us a drink of the fresh cool milk, which was all the sweeter and better for the fact that the nuts were not nearly ripe. While this was going on, the natives brought piles of coconuts, fish, and fowls, and laid them at our feet as a present. Some of the fish were of a dark brown color, like bream. Others were long and thin, with a pipe-like nose and four fins, somewhat resembling the wings of a flying fish. Seeing smoke in the distance, rising from under some high palm trees, we thought we should like to go and see whence it proceeded, and accordingly set off to walk through a sort of bush, over sharp coral that cut one's boots terribly, the sun blazing down upon us fiercely all the time, until we reached a little settlement consisting of several huts the inhabitants of which were absent fine plaited mats for beds coconut shells for cups mother-of-pearl shells for plates and coral of various kinds and shapes for dishes and cooking utensils formed their only furniture we saw three women one very old with nothing but a palm-leaf mat as a covering the others dressed in the apparently universal costume consisting of a long bright-colored gown put into a yoke at the shoulders and flowing thence loosely to the ground which completely conceals the wearer's form even to the tips of her toes i think these dresses must come from england or america for they are evidently machine-made and the cotton stuffed of which they are composed has the most extraordinary patterns printed on it i ever saw cherry and white dark blue and yellow or white stripes red with yellow spots and blue with yellow crosses appear to be the favorite designs the women seemed gentle and kind and were delighted with some beads looking glasses and knives i gave them in return for which they brought us quantities of beautiful shells we saw the large iron knee of a vessel in one spot during our walk and wondered how it came there in another place we saw a canoe in process of construction ingeniously made of boards sewed together with plaited palm leaves the canoes in use here are very high, long, and narrow, 
and are only kept from upsetting by means of a tremendous outrigger, consisting of a log fastened to the extremity of two bent pieces of wood, projecting sideways from each end of the boat. The only animals we met with in our ramble were four pigs and a few chickens, and no other livestock of any kind was visible. No attempt seemed to be made at the cultivation of the ground, and I think if there had been, we must have observed it, for our party separated and walked a good distance in various directions. The natives made us understand that on the other side of the entrance to the lagoon, in the better sort of house we had noticed, there resided a white man. He did not, however, make his appearance during our visit, and I imagine he must have been one of those individuals called beachcombers, referred to in so many of the books that treat of the South Sea Islands, a sort of near do well Englishman or American, rather afraid of meeting any of his own countrymen, but very clever at making a bargain between a ship's crew and the natives, with considerable profit to himself. Among the bushes we found numbers of large hermit crabs, crawling or rather running about in whelk shells, half a dozen of them occasionally having a grand fight amongst themselves. We picked up at least twenty different sorts of gracefully shaped pieces of coral, and quantities of shells of an infinite variety of form and color, cowries, helmet shells, the shells from which cameos are sometimes cut, mother-of-pearl shells, and a large spiral univalve, nearly a foot long, with dark brown spots and stripes on a delicate cream-colored ground, like the skin of a tiger or leopard. On our way back to the huts, we peeped into several of the canoes drawn up on the beach, in which were some fish spears and a fish hook, nearly three inches long, made of solid mother-of-pearl, the natural curve of the shell from which it was cut being preserved. A piece of bone was securely fastened to it by means of some pig's hair, but there was no bait, and it seemed that the glitter of the mother-of-pearl alone serves as a sufficient allurement to the fish. In nearly all accounts of voyages in the South Seas, much space is devoted to the description of the purchase, or rather barter, of hogs. We thought we could not do better than follow as far as possible the example of our predecessors, and accordingly bought two little pigs for two shillings each. They were evidently quite pets, lying on the mats outside the huts, and coming when called just like dogs. The one I first bought appeared to be quite happy and content to be carried under my arm. The native seemed quite to understand the value of money, and did not hesitate to ask for it in return for the coconuts full of shells which they brought us. I fancy some of the Tahiti schooners trade here for pearl, shells, and beche de mer. The coconuts, fowls, fish, coral, etc., having been put into our boat, we shook hands with the friendly islanders and embarked, and having rounded the point we soon found ourselves again in the broken water outside the lagoon, where the race of the tide and the overfall were now much more violent than they had been when we landed. If we had once been drawn into the current, we should have stood a good chance of being knocked to pieces on the coral reefs, strong as our boat was, but the danger was happily avoided, and we reached the yacht safely, much to Tom's relief. The natives did not exhibit the slightest curiosity about us during our visit to the island, and though they received us with courtesy and assisted us as far as they could on our arrival and departure, they did not follow us about while on shore, nor, with the exception of one or two of them, did they take the trouble to walk across the point to see us get into the open sea and join the yacht. In this respect, they might have given a lesson to many civilized people, so gentle, genial, and graceful yet dignified were their manners. The screw having been feathered and the sails set, our voyage was at once resumed. A few miles from where we had landed, we saw, high and dry on the coral reef skirting the island, a large square-built schooner of about 500 tons, her masts gone, her hull bleached white by the sun, and a great hole in her side. She was on the inside of the reef, and must therefore either have drifted there from the lagoon, or else have been lifted bodily across by one of the big Pacific rollers in some terrible storm. No doubt the iron knee we had seen on the island originally formed part of this vessel. Wednesday, November 29th. We seem to have got into the real southeast trades, just as the chart tells us we ought to expect to lose them, for there was a strong fair breeze all day, which made it very pleasant on deck in the shade of the sails but it was exceedingly hot in the saloon where some of the woodwork has been pulled down in order to secure better ventilation for the galley and the berths of some of the men, who, I hope, appreciate the alteration, 
for it is a source of considerable discomfort to us. We had the bigger of our two little pigs for dinner today, and a welcome change it was from the salt and potted meats. He was most excellent and fully corroborated Captain Cook's statement as to the superiority of South Sea Island pork to any other, a fact which is doubtless due to the pigs being fed entirely on coconuts and breadfruit. Still, it seemed a pity to eat such a tame creature, and I mean to try and preserve the other one's life, unless we are much longer than we expect in reaching Tahiti. He is only about ten inches long, but looks at least a hundred years old, and is altogether the most quaint, old-fashioned little object you ever saw. He has taken a great fancy to the dogs, and trots about after me with them everywhere, on the tips of his little toes, even up and down the steep cabin stairs. I call him a gag because he walks so delicately, whilst others accost him as beau, not only on account of his elegant manners, but as being the name of his former home. The moon was more brilliant this evening than we have yet seen her during our voyage, and we could enjoy sitting on deck reading and even doing some coarse needlework without any other light. One splendid meteor flashed across the sky. It was of a light orange color with a fiery tail about two degrees in extent, and described in its course an arc of about sixty degrees from south-southeast to north-northwest before it disappeared into space far above the horizon. If the night had been darker, the spectacle would have been finer, but even as it was, the moon seemed quite paled for a few minutes afterwards. We have seen many meteors, falling stars, and shooting stars since we left Valparaiso, but none so fine as the one this evening. Friday, December 1st. The sun rose grandly, but the heavy black and red clouds, looking like flames and smoke from a furnace, gave promise of more rain. The heat was greater today than any we have yet felt, and it is now nearly midwinter at home. At 5 a.m. we made the island of Matia, and expected to reach it in about an hour and a half, but the wind fell light and it was a quarter to ten before we got into the gig and set out for the shore. There are not many instructions about landing, either in Captain Cook or Findlay, but the latter mentions that houses are to be found on the south side of the island. We thought, however, we could distinguish from the yacht a little cove close to some huts at another part of the shore where the surf did not break so heavily. We accordingly rowed straight for it, and as we approached we could see the natives coming down from all parts to meet us, the women dressed in the same sort of long, bright, flowing garments we had seen at Howe Harp, with the addition of garlands round their necks and heads, the men wearing gay-colored loincloths, shirts of Manchester cotton stuff, flying loose in the wind, and sailors' hats with garlands round them, or colored silk handkerchiefs, red and orange evidently having the preference, tied over their heads and jauntily knotted on one side. Several of the men waded out into the surf to meet us, sometimes standing on a rock two feet above the water, sometimes buried up to their necks by a sudden wave. But the rocks were sharp, the only available passage was narrow, and the rollers long and high, and altogether it looked, upon closer inspection, too unpromising a place to attempt a landing. Much to the disappointment of the natives, therefore, we decided to go round and try the other side of the island. Seeing us prepare to depart, the people on shore immediately launched a tiny canoe with an enormous outrigger and a man dressed in a pale green shirt, dark blue and yellow undergarment, and with a silk handkerchief and garland on his head, came alongside and made signs that he would take us ashore one by one in his frail-looking craft. But the heavy Pacific rollers and the sharp rocks daunted us, and we declined his offer with thanks and rowed off to the southward. Anything more enticing than the cove we were quitting can hardly be imagined. A fringe of coconuts and breadfruit trees, overhanging an undergrowth of bright glossy foliage and flowers, a few half-hidden palm-leaf-covered huts, from one of which, I suppose the chiefs, a tattered Tahitian flag floated in the breeze, a small schooner drawn up among the trees and carefully covered with mats, the steep sugar-loaf point at the entrance to the cove, clothed to its summit with grass and vegetation. These were the objects which attracted our attention in our hurried survey of the scene. We had to give the island a wide berth in rowing round it, on account of the heavy rollers, which seemed to come from every side, breaking in surf against the dark brown cliffs, and throwing columns of white spray, from which the brilliant sunshine was reflected in rainbow hues, high into the air. 
As we proceeded, matters looked worse and worse, and the motion of the boat became so disagreeable that both Muriel and I were very ill. At last we came to a spot where we could see some people sitting on the shore, and several others, who had probably come over from the other side to meet us, running swiftly down the sides of the cliffs to the beach. The island was of a different character from the one we had already visited, and was evidently of volcanic origin. No coral was anywhere to be seen, but there were big rocks jutting out at intervals into the sea all round it, one of which seemed large enough to afford us a sort of shelter in landing. The natives waved and pointed towards the channel beyond this rock, and one or two swam out to meet us, but we soon found that the channel would not be wide enough to admit our big boat, though it was no doubt sufficient for a light canoe, drawing some two inches of water. We therefore reluctantly turned away and resumed our uneasy coasting voyage, in the course of which we passed some nearly leafless trees, full of white patches, too large for flowers, which afterwards turned out to be booby birds, who here find a resting place. They are so numerous that it is hardly possible to walk beneath the trees without treading on their eggs. Having completed the circuit of the island, we found ourselves once more opposite the spot where we had first thought of landing, and the tide being by this time a little higher, we decided to make another attempt. Some of the natives, seeing us approach, plunged into the water as before, and seized the gunwale of the boat, while others on shore brought down rollers to put beneath our keel. We went in on the top of a big wave, and thus at last found ourselves, boat and all, high and dry on the beach of Matia. The people came down to meet us and conducted us to the house of the chief, who, with his pretty wife, received us kindly, but with much gravity and dignity. Mats were placed for me to sit upon, wreaths were offered me for my head and neck, and coconut milk to drink. We wished for some bananas, and they immediately cut down a tree in order to obtain a bunch. Coconuts were at the same time thrown down from the trees, and a collection of fruit, poultry, and meat, the latter consisting of the immemorial hog, was laid at our feet as a present from the chief. The rest of the natives brought us pearls, shells, mother-of-pearl, small canoes, fish-hooks, young boobies, and all sorts of things, for barter, but the chief himself refused any return for his gift. Perhaps the greatest curiosity they offered us was about six fathoms of fine twine made from human hair. Before these islands were visited by Europeans, this was the material from which fishing lines were made, but it is now rarely used and is consequently very difficult to procure. The young boobies they brought us looked just like a white powder puff and were covered with down far thicker and softer than any swan's down I ever saw. The natives seemed quite au fait in the matter of monetary transactions and exchanges. For an English sovereign, they would give you change at the rate of five dollars. Chilean or United States dollars they accepted readily, but Brazilian currency they would not look at. They were pleased with knives, beads, looking glasses, and picture papers I had brought on shore, and we did a brisk trade. We experienced great difficulty in explaining to them that we wanted some fresh eggs, Muriel's a special fancy, and a luxury which we have been without for some time. At last, by pointing to the fowls and picking up some small egg-shaped stones, we managed to procure a few, though from the time it took to collect them, I should think the island must have been scoured in the search for them. Most of the natives seemed puzzled to comprehend why we had visited the island at all. No sell brandy? No. No steely men? No. No do what then? Their knowledge of English was too limited to enable us to make them understand that we were only making a voyage of circumnavigation in a yacht. It was now time to bid farewell to our amiable hosts and their beautiful island. As we reached the landing place, a small schooner, which we had previously noticed in the distance, came close to the shore, and a canoe put off from the island to meet it. We found that the vessel was bringing back from Tahiti and other places some of the inhabitants of the island, who had been away on a visit or in search of work. The meeting of the reunited friends and relatives was in some cases quite touching. Two women in particular sat and embraced each other for nearly a quarter of an hour without moving, but with tears running down their faces. All our gifts and purchases having been placed in the boat, and one or two of us having embarked, she was shoved out over the wooden rollers into the narrow channel, where she lay to while the rest of the party were brought alongside, one by one, in a frail canoe, 
an operation which occupied some time, during which we had leisure once more to admire the little bay I have already attempted to describe. We asked the captain of the schooner, who spoke French, to give us a tow off to the yacht, which he willingly consented to do, chatting cheerfully all the time, but evidently fearful of approaching too close to the yacht, and positively refusing our invitation to him to come on board. There can be little doubt that he mistrusted our intentions and feared we might attempt to kidnap him and his crew, for the whites have, in too many cases, behaved in a most villainous manner to the inhabitants of these islands, who are, as a rule, to which there are, of course, exceptions, a kind and gentle people. I think if the many instances of the murder of ships and boats' crews could be thoroughly sifted to the bottom, it would be found that most of them were acts of reprisal and revenge for brutal atrocities committed on the defenseless natives, who have been kidnapped, plundered, and murdered by unscrupulous traders and adventurers. Unfortunately, the good suffer for the bad, and such lives as those of Captain Goodenough and Bishop Pattison are sacrificed through the unpardonable misconduct of others, perhaps their own countrymen. It is still quite a chance how you may be received in some of the islands, for if the visit of the last ship was the occasion of the murder, plunder, and ill-treatment of the inhabitants, it is not to be wondered at that the next comers should be received with distrust, if not with treachery and violence. We reached the yacht at four o'clock, rather exhausted by so many hours' exposure to the broiling sun, having had nothing to eat since breakfast at seven a.m., except coconuts and bananas. The ship was put about, the sails filled, and continuing steadily on our course throughout the evening, we made the smaller of the two peninsulas that form the island of Tahiti at 10.30 p.m. Saturday, December 2nd. We were dodging on and off all night, and at daybreak the weather was thick and rainy. At 4.30 a.m. we made the land again, and crept slowly along it, past Point Venus and the lighthouse in Matavai Bay, Captain Cook's first anchorage, until we were off the harbor of Papiti. Footnote. Papiete or Papite. A bag of water. End footnote. The rain was now descending in torrents, and we lay to outside the reef for a short time, until a French pilot came on board and took us in through the narrow entrance. It was curious, while we were tumbling about in the rough sea outside, to see the natives placidly fishing in the tiniest of canoes on the lagoon inside the reef, the waves beating all the time furiously on the outer surface of the coral breakwater, as if anxious to seize and engulf them. At nine o'clock we were safely anchored in the chief port of the island of Tahiti. Perhaps I cannot better bring this account of our long voyage from Valparaiso to a conclusion than by a quotation from a charming book given to me at Rio, which I have lately been reading. Baron de Hubner, Promenade autour du monde, Les jours se souvent et se ressemblant. Sauf le cour épisode du mauvais temps, ces trois semaines me font l'effet d'un charmant rêve, d'un conte de fées, d'une promenade imaginaire à travers une salle immense, tout au est le pis lazoui, pas un moment de nuit ou d'impatience. Si vous voulez abréger les langues d'un grand traversier, distribuez bien votre temps et observez le règlement que vous voulez imposer. C'est un moyen sûr de se faire promptement à la vie claustrale et même dans joui. We have been five weeks at sea and have enjoyed them quite as much as the Baron did his three. We saw but two ships between Valparaiso and Takotoroa, he saw only one between San Francisco and Yokohama. It is indeed a vast and lonely ocean that we have traversed. End of chapter 13。Chapter 14 of A Voyage in the Sunbeam by Anna Brassey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dovey Cross, Taos, New Mexico. At Tahiti. The kava feast, the yam, the cocoa's root, which bears at once the cup and milk and fruit, the bread tree which without the plowshare yields, 
the unreaped harvest of unfurrowed fields these with the luxuries of seas and woods the airy joys of social solitudes tamed each rude wanderer saturday december second the anchor was dropped in the harbour of papiti at nine o'clock and a couple of hours later by which time the weather had cleared we went ashore and at once found ourselves in the midst of a fairy-like scene to describe which is almost impossible so bewildering is it in the brightness and variety of its colouring the magnolias and yellow and scarlet hibiscus overshadowing the water the velvety turf on to which one steps from the boat the white road running between rows of wooden houses whose little gardens are a mass of flowers the men and women clad in the gayest robes and decked with flowers the piles of unfamiliar fruit lying on the grass waiting to be transported to the coasting vessels in the harbour the wide-spreading background of hills clad in verdure to their summits these are but a few of the objects which greet the newcomer in his first contact with the shore we strolled about and left our letters of introduction but the people to whom they were addressed were at breakfast and we were deliberating how best to dispose of our time when a gentleman accosted us and seeing how new it all was to us strangers offered to show us round the town the streets of papiti running back at right angles with the beach seem to have wonderfully grand names such as the rue de rivoli rue de paris etc each street is shaded by an avenue of high trees whose branches meet and interlace overhead forming a sort of leafy tunnel through which the sea breeze passes refreshingly there is also what is called the chinaman's quarter through which we walked and which consists of a collection of regular chinese built bamboo houses whose occupants all wore their national costume pigtail included the french commandant lives in a charming residence surrounded by gardens just opposite the palace of queen pomere who is at present at the island of bola bola taking care of her little grandchild aged five the queen of the island she went down in a french man-o-war the limier ten days ago and has been obliged to remain owing to some disturbances amongst the natives i am rather disappointed that she is absent as i should like to see a person of whom i have heard so much having completed our tour we next went to call on the british consul who received us kindly and entertained us with an interesting account of the island and its inhabitants its pearl fisheries and trade the french policy the missionaries etc on all of which subjects he is well informed he has just completed an exhaustive consular report on the condition of the island which will no doubt appear in due course in the form of a blue book on our return to Monsieur Brander's office, where we had left one of our letters of introduction, we found the manager, with whom we had a long chat before returning on board. At 5 p.m. we went for a row in the glance and the flash to the coral reef, now illumined by the rays of the setting sun. Who can describe these wonderful gardens of the deep, on which we now gazed through ten and twenty fathoms of crystal water? Who can enumerate or describe the strange creatures moving about and darting hither and thither amid the masses of coral forming their submarine home there were shells of rare shape brighter than if they had been polished by the hand of the most skilful artist crabs of all sizes scuttling and sidling along sea anemones spreading their delicate feelers in search of prey and many other kinds of zoophytes crawling slowly over the reef and scarlet blue yellow gold violet spotted striped and winged fish short long pointed and blunt of the most varied shapes were darting about like birds among the coral trees at last after frequent stoppages to allow time for admiration we reached the outer reef hauled the boat up and made her fast and in bathing shoes started on a paddling expedition such a paddle it was too over the coral the surf breaking far above our heads and the underflow though only a few inches deep nearly carrying me and the children off our legs there were one or two native fishermen walking along the reef whipping the water but they appeared to have caught only a few small rockfish pretty enough to look at but not apparently good to eat the shades of night compelled us to return to the yacht laden with corals of many different species 
after dinner the bay was illuminated by the torches of the native fishermen in canoes on the reef tom and i went to look at them but did not see them catch anything each canoe contained at least three people one of whom propelled the boat another stood up waving about a torch dipped in some resinous substance which threw a strong light on the water while the third stood in the bows armed with a spear made of a bundle of wires tied to a long pole not at all unlike a gigantic egg whip with all its loops cut into points this is aimed with great dexterity at the fish who are either transfixed or jammed between the prongs the fine figures of the natives lighted up by the flickering torches and standing out in bold relief against the dark blue starlit sky would have served as models for the sculptors of ancient greece sunday december third at a quarter to five this morning some of us landed to see the market this being the great day when the natives come in from the country and surrounding villages by sea and by land in boats or on horseback to sell their produce and buy necessaries for the coming week we walked through the shady streets to the two covered market buildings partitioned across with great bunches of oranges plantains and many coloured vegetables hung on strings the mats beds and pillows still lying about suggested the idea that the salesmen and women had passed the night amongst their wares the gaily attired good-looking flower-decorated crowd of some seven or eight hundred people all chatting and laughing and some staring at us but not rudely looked much more like a chorus of opera singers dressed for their parts in some grand spectacle than ordinary market-going peasants whichever way one turned the prospect was an animated and attractive one here beneath the shade of large smooth light green banana leaves was a group of earnest bargainers for mysterious-looking fish luscious fruit and vegetables there sheltered by a drooping mango whose rich clusters of purple and orange fruit hung in tempting proximity to lips and hands another little crowd was similarly engaged orange trees were evidently favorite rendezvous and a row of flower sellers had established themselves in front of a hedge of scarlet hibiscus and double cape jasmine every vendor carried his stock in trade however small the articles composing it might be on a bamboo pole across his shoulder occasionally with rather ludicrous effect as for instance when the thick but light pole supported only a tiny fish six inches long at one end and two mangoes at the other everybody seemed to have brought to market just what he or she happened to have on hand however small the quantity the women would have one two or three new laid eggs in a leaf basket one crab or lobster three or four prawns or one little trout under these circumstances marketing for so large a party as ours was a somewhat lengthy operation and i was much amused in watching our providor as he went about collecting things by ones and twos until he had piled a little cart quite full and had had it pushed off to the shady quay we strolled about until six o'clock at which hour the purchasers began to disperse and were just preparing to depart likewise when an old man carrying half a dozen little fish and followed by a small boy laden with vegetables and fruit introduced himself to us as the brother-in-law of queen palmary the fourth and chief of papiti and after a short talk invited us to visit him at his house we consented and following him presently reached a break in the hedge and ditch that ran along the side of the road beyond which was a track bordered by pineapples and dracanes leading to a superior sort of house built in the native style and surrounded as usual by breadfruit coconut banana mango and guava trees we were conducted into one large room which contained two four-post bedsteads and four mattresses laid on the floor two or three trunks and a table in the corner on which were writing materials and a few books the chief himself spoke a very little english his son an equally small amount of french so the conversation languished and after a decent interval we rose to depart our host asked if he might come and see my ship and procured pen ink and paper not of the best quality for me to write an order for him to do so in case lady not at home he also presented me with some pictures of soldiers drawn by his son a boy about eleven years old of whom he seemed very proud and expressed his regret that we could not prolong our stay 
at the same time placing at our disposal the whole house and garden including a fat sow and eleven little pigs several other visitors had arrived by this time one of whom was on horseback and as i was rather tired he was asked if he would kindly allow me to ride down to the landing place he replied that he would lend the horse to a gentleman but not to me as the saddle was not suitable i explained that this made no difference to me and mounted though i did not attempt to follow the fashion of the native ladies here who ride like men our new friend was quite delighted at this and volunteered himself to show us something of the neighborhood accordingly leading my or rather his horse and guiding him carefully over all the rough places he took us through groves and gardens to the grounds belonging to the royal family in which were plantations of various kinds of trees and a thick undergrowth of guava after an enjoyable little expedition we returned to the yacht at about half past seven accompanied by the small boy who had been carrying our special purchases from the market all this time and by a little tale of followers at half past eight we breakfasted so as to be ready for the service at the native church at ten o'clock but several visitors arrived in the interval and we had rather a bustle to get off in time after all we landed close to the church under the shade of an hibiscus whose yellow and orange flowers dropped off into the sea and floated away amongst the coral rocks peeping out of the water here and there the building appeared to be full to overflowing the windows and doors were all wide open and many members of the congregation were seated on the steps on the lawn and on the grassy slope beyond listening to a discourse in the native language most of the people wore the native costume which especially when made of black stuff and surmounted by a little sailor's hat decorated with a bandana handkerchief or a wreath of flowers was very becoming sailors hats are universally worn and are generally made by the natives themselves from plantain or palm leaves or from the inside fibre of the arrowroot some rather elderly men and women in the front rows were taking notes of the sermon i found afterwards that they belonged to the bible class and that their great pride was to meet after the service and repeat by heart nearly all they had heard this seems to show at least a desire to profit by the minister's efforts after the usual service there were two christenings the babies were held at the font by the men who looked extremely sheepish one baby was grandly attired in a book muslin dress with flounces a tail at least six feet long dragging on the ground and a lace cap with cherry-coloured bows the other was nearly as smart in a white worked long frock and cap trimmed with blue bows the christenings over there was a hymn somewhat monotonous as to time and tune but sung with much fervour followed by the administration of the sacrament in which coconut milk took the place of wine and breadfruit that of bread the proper elements were originally used but experience proved that although the bread went round pretty well the cup was almost invariably emptied by the first two or three communicants sometimes with unfortunate results after service we drove through the shady avenues of the town into the open country past trim little villas and sugar-cane plantations until we turned off the main road and entered an avenue of mangoes whence a rough road cut through a guava thicket leads to the main gate of Fa'atua. footnote futawa or Fa'atuao, to make friends and footnote a regular square indian bungalow with thatched roofs verandas covered with creepers windows opening to the ground and steps leading to the gardens on every side ample accommodation for stables kitchens servants being provided in numerous outbuildings soon after breakfast mrs brander dressed me in one of her own native costumes and we drove to the outskirts of a dense forest through which a footpath leads to the waterfall and fort of fa taua here we found horses waiting for us on which we rode accompanied by the gentleman on foot through a thick growth of palms orange trees guavas and other tropical trees some of which were overhung and almost choked by luxuriant creepers specially noticeable among the latter was a gorgeous purple passion flower with orange-coloured fruit as big as pumpkins that covered everything with its vigorous growth the path was always narrow and sometimes steep and we had frequently almost to creep under the overhanging boughs or to turn aside to avoid a more than usually dense mass of creepers 
we crossed several small rivers and at last reached a spot that commanded a view of the waterfall on the other side of a deep ravine just below the fort that crowns the height a river issues from a narrow cleft in the rock and falls at a single bound from the edge of an almost perpendicular cliff six hundred feet high into the valley beneath first one sees the rush of blue water gradually changing in its descent to a cloud of white spray which in its turn is lost in a rainbow of mist imagine that from beneath the shade of feathery palms and broad-leaved bananas through a network of ferns and creepers you are looking upon the staubach in switzerland magnified in height and with a background of verdure clad mountains and you will have some idea of the fall of Fa'a as we beheld it after resting a little while and taking some sketches we climbed up to the fort itself a place of considerable interest where the natives held out to the very last against the french on the bank opposite the fort the last islander killed during the struggle for independence was shot while trying to escape situated in the centre of a group of mountains with valleys branching off in all directions the fort could hold communication with every part of the coast and there can be little doubt that it would have held out much longer than it did but for the treachery of one of the garrison who led the invaders under cover of the night and by devious paths to the top of a hill commanding the position now the ramparts and earthworks are overrun and almost hidden by roses originally planted i suppose by the newcomers they have spread rapidly in all directions till the hillsides and summits are quite a blush with the fragrant bloom having enjoyed some strawberries and some icy cold water from a spring and heard a long account of the war from the guardian we found it was time to commence our return journey as it was now getting late we descended much more quickly than we had come up but daylight had faded into the brief tropical twilight and that again into the shades of night ere we reached the carriage dinner and evening service brought the day to a conclusion and i retired not unwillingly to bed to dream of the charms of tahiti sometimes i think that all i have seen must be only a long vision and that too soon i shall awaken to the cold reality the flowers the fruit the colours worn by every one the whole scene and its surroundings seem almost too fairy-like to have an actual existence i am in despair when i attempt to describe all these things i feel that i cannot do anything like justice to their merits and yet i fear all the time that what i say may be looked upon as an exaggeration long dreamy lawns and birds on happy wings keeping their homes in never rifled bowers cool fountains filling with their murmurings the sunny silence twixt the chiming hours at daybreak next morning when i went on deck it was a dead calm the sea breeze had not yet come in and there was not a ripple on the surface of the harbour outside two little white trading schooners lay becalmed inside the harbour tug was getting up steam on shore a few gaily dressed natives were hurrying home with their early market produce and others were stretched lazily on the grass at the water's edge or on the benches under the trees our stores for the day a picturesque-looking heap of fish fruit vegetables and flowers were on the steps waiting to be brought off and guarded in the meantime by natives in costumes of pink blue orange and a delicate pale green they specially affect the light mists rolled gradually away from the mountain tops and there was every prospect of a fine day for a projected excursion i went ashore to fetch some of the fresh gathered fruit and soon we had a feast of luscious pineapples juicy mangoes bananas and oranges with the dew still upon them the mango is certainly the king of fruit its flavor is a combination of apricot and pineapple with the slightest possible suspicion of turpentine thrown in to give a piquancy to the whole i dare say it sounds a strange mixture but i can only say that the result is delicious to enjoy mangoes thoroughly you ought not to eat them in company but leaning over the side of the ship in the early morning with your sleeves tucked up to your elbows using no knife and fork but tearing off the skin with your teeth and sucking the abundant juice we breakfasted at half past six and at a little before eight went ashore where we were met by a sort of charabanc or american wagon with three seats one behind the other all facing the horses 
and roomy and comfortable enough for two persons our transatlantic cousins certainly understand thoroughly and do their best to improve everything connected with the locomotion they love so well a chinese coachman and a thin but active pair of little horses completed the turnout maybell sat beside the coachman and we four packed into the other two seats with all our belongings sun was certainly very powerful when we emerged from the shady groves of papiti but there was a nice breeze and sometimes we got under the shade of coconut trees we reached punauea at about half past nine and changed horses there while waiting hot and thirsty under the shelter of some trees we asked for a coconut whereupon a man standing by immediately tied a withy of banana leaves round his feet and proceeded to climb or rather hop up the nearest tree raising himself with his two hands and his feet alternately with an exactly similar action to that of our old friend the monkey on the stick people who have tasted the coconut only in england can have no idea what a delicious fruit it really is when nearly ripe and freshly plucked the natives remove the outer husk just leaving a little piece to serve as a foot for the pale brown cup to rest on they then smooth off the top and you have an elegant vase something like a mounted ostrich egg in appearance lined with the snowiest ivory and containing about three pints of cool sweet water why it is called milk i cannot understand for it is as clear as crystal and is always cool and refreshing though the nut in which it is contained has generally been exposed to the fiercest sun in many of the coral islands where the water is brackish the natives drink scarcely anything but coconut milk and even here if you are thirsty and ask for a glass of water you are almost always presented with a coconut instead from punauea onwards the scenery increased in beauty and the foliage was if possible more luxuriant than ever the road ran through extensive coffee sugar-cane indian corn orange coconut and cotton plantations and vanilla carefully trained on bamboos growing in the thick shade near atamano we passed the house of a great cotton planter and shortly afterwards the curious huts raised on platforms built by some islanders he has imported from the king's mill group to work his plantations they are a wild savage-looking set very inferior to the tahitians in appearance the cotton mills which formerly belonged to a company are now all falling to ruin and in many other parts of the island we passed cotton plantations uncleaned and neglected and fast running to seed and waste so long as the american war lasted a slight profit could be made upon tahitian cotton but now it is hopeless to attempt to cultivate it with any prospect of adequate return the sun was now at its height and we longed to stop and bathe in one of the many fresh-water streams we crossed and afterwards to eat our lunch by the wayside but our chinese coachman always pointed onwards and said eaty much presently horses eaty too at last we arrived at a little house shaded by coconut trees and built in an enclosure near the seashore with restaurant written up over the door we drove in and were met by the proprietor with what must have been rather an embarrassing multiplicity of women and children about his heels the cloth was not laid but the rooms looked clean and there was a heap of tempting-looking fish and fruit in a corner we assured him we were starving and begged for luncheon as soon as possible and in the meantime went for a dip in the sea but the water was shallow and the sun made the temperature at least ninety degrees so that our bath was not very refreshing on our return we found the table most enticingly laid out with little scarlet crayfish embedded in cool green lettuce leaves fruit of various kinds good wine and fair bread all arranged on a clean though coarse tablecloth there was also a savoury omelette so good that tom asked for a second when to our astonishment there appeared a plump roast fowl with most artistic gravy and fried potatoes then came a beefsteak au champignon and some excellent coffee to wind up with on making the host our compliments he said je fais la cuisine moi-même madame in the course of our repast we again tasted the breadfruit but did not much appreciate it though it was this time cooked in the native fashion roasted underground by means of hot stones our coachman was becoming impatient so we bade farewell to our host and resumed our journey we crossed innumerable streams on our way 
generally full not only of water but also of bathers for the tahitians are very fond of water and always bathe once or twice a day in the fresh streams even after having been in the sea in many places along the road people were making hay from short grass and in others they were weighing it preparatory to sending it into town but they say the grass grown here is not at all nourishing for horses and some people import it from valparaiso the road round the island is called the broom road convicts were employed in its original formation and now it is the punishment for any one getting drunk in any part of the island to be set to work to sweep repair and keep in order a piece of the road in the neighbourhood of his dwelling it is the one good road of tahiti encircling the larger of the two peninsulas close to the seashore and surmounting the low mountain range in the centre of the isthmus before long we found ourselves close to taravao the narrow strip of land connecting the two peninsulas into which tahiti is divided and commenced to ascend the hills that form the backbone of the island we climbed up and up reaching the summit at last to behold a magnificent prospect on all sides then a short sharp descent a long drive over grass roads through a rich forest and again a brief ascent brought us to our sleeping quarters for the night the hotel de isme situated in a valley in the midst of a dense grove of coconuts and bananas kept by two retired french sailors who came out to meet us and conducted us up a flight of steps on the side of the mud bank to the four rooms forming the hotel these were two sleeping apartments a salon and a salle à manger the walls of which consisted of flat pieces of wood their own width apart something like venetian shutters with unglazed windows and doors opening into the garden we walked about four hundred yards along a grassy road to the sea where Maybelle and I paddled about in shallow water and amused ourselves by picking up coral, shells, and biche de mer, and watching the blue and yellow fish darting in and out among the rocks, until at last we found a place in the coral which made a capital deep-water bath. Dressing again was not such a pleasant affair, owing to the mosquitoes biting us in the most provoking manner. Afterwards we strolled along the shore, which was covered with coconuts and driftwood washed thither, I suppose, from some of the adjacent islands and on our way back to the hotel we gathered a handful of choice exotics and graceful ferns with which to decorate the table the dinner itself really deserves a detailed description if only to show that one may make the tour of tahiti without necessarily having to rough it in the matter of food we had crayfish and salad as a preliminary and next an excellent soup followed by delicious little oysters that cling to the boughs and roots of the guava and mangrove trees overhanging the sea then came a large fish name unknown the inevitable bouilli and cabbage cotelettes a pomme beefsteak au champignon succeeded by crabs and other shellfish including wurali a delicate flavoured kind of lobster an omelette au abricot and dessert of tropical fruits we were also supplied with good wine both red and white and bottled beer i ought in truth to add that the cockroaches were rather lively and plentiful but they did not form a serious drawback to our enjoyment after dinner however when i went to see maybelle to bed hundreds of these creatures about three inches long and broad in proportion scuttled away as i lighted the candle and while we were sitting outside we could see troops of them marching up and down in rows between the crevices of the walls then there were the mosquitoes who hummed and buzzed about us and with whom alas we were doomed to make a closer acquaintance our bed was fitted with the very thickest calico mosquito curtains impervious to the air but not to the venomous little insects who found their way in through every tiny opening in spite of all our efforts to exclude them tuesday december fifth the heat in the night was suffocating and soon after twelve o'clock we both woke up feeling half stifled there was a dim light shining into the room, and Tom said, Thank goodness it's getting daylight. But on striking my repeater, we found to our regret that this was a mistake. In the moonlight, I could see columns of nasty brown cockroaches ascending the bedposts, crawling along the top of the curtains, dropping with a thud onto the bed, and then descending over the side to the ground. At last, I could stand it no longer, and opening the curtains cautiously, I seized my slippers knocked half a dozen brown beasts out of each, wrapped myself in a poncho, previously well shaken, 
gathered my garments around me, surmounted a barricade I had constructed overnight to keep the pigs and chickens out of our doorless room, and fled to the garden. All was still, the only sign of life being a light in a neighboring hut, and I sat out in the open air in comparative comfort, until driven indoors again by torrents of rain at about half-past two o'clock. I plunged into bed again, taking several mosquitoes with me, which hummed and buzzed and devoured us to their heart's content till dawn. Then I got up and walked down to the beach to bathe, and returned to breakfast at six o'clock, refreshed but still disfigured. It is now the depth of winter and the middle of the rainy season in Tahiti, but luckily for us it is nearly always fine in the daytime. At night, however, there is often a perfect deluge which floods the houses and gardens, turns the streams into torrents, but washes and refreshes the vegetation, and leaves the landscape brighter and greener than before. At half-past seven the horses were put to, and we were just ready for a start when down came the rain again, more heavily than before. It was some little time before it ceased enough to allow us to start, driving along grassy roads and through forests, but progressing rather slowly, owing to the soaked condition of the ground. If you can imagine the coup hothouses, magnified and multiplied, to an indefinite extent, and laid out as a gentleman's park, traversed by numerous grassy roads, fringed with coconut palms and commanding occasional glimpses of sea and beach and coral reefs, you will have some faint idea of the scene through which our road lay. Many rivers we crossed and many we stuck in, the gentlemen having more than once to take off their shoes and stockings, tuck up their trousers, jump into the water, and literally put their shoulders to the wheel. Sometimes we drove out into the shallow sea till it seemed doubtful when and where we should make the land again. Sometimes we climbed up a solid road, blasted out of the face of the black cliffs, or crept along the shore of the tranquil lagoon, frightening the land crabs into their holes as they felt the shake of the approaching carriage. Palms and passiflora abounded, the latter being specially magnificent. It seems wonderful how their thin stems can support, at a height of thirty or forty feet from the ground, the masses of huge orange-colored fruit which depend in strings from their summits. At the third river, not far from where it fell into the sea, we thought it was time to lunch, so we stopped the carriage, gave the horses their provender, and sat down to enjoy ourselves after a long drive. It was early in the afternoon before we started again, and soon after this we were met by fresh horses, sent out from Papenu. Footnote. From Pape, water, and new abundance. End footnote. So it was not long before we found ourselves near Point Venus, where we once more came upon a good piece of road, down which we rattled to the plains outside Papiti. We reached the quay at about seven o'clock, and our arrival having been observed, several friends came to see us and to inquire how we had fared. Before we started on our excursion, instructions had been given that the sunbeam should be painted white for the sake of coolness, and we were all very curious to see how she would look in her new dress. But unfortunately, the wet weather has delayed the work, and there is still a good deal to do. Wednesday, December 6th. It was raining fast at half-past four this morning, which was rather provoking as I wanted to take some photographs from the yacht's deck before the sea breeze sprang up. But the weather cleared while I was choosing my position and fixing my camera, and I was enabled to take what I hope may prove to be some successful photographs. Monsieur Brander's mail ship, a sailing vessel of about 600 tons, was to leave for San Francisco at eight o'clock, and at seven Tom started in the flash to take our letters on board. The passage to San Francisco occupies twenty-five days on an average, and is performed with great regularity once a month each way. The vessels employed on this line, three in number, are well built and have good accommodation for passengers, and they generally carry a full cargo. In the present instance, it consists of fungus and tripang, biche de mer, for China, oranges for San Francisco, a good many packages of sundries, and a large consignment of pearls entrusted to the captain at the last moment. So brisk is the trade carried on between Tahiti and the United States that the cost of this vessel was more than covered by the freights the first year after she was built. In addition to these ships, there are those which run backwards and forwards to Valparaiso 
and the little island trading schooners, so that the Tahitians can boast of quite a respectable fleet of vessels, not imposing perhaps in point of tonnage, but as smart and serviceable looking as could be desired. The trading schooners are really beautiful little craft, and I am sure that, if well kept and properly manned, they would show to no discredit among our smart yachts at Cowes. Not a day passes without one or more entering or leaving the harbour, returning from or bound to the lonely isles with which the southwest portion of the Pacific is studded. They are provided with a patent log, but their captains, who are intelligent men, do not care much about a chronometer, as the distances to be run are comparatively short and are easily judged. Mr. Godefroy gave us rather an amusing account of the manner in which their negotiations with the natives are conducted. The more civilized islanders have got beyond barter, and prefer hard cash in American dollars for their pearls, shells, coconuts, sandalwood, etc. When they have received the money, they remain on deck for some time, discussing their bargains among themselves. Then they peep down through the open skylights into the cabin below, where the most attractive prints and the gaudiest articles of apparel are temptingly displayed, alongside a few bottles of rum and brandy and a supply of tobacco. It is not long before the bait is swallowed, down go the natives, the goods are sold, and the dollars have once more found their way back into the captain's hands. I had a long talk with one of the natives who arrived today from Flint Island, a most picturesque-looking individual, dressed in scarlet and orange-colored flannel, and a mass of black, shiny, curly hair. Flint Island is a place whose existence has been disputed, it having been more than once searched for by ships in vain. It was, therefore, particularly interesting to meet someone who had actually visited, and had just returned from, the spot in question. That islands do occasionally disappear entirely in these parts, there can be little doubt. The Tahitian schooners were formerly in the habit of trading with a small island close to Rarotonga, whose name I forget, but about four years ago, when proceeding thither with the usual three-monthly cargo of provisions, prints, etc., they failed to find the island, of which no trace has since been seen. Two missionaries from Rarotonga are believed to have been on it at the time of its disappearance, and to have shared its mysterious fate. Thursday, December 7th. At eight o'clock I took Maybelle and Muriel for a drive in a pony carriage, which had been kindly lent me, but with a hint that the horse was rather méchant sometimes. He behaved well on the present occasion, however, and we had a pleasant drive in the outskirts of the town for a couple of hours. Just as we returned, a gentleman came and asked me if I should like to see some remarkably fine pearls, and on my gladly consenting, he took me to his house, where I saw some pearls certainly worth going to look at, but too expensive for me, one pear-shaped gem alone having been valued at one thousand pounds. I was told they came from a neighboring island, and I was given two shells containing pearls in various stages of formation. It was now time to go on board to receive some friends whom we had invited to breakfast, and who arrived at about half-past eleven. After breakfast and a chat, and an examination of the photograph books, etc., we all landed and went to see Monsieur Brander's stores, where all sorts of requisites for fitting out ships and their crews can be procured. It is surprising to find how plentiful are the supplies of the necessaries and even the luxuries of civilized life in this far-away corner of the globe. You can even get ice here, for the manufacture of which a retired English infantry officer has set up an establishment with great success. But what interested me most were the products of this and the neighboring islands. There were tons of exquisitely tented pearl shells, six or eight inches in diameter, formerly a valuable article of commerce, but now worth comparatively little. The pearls that came out of them had unfortunately been sent away to Liverpool, £1,000 worth by this morning's, and £5,000 by the last mail ship. Then there was vanilla, a most precarious crop, which needs to be carefully watered and shaded from the first moment it is planted, and which must be gathered before it is ripe, and dried and matured in a moist heat, between blankets and feather beds, in order that the pods may not crack and allow the essence to escape. We saw also edible fungus exported to San Francisco and thence to Hong Kong solely for the use of the Chinese, trepang or biche de mer, a sort of sea slug or holothuria, which, either living or dead, fresh or dried, looks equally untempting, 
but is highly esteemed by the celestials. Copra, or dried coconut kernels, broken into small pieces in order that they may stow better, and exported to England and other parts, where the oil is expressed and oil cake formed, and various other articles of commerce. The trade of the island is fast increasing, the average invoice value of the exports having risen from £8,400 in 1845 to £98,000 in 1874. These totals are exclusive of the value of the pearls, which would increase it by at least another £3,000 or £4,000. I speak from personal experience when I say that every necessary of life on board ship and many luxuries can be procured at Tahiti. American tinned fruits and vegetables beat English ones hollow. Preserved milk is uncertain, sometimes better, sometimes worse than what one buys at home. Tinned salmon is much better. Australian mutton, New Zealand beef, and South Sea pork leave nothing to be desired in the way of preserved meat. Fresh beef, mutton, and butter are hardly procurable, and the latter, when preserved, is uneatable. I can never understand why they don't take to potting and salting down for export the best butter at some large Irish or Devonshire farm, instead of reserving that process for butter which is just on the turn and is already almost unfit to eat, the result being that, long before it has reached a hot climate, it is only fit to grease carriage wheels with. It could be done, and I feel sure it would pay, as good butter would fetch almost any price in many places. Some Devonshire butter, which we brought with us from England, is as good now, after 10,000 miles in the tropics, as it was when first put on board, but a considerable proportion is very bad, and was evidently not in proper condition in the first instance. We had intended going afterwards to the coral reef with the children to have a picnic there, and had accordingly given the servants leave to go ashore for the evening, but it came on to rain heavily, and we were obliged to return to the yacht instead. The servants had, however, already availed themselves of the permission they had received, and there was, therefore, no one on board in their department, so we had to unpack our basket and have our picnic on deck under the awning instead of on the reef, which I think was almost as great a treat to the children. We have, I am sorry to say, had a good deal of trouble with some of our men here. One disappeared directly we arrived and has never been seen since. Another came off suffering from delirium tremens and epileptic fits brought on by drink. His cries and struggles were horrible to hear and witness. It took four strong men to hold him, and the doctor was up with him all last night. Nearly all the ships that come here have been at sea for a long time, and the men are simply wild when they get ashore. Some of the people know only too well how to take advantage of this state of things, and the consequence is that it is hardly safe for a sailor to drink a glass of grog for fear that it should be drugged. No doubt there are respectable places to which the men could resort, but it is not easy for a stranger to find them out, and our men seem to have been particularly unfortunate in this respect. Tom talks of leaving two of them behind and shipping four fresh hands, as our number is already rather short. Friday, December 8th. I persuaded Tom to make another excursion to the coral reef this morning, and at five o'clock he and Mabel and I set off in the flash just as the sun was rising. We had a delightful row past the quarantine island. Footnote. The native name is Matuiti, i.e. Little Island. End footnote. To the portion of the reef on the other side of the harbor, where we had not yet been, and where I think the coral plants and flowers and bushes showed to greater advantage than ever, as they were less crowded and the occasional patches of sandy bottom enabled one to see them better. We were so engrossed in our examination of these marvels of the deep and of the fish with which the water abounded that we found ourselves aground several times, and our return to the yacht was consequently delayed. After breakfast, I had another visit from a man with war cloaks, shell belts, tapa, and reva reva, which he brought on board for my inspection. It was a difficult task to make him understand what I meant, but at last I thought I had succeeded in impressing on his mind the fact that I wished to buy them and that they would be paid for at the store. The sequel unfortunately proved that I was mistaken. At nine o'clock we set out for the shore, and after landing drove along the same road by which we had returned from our excursion round the island. Footnote. We paid a brief visit to Point Venus, whence Captain Cook observed the transit of Venus on November ninth, 1769, and we saw the lighthouse and tamarind tree which now mark the spot. 
The latter, from which we brought away some seed, was undoubtedly planted by Captain Cook with his own hand. End footnote. After seeing as much of the place as our limited time would allow, we drove over to Fa Tuua, where we found the children and maids. The grand piano, every table, and the drawing-room floor were spread with the presents we were expected to take away with us. There were bunches of scarlet feathers, two or three hundred in number, from the tail of the tropic bird, which are only allowed to be possessed and worn by chiefs, and which are of great value, as each bird produces only two feathers. Pearl shells with corals growing on them, red coral from the islands on the equator, curious sponges and seaweed, tapa cloth and reva reva fringe, arrowroot and palm leaf hats, coconut drinking vessels, fine mats plated in many patterns, and other specimens of the products of the island. All the members of the royal family at present in Tahiti had been invited to meet us, and arrived in due course, including the heir apparent and his brother and sister. All the guests were dressed in the native costume, with wreaths on their heads and necks, and even the servants, including our own, whom I hardly recognized, were similarly decorated. Wreaths had also been prepared for us, three of fragrant yellow flowers for Mabel, Muriel, and myself, and others of a different kind for the gentlemen. When the feast was ready, the prince offered me his arm, and we all walked in a procession to a grove of bananas in the garden, through two lines of native servants, who, at a given signal, saluted us with three hearty English cheers. We then continued our walk till we arrived at a house, built in the native style, by the side of a rocky stream, like a scotch burn. The uprights of the house were banana trees, transplanted with their leaves on, so as to shade the roof, which was formed of plaited coconut palm leaves, each about fifteen feet long, laid transversely across bamboo rafters. From these light green supports and the dark green roof depended the yellow and brown leaves of the fev, woven into graceful garlands and elegant festoons. The floor was covered with the finest mats, with black and white borders, and the center strewn with broad green plantain leaves to form the tablecloth, on which were laid baskets and dishes, made of leaves sewed together, and containing all sorts of native delicacies. There were oysters, lobsters, wurali, and crawfish, stewed chicken, boiled sucking pig, plantains, breadfruit, melons, bananas, oranges, and strawberries. Before each guest was placed a half coconut full of salt water, another full of chopped coconut, a third full of fresh water, and another full of milk, two pieces of bamboo, a basket of poi, half a breadfruit, and a platter of green leaves, the latter being changed with each course. We took our seats on the ground round the green table. An address was first delivered in the native language, grace was then said, and we commenced. The first operation was to mix the salt water and the chopped coconut together, so as to make an appetizing sauce, into which we were supposed to dip each morsel we ate, the empty salt water bowl being filled up with fresh water, with which to wash our fingers and lips. We were tolerably successful in the use of our fingers as substitutes for knives and forks. The only drawback was that the dinner had to be eaten amid such a scene of novelty and beauty that our attention was continually distracted. There was so much to admire, both in the house itself and outside it. After we had finished, all the servants sat down to dinner, and from a dais at one end of the room we surveyed the bright and animated scene, the gentlemen and some of the ladies too, meanwhile enjoying their cigarettes. When we got down to Papiti at about half-past four, so many things had to be done that it seemed impossible to accomplish a start this evening. First of all, the two princes came on board and were shown round, after which there were accounts to be paid, linen to be got on board, and various other preparations to be made. Presently it was discovered that the cloaks I had purchased, or thought I had purchased, this morning had not turned up, and that our saddles had been left at Fa Taua on Sunday and had been forgotten. The latter were immediately sent for, but although someone went on shore to look after the cloaks, nothing could be heard of them, so I suppose I failed after all in making the man understand that he was to take them to the store and be paid for them there. At six o'clock the pilot sent word that it was no longer safe to go out, but steam was already up, and Tom therefore decided to go outside the reef and there wait for the people and goods that were still on shore. At this moment the saddles appeared in one direction, and the rest of the party in another. 
They were soon on board, the anchor was raised, and we began to steam slowly ahead, taking a last regretful look at Pepiti as we left the harbour. By the time we were outside, it was dark. The pilot went ashore, and we steamed full speed ahead. After dinner, and indeed until we went to bed at half-past eleven, the lights along the shore were clearly visible, and the form of the high mountains behind could be distinguished. Goodbye, lovely Tahiti. I wonder if I shall ever see you again. It makes me quite sad to think how small is the chance of my doing so. End of chapter 14